This is Audible. Audible Inc. presents Non Zero The Logic of Human Destiny. Written by Robert Wright. Narrated by Kevin T. Collins. As man advances in civilization and small tribes are united into larger communities, the simplest reason would tell each individual that he ought to extend his social instincts and sympathies to all the members of the same nation, though personally unknown to him. This point being once reached, there is only an artificial barrier to prevent his sympathies extending to the men of all nations and races. Charles Darwin. Introduction. The Storm Before the Calm. A great many internal and external portents, political and social upheaval, moral and religious unease, have caused us all to feel, more or less confusedly, that something tremendous is at present taking place in the world. But what is it? Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. The Nobel laureate Steven Weinberg once ended a book on this note. The more the universe seems comprehensible, the more it also seems pointless. Far be it from me to argue with a great physicist about how depressing physics is. For all I know, Weinberg's realm of expertise, the realm of inanimate matter, really does offer no evidence of overarching purpose. But when we move into the realm of animate matter, bacteria, cellular slime molds, and most notably human beings, the situation strikes me as different. The more closely we examine the drift of biological evolution, and especially the drift of human history, the more there seems to be a point to it all. Because in neither case is drift really the right word. Both of these processes have a direction, an arrow. At least that is the thesis of this book. People who see a direction in human history, or in biological evolution, or both, have often been dismissed as mystics or flakes. In some ways, it's hard to argue that they deserve better treatment. The philosopher Henri Bergson believed that organic evolution is driven forward by a mysterious elan vital, a vital force. But why posit something so ethereal when we can explain evolution's workings in the wholly physical terms of natural selection? Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, the Jesuit theologian, saw human history moving toward point omega. But how seriously could he expect historians to take him, given that point omega is outside time and space? On the other hand, you have to give Bergson and Teilhard de Chardin some credit. Both saw that organic evolution has a tendency to create forms of life featuring greater and greater complexity, and Teilhard de Chardin, in particular, stressed a comparable tendency in human history, the evolution over the millennia of ever more vast and complex social structures. His extrapolations from this trend were prescient, Writing at the middle of this century, he dwelt on telecommunications and the globalization it abets, before these subjects were all the rage. Marshall McLuhan, coiner of Global Village, had read Teilhard. With his concept of the noosphere, the thinking envelope of the earth, Teilhard even anticipated in a vague way the Internet, more than a decade before the invention of the microchip. Can the trends rightly noted by Bergson and Teilhard, basic tendencies in biological evolution and in the technological and social evolution of the human species, be explained in scientific, physical terms? I think so. That is largely what this book is about. But the concreteness of the explanation needn't, I believe, wholly drain these patterns of the spiritual content that Bergson and Teilhard imputed to them. If directionality is built into life, if life naturally moves toward a particular end, then this movement legitimately invites speculation about what did the building. And the invitation is especially strong, I'll argue, in light of the phase of human history that seems to lie immediately ahead, a social, political, and even moral culmination of sorts. 
as readers not drawn to theological questions will be delighted to hear, such speculation constitutes a small portion of this book, a few cosmic thoughts toward the end necessarily tentative. Mostly, this book is about how we got where we are today and what this tells us about where we're heading next. The Secret of Life on the day James Watson and Francis Crick discovered the structure of DNA, Crick, as Watson later recalled it, walked into their regular lunch place and announced that they had found the secret of life. With all due respect for DNA, I would like to nominate another candidate for the secret of life. Unlike Francis Crick, I can't claim to have discovered the secret I'm touting, it was discovered, or if you prefer, invented, about half a century ago by the founders of game theory, John von Neumann and Oscar Morgenstern. They made a basic distinction between zero-sum games and non-zero-sum games. In zero-sum games, the fortunes of the players are inversely related. In tennis, in chess, in boxing, one contestant's gain is the other's loss. In non-zero-sum games, one player's gain needn't be bad news for the others. Indeed, in highly non-zero-sum games, the player's interests overlap entirely. In 1970, when the three Apollo 13 astronauts were trying to figure out how to get their stranded spaceship back to Earth, they were playing an utterly non-zero-sum game because the outcome would be either equally good for all of them or equally bad. It was equally good. Back in the real world, things are usually not so clear-cut. A merchant and a customer, two members of a legislature, two childhood friends sometimes, but not always, find their interests overlapping. To the extent that their interests do overlap, their relationship is non-zero-sum. The outcome can be win-win or lose-lose, depending on how they play the game. For elaboration on non-zero-sum logic and discussion of the classic non-zero-sum game, The Prisoner's Dilemma, see Appendix 1. Sometimes political scientists or economists break human interaction down into zero-sum and non-zero-sum components— Occasionally, evolutionary biologists do the same in looking at the way various living systems work. My contention is that if we want to see what drives the direction of both human history and organic evolution, we should apply this perspective more systematically. Interaction among individual genes, or cells, or animals, among interest groups, or nations, or corporations— can be viewed through the lenses of game theory. What follows is a survey of human history and of organic history with those lenses in place. My hope is to illuminate a kind of force, the non-zero-sum dynamic that has crucially shaped the unfolding of life on Earth so far. The survey of organic history is brief, and the survey of human history not so brief, Human history, after all, is notoriously messy. But I don't think it's nearly as messy as it's often made out to be. Indeed, even if you start the survey back when the most complex society on Earth was a hunter-gatherer village and follow it up to the present, you can capture history's basic trajectory by reference to a core pattern. New technologies arise that permit or encourage new, richer forms of non-zero-sum interaction. Then, for intelligible reasons grounded ultimately in human nature, social structures evolve that realize this rich potential that convert non-zero-sum situations into positive sums. Thus does social complexity grow in scope and depth. This isn't to say that non-zero-sum games always have win-win outcomes and never have lose-lose outcomes. Badly governed societies are littered with losses, and history is littered with the remains of badly governed societies. Nor is it to say that the powerful and the treacherous never exploit the weak and the naive. 
exploitation, ranging from clear-cut parasitism to subtler inequity, is often possible in non-zero-sum games, and history offers plenty of examples. Still, on balance, over the long run, non-zero-sum situations produce more positive sums than negative sums, and more mutual benefit than parasitism. As a result, people become embedded in larger and richer webs of interdependence. This basic sequence, the conversion of non-zero-sum situations into mostly positive sums, had started happening at least as early as 15,000 years ago. Then it happened again, and again, and again, until, voila, here we are, riding in airplanes, sending email, living in a global village. I don't mean to minimize the interesting details that populate most history books, Sumerian kings, barbarian hordes, medieval knights, the Protestant Reformation, nascent nationalism, and so on. In fact, I try to give all of these their due, along with such too often neglected exemplars of the human experience as Native American hunter-gatherers, Polynesian chiefdoms, Islamic commercial innovations, African kingdoms, Aztec justice, and precocious Chinese technology. But I do intend to show how these details, though important in their own right, are ultimately part of a larger story— to show how they fit into a framework that makes thinking about human history easier. After surveying human history, I will briefly apply to organic history the same organizing principle. Through natural selection, there arise new technologies that permit richer forms of non-zero-sum interaction among biological entities, among genes or cells or animals or whatever, and the rest, as they say, is organic history. In short, both organic and human history involve the playing of ever more numerous, ever larger, and ever more elaborate non-zero-sum games. It is the accumulation of these games, game upon game upon game, that constitutes the growth in biological and social complexity that people like Bergson and Teilhard de Chardin have talked about. I like to refer to this accumulation as an accumulation of non-zero-sumness. Non-zero-sumness is a kind of potential, a potential for overall gain, or for overall loss, depending on how the game is played. The concept may sound ethereal in the abstract, but I hope it will feel concrete by the end of this book. Non-zero-sumness, I'll argue, is something whose ongoing growth and ongoing fulfillment define the arrow of the history of life, from the primordial soup to the world wide web. You might even say that non-zero-sumness is a nuts-and-bolts materialist version of Bergson's immaterial élan vital. It gives a certain momentum to the basic direction of life on this planet. It explains why biological evolution, given enough time, was very likely to create highly intelligent life, life smart enough to generate technology and other forms of culture, it also explains why the ensuing evolution of technology and of culture more broadly was very likely to enrich and expand the social structure of that intelligent species, carrying social organization to planetary breadth. Globalization, it seems to me, has been in the cards not just since the invention of the telegraph or the steamship or even the written word or the wheel, but since the invention of life. The current age, in which relations among nations grow more non-zero-sum year by year, is the natural outgrowth of several billion years of unfolding non-zero-sum logic. You call that destiny? Any book with a subtitle as grandiose as The Logic of Human Destiny is bound to have some mealy-mouthed qualification somewhere along the way. We might as well get it over with. How literally do I mean the word destiny? Do I mean that the exact state of the world today has been inevitable for eons? No, on two counts. 
First, I'm talking not about the world's exact, detailed state, but about its broad contours, such as the scope and nature of its political and economic structures. Second, I'm not talking about something that was literally inevitable, 100% guaranteed ever since the dawn of history or the dawn of life or whatever. Still, I am talking about something whose chances of transpiring were very high, something that was in the cards in the sense that the deck was stacked heavily in its favor. Some people may consider it cheating to use the word destiny when you mean not inevitable but exceedingly likely. Would you consider it cheating to say that the destiny of a poppy seed is to become a poppy? Obviously, a given poppy seed may not become a poppy. Indeed, the destiny of some poppy seeds seems, in retrospect at least, to have been getting baked onto a bagel— and even poppy seeds that have escaped this fate and landed on soil may still get eaten, though not at brunch, and thus never become flowers. Still, there are at least three reasons that it seems defensible to say that the destiny of a poppy seed is to become a poppy. First, this is very likely to happen under broadly definable circumstances— Second, from the seed's point of view, the only alternative to this happening is catastrophe, death, to put a finer point on it. Third, if we inspect the essence of a poppy seed, the DNA it contains, we find it hard to escape the conclusion that the poppy seed is programmed to become a poppy. Indeed, you might say the seed is designed to become a poppy— even though it was designed not by a human designer, but by natural selection. For anything other than full-fledged poppyhood to happen to a poppy seed, for it to get baked onto a bagel or eaten by a bird, is for the seed's true expression to be stifled, its naturally imbued purpose to go unrealized. It is for reasons roughly analogous to these that I will make an argument for human destiny— of course, the human poppy analogy gets more contentious when we ponder the third reason. Is it fair to say that our species has some larger purpose? Is there some grand goal that life on earth was designed to realize? I think the reasons for answering yes are stronger than many people, especially many scientists and social scientists, realize. Still, as I've already suggested, this question is slippery, and answers to it must be speculative. In contrast, destiny in the more modest sense of the word, a likely outcome, an outcome that history naturally moves toward, is a fairly concrete proposition, more clearly open to empirical appraisal. This book is a full-throated argument for destiny in this sense of direction, along with a more reticent argument for destiny in the sense of purpose. The Current Chaos Neither biological evolution nor human history is a smooth, steady process. Both pass through thresholds. They can leap from one equilibrium to a new, higher-level equilibrium. To some people, the current era has the aura of a threshold— it has that unsettling, out-of-control feeling that can portend a major shift. Technological, geopolitical, and economic change seem ominously fast, and the fabric of society seems somehow tenuous. For instance, world currency markets are rocked by the turbulent force of electronically lubricated financial speculation— Weapons of mass destruction are cultivated by rogue regimes and New Age cults. Nations seem less cohesive than before, afflicted by ethnic or religious or cultural faction. Health officials seriously discuss the prospect of a worldwide plague, the unspeakably gruesome Ebola virus, perhaps, or some microbe we don't yet know about, spread around the world by jet-propelled travelers. Even tropical storms seem to have grown more intense in recent decades, arguably a result of global warming. It sounds apocalyptic, and some religiously-minded people think it literally is. 
They have trouble imagining that this rash of new threats could be mere coincidence, especially coming as it has at the end of a millennium. Some fundamentalist Christians cite growing global chaos as evidence that Judgment Day is around the corner. A whole genre of best-selling novels envisions the rapture, the day when true believers on the way to heaven meet Christ in midair while others down below find a less glamorous fate. In a sense, these fundamentalists are right. No, I don't mean about the rapture. I just mean that growing turmoil does signify, by my lights, a distinct step in the unfolding of what you could call the world's destiny. We are indeed approaching a culmination of sorts. Our species seems to face a kind of test toward which basic forces of history have been moving us for millennia. It is a test of political imagination, of our ability to accept basic, necessary changes in structures of governance, but also a test of moral imagination. So how will we do on this test? Judging by history, the current turbulence will eventually yield to an era of relative stability, an era when global, political, economic, and social structures have largely tamed the new forms of chaos. The world will reach a new equilibrium at a level of organization higher than any past equilibrium, and the period we are now entering will, in retrospect, look like the storm before the calm. Or, on the other hand, we could blow up the world. Remember, even poppy seeds don't always manage to flower. Indeed, at this moment in history when social organization approaches the global level and technologies of destruction reach commensurate scope, the arrow of history starts to quiver. Though getting to this threshold has long been so probable as to border on the inevitable, whether we successfully pass through it is another question altogether. And while I'm basically optimistic, an extremely bleak outcome is obviously possible. For that matter, even if we avoid blowing up the world, several moderately bleak outcomes are possible— one can imagine within the bounds of possibility suggested by the trajectory of the past future political structures that grant more freedom or less, more privacy or less, that foster more order or less, more wealth or less. One purpose of this book is to aid in exploring this wiggle room, in choosing among such alternative futures, and in realizing the choice." At least as big as the question of where exactly our future path leads is how chaotically it leads there. History, even if its basic direction is good, can proceed at massive, wrenching human cost. Or it can proceed more smoothly, with costs, to be sure, but with more tolerable costs. All told, our menu of options is rich— ranging from self-annihilation to graceful adaptation, and emphatically including the middle prospect of a long and turbulent adjustment full of strife and suffering. It is the destiny of our species, and this time I mean the inescapable destiny, not just the high likelihood, to choose. Part 1. A Brief History of Humankind Chapter 1. The Ladder of Cultural Evolution An idea isn't responsible for the people who believe in it. Don Marquis In the early 20th century, anthropologists commonly referred to particular groups of people as savages. Technically speaking, this was not an insult, though it seldom came off as a compliment. Savagery was just a stage in the orderly history of human cultures. There had been a time when all human beings were savages, but then some of them got a cultural promotion to barbarians, or at least to low barbarians. 
Barbarism had three subdivisions, lower, middle, and upper, and a culture, after passing through them, could cross the threshold into civilization. At that point, its people could start writing books in which other cultures were called savage. The leading proponent of this savagery, barbarism, civilization scale was Lewis Henry Morgan, who unveiled it in his 1877 book, Ancient Society, writing less than two decades after Darwin published On the Origin of Species, Morgan depicted human cultures as things that evolve. It can now be asserted upon convincing evidence that savagery preceded barbarism in all the tribes of mankind, as barbarism is known to have preceded civilization, Morgan wrote, these three distinct conditions are connected with each other in a natural as well as necessary sequence of progress. Morgan was one of the world's first anthropologists. He was an aficionado of American Indian societies, whose depredation by white men he deplored. After Sitting Bull massacred Custer's men at the Little Bighorn, Morgan came out in defense of Sitting Bull. That's not to say Morgan was a radical. In addition to being a self-trained scholar, he was a well-to-do lawyer. Still, his book was embraced by Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels, who found it consistent with their own teleological view of history. Like them, Morgan traced history's direction to material factors, including technology. And like them, he stressed changing notions of ownership. They loved his idea that man's initial, savage condition was communal, with no private property. Engels warmly quoted Morgan's prediction that in the end, cultural evolution would restore some of this primal egalitarianism. Democracy in government, brotherhood in society, equality in rights and privileges, and universal education, Morgan had written, foreshadow the next higher plane of society to which experience, intelligence, and knowledge are steadily tending. The view that inexorable forces of history had created civilization, that cultures evolve in broadly predictable fashion and would keep doing so, was also held by the sociologist Herbert Spencer, who loathed Marxism. Another proponent was John Stuart Mill, whose politics were somewhere between Spencer's and Marx's. Back then, the idea of directionality in history was almost conventional wisdom. Ideology entered the picture only when you discussed the mechanism behind history's obviously patterned course and extrapolated into the future. Trends become untrendy. During the early 20th century, the conventional wisdom changed. The ranking of some societies as higher than others seemed increasingly unsavory, especially to scholars on the left. In anthropology, the eminent Franz Boas led an assault on the idea that human cultures tend to move in any particular direction. His most famous student, Margaret Mead, would later summarize the Boasian credo, we have stood out against any grading of cultures in hierarchical systems which would place our own culture at the top and place the other cultures of the world in a descending scale according to the extent that they differ from ours. We have stood out for a sort of democracy of cultures, a concept which would naturally take its place beside the other great democratic beliefs." Support for the Boasian perspective was intense and eventually overwhelming. In 1918, an essay in American Anthropologist attacked the idea of cultural evolution as the most inane, sterile, and pernicious theory ever conceived in the history of science, and moreover, a cheap toy for the amusement of big children. By 1939, another anthropologist could report that cultural evolutionism could muster hardly a single adherent. Meanwhile, the idea of directional history wasn't faring well among historians either. 
During the 19th century, many of them had seen history as progress fueled by reason. The conscious, rational pursuit of the good would bring ever-expanding freedom and political equality. But after two world wars in which clever technologies had killed millions, the words rational and good didn't seem hallmarks of humankind, and with fascism a recent memory and totalitarian communism still strong, freedom didn't seem to be history's goal. Further, hadn't the enemies of freedom, Hitler and Stalin, believed that history was on their side? Maybe then theories of historical directionality weren't just wrong, but dangerous. After the Second World War, two of the most famous thinkers of this century, Isaiah Berlin and Karl Popper, took up arms against such theories. In the slim volume Historical Inevitability, Berlin attacked the notion that the world has a direction and is governed by laws, and that the direction and the laws can in some degree be discovered by employing the proper techniques of investigation. Popper, in The Poverty of Historicism, announced that he had proved, literally proved, that predicting the future is flat-out impossible. After Berlin and Popper wrote the kind of big think they opposed, speculative history or meta-history became an endangered species. In the 1960s, one philosopher of history observed that historians tend to use the term meta-historian to mark deviations from normal professional activity in either the law-seeking or the pattern-seeking direction. Not much has changed since then. The one pattern-seeking work of history to make a big splash over the past two decades, the end of history, was written not by a historian, but by a political scientist, Francis Fukuyama. Oddly, pondering laws of history is less deviant behavior for a political scientist than for a historian. Opponents of meta-history have often been candid about their motivations. The dedication to Popper's book reads, in memory of the countless men and women of all creeds or nations or races, who fell victims to the fascist and communist belief in inexorable laws of historical destiny. I'll argue that Popper's analysis and Berlin's analysis and Boaz's analysis was doubly wrong, wrong not just about whether directional views of the past can be valid, but about whether they are especially dangerous. A Short-Lived Insurrection the war on directionality was not as successful within anthropology as within history. At mid-century, small pockets of resistance began to develop, notably at the University of Michigan. There, a firebrand named Leslie White rebelled against Boazian anti-evolutionism and devoted his life to resuscitating and refining Morgan's ideas. This revival spawned some advances in the field, including labels less offensive than savage and barbarian. Indeed, as we'll see, White's students and allied colleagues laid a still usable foundation for reassessing world history. Nonetheless, in the 1970s, as multiculturalism gained popularity, Theories that seemed to rank the world's cultures lost popularity. By the time of White's death in 1975, cultural evolutionism was falling into neglect, if not disrepute. Today, the one part of anthropology that still harbors much sympathy for evolutionism is not White's field, cultural anthropology, but archaeology, to be sure, most archaeologists don't espouse as strong a version of cultural evolutionism as will be espoused in this book. They don't believe that the progression toward more complex society was essentially inevitable, from the Stone Age right up to globalization. Still, archaeologists can't help but notice that, as a rule, the deeper you dig, 
the simpler the society whose remains you find. Plainly, change in the structure of societies tends to happen sooner or later, and is more likely to raise complexity than to lower it. In a way, it's odd that the greatest sympathy for evolutionism is found among scholars who study the distant past, for events of this century, and essentially of the last few decades, suggest that the arrow of history identified by some social scientists of the 19th century is roughly on target. Lewis Morgan's essential point was right. The endless impetus of cultural evolution has pushed society through several thresholds over the past 20,000 years, and now it is pushing society through another one. A magnificent new social structure, our future home, is being built before our eyes. To say that history has a direction is not to embrace all the ideas associated with early cultural evolutionism or 19th century progressivist history. It is not, for example, to say that history is a process of general improvement, or to blithely predict the triumph of freedom and equality in all their dimensions. Indeed, though I think history is on the side of human freedom in one sense, there is another sense in which freedom is shrinking. If there is something magnificent about the social structure that now seems to be emerging, the social structure that history has long been moving us toward, there is something terrifying about it too. Fortunately, this structure, even if hard to escape in the long run, and unwise to escape in the long run, is by no means inevitable in all its aspects. Anyway, the question of whether history's basic arrow will on balance make us freer or less free, will make our lives better or worse, is one I'll defer for now. I do think that in some respects, history's basic direction makes human beings morally better, and will continue to do so. But that isn't the immediate point. The immediate point, to be made over the next thirteen chapters, is that if we leave morality aside and talk about the objectively observable features of social reality, the direction of history is unmistakable. When you look beneath the roiled surface of human events, beyond the comings and goings of particular regimes, beyond the lives and deaths of the great men who have strutted on the stage of history, you see an arrow beginning tens of thousands of years ago and continuing to the present. And looking ahead, you see where it is pointing. Chapter 2 the way we were. A common principle of intelligence meets us in the savage, in the barbarian, and in civilized man. Lewis Henry Morgan Mark Twain considered the Shoshone Indians of western North America the wretchedest type of mankind I have ever seen up to this writing. They have no villages, and no gathering together into strictly defined tribal communities. A young Charles Darwin, observing the Fuegian Indians of South America, reported that their dwellings were like what children make in summer with boughs of trees. After ticking off examples of Fuegian uncouthness and inhumanity, Darwin wrote in a letter, I feel quite a disgust at the very sound of the voices of these miserable savages. Such dismay was often expressed when 19th century white men encountered Native American cultures. That is one thing that bothered anthropologists such as Franz Boas about theories of cultural evolution. In placing Western cultures atop a universal ladder of progress, they seemed merely the academic expression of an already too common European supremacism. Boaz wrote, The tendency to value our own form of civilization as higher, not as dearer to our hearts, than that of the whole rest of mankind, is the same as that which prompts the actions of primitive man, 
who considers every stranger his enemy and who is not satisfied until the enemy is killed. There is arguably something paradoxical about criticizing the denigration of the primitive on grounds that it is primitive. Still, Boaz's heart was in the right place. He had a genuine and courageous concern for the downtrodden. He worried especially that notions of cultural superiority would get conflated with notions of biological superiority, reinforcing racism. His book, The Mind of Primitive Man, which traced the psychology of hunter-gatherers to a distinctive culture, not distinctive genes, was burned by the Nazis. Boaz's fear that racists would gleefully seize on notions of cultural evolution was not misplaced. Generally speaking, racism will use any tool that is handy, and if cultural evolutionism seems to imply that Europeans are biologically superior to Native Americans, then it is a handy tool. Still, it is important to understand that, logically, cultural evolutionism implies no such thing. One premise of cultural evolutionism is the psychic unity of humankind, the idea that people everywhere are genetically endowed with the same mental equipment, that there is a universal human nature. The psychic unity of humankind is the reason that around the world, on every continent, cultural evolution has moved in the same direction. The arrow of human history begins with the biology of human nature. That arrow, as I've noted, points toward larger quantities of non-zero sumness. As history progresses, human beings find themselves playing non-zero sum games with more and more other human beings. Interdependence expands, and social complexity grows in scope and depth. One way to start seeing this link between human nature and human history is to take a look at the wretched Shoshone and other basic hunter-gatherer societies, or in the technical terminology of the 19th century, other savages. They demonstrate how even the simplest societies are congenitally prone to increasing complexity, and how, nonetheless, quirks of environmental circumstance can slow the rate of increase. There is one other reason to inspect these societies, to help us reconstruct the distant past. The ancestral cultures of all modern societies were hunter-gatherer cultures. Archaeologists have found their remnants, their spearheads and stone knives, the fireside bones of their prey across Africa, Europe, Asia, the Americas— but archaeologists can't construct the social lives of these peoples in much detail. The closest we can come to that is studying the few existing hunter-gatherer societies and reading accounts of how other hunter-gatherers lived before industrial society changed them. Over the past two centuries, anthropologists and other travelers have documented hunter-gatherer life on all continents, ranging from the Chenchu of India to the Chukchi of Siberia, from the Kung San of southern Africa to the Ainu of Japan, from the Aborigines of Australia to the Eskimo of the Arctic, from the Fuegians of South America to the Shoshone of North America. To study these vanishing, mostly vanished, ways of life is to dimly glimpse the early stages of our own cultural evolution. The Shoshone and Fuegians observed by Twain and Darwin weren't living fossils. They were anatomically modern human beings, just like you or me, but their cultures were living fossils. The Bare Minimum Mark Twain is not the only person to have commented on the rudimentary social structure of the Shoshone, who inhabited the Great Basin of North America around present-day Nevada. One book on Native American cultures discusses them under the heading The Irreducible Minimum of Human Society. 
the largest stable unit of social organization was the family, and the male head of the family was the entire political organization and its whole legal system. The Shoshone did spend part of the year in multi-family camps, but the camps were less cohesive than, say, those of the Kung San, the much-studied hunter-gatherers of the Kalahari Desert in Africa. For months at a time, Shoshone families would go it alone, roaming the desert with a bag and a digging stick, searching for roots and seeds. What might account for the small gradation of complexity that separates the Kung and the Shoshone? One good candidate is the fact that the Kung lived amidst giraffes. The tracking and killing of giraffes and the retrieval of meat before scavengers get it calls for cooperation. Perhaps more important, a giraffe is more than one family can eat before the meat spoils. So for giraffe hunters to live in family-sized groups would be to waste meat and to waste a chance to collect the IOUs that come from sharing it. Such IOUs are a classic expression of non-zero sumness. You give someone food when his cupboard is bare and yours is overflowing. He reciprocates down the road when your cupboard is bare and you both profit, because food is more valuable when you're hungry than when you're full. Hunter-gatherers everywhere act in accordance with this logic. One chronicler of Eskimo life has observed the best place for an Eskimo to store his surplus is in someone else's stomach. Hunting big animals encourages sharing, not just because leftover meat can spoil, but also because hunting is a chancier endeavor than gathering. So using current surplus to ensure against future shortage pays especially big non-zero-sum dividends. All told, then, it is not surprising that social complexity tends to be higher among hunter-gatherers who rely heavily on big game. The more important big game is, the more non-zero sumness there is, the more society organizes to harness that non-zero sumness to turn it into positive sums. So, to the cultural evolutionist, the explanation for the Shoshones having the irreducible minimum in social complexity is not, as Boaz might fear, that the Shoshone are stupid. It's that their surroundings were, in this respect and in other respects that will come to, less conducive to rapid cultural evolution than some other surroundings. How can we be sure that the Shoshone would indeed have the wherewithal to evolve culturally if given the chance? Funny you should ask. Although the Shoshone had no big game to hunt, jackrabbits were afoot, sometimes in abundance— to harvest them, the Shoshone employed a tool too large for one family to handle, a net hundreds of feet long into which rabbits were herded before being clubbed to death. On such occasions, the requisite social structure would materialize. More than a dozen normally autonomous families would come together briefly and cooperate under a rabbit boss— Though the Shoshone spent most of their time with the irreducible minimum of organization, the sudden appearance of non-zero sumness brought latent social skills to the fore, and social complexity grew. To say that reaping non-zero sum benefits elevates social complexity borders on the redundant. The successful playing of a non-zero sum game typically amounts to a growth of social complexity. The players must coordinate their behavior so people who might otherwise be off in their own orbits come together and form a single solar system, a larger synchronized whole. And typically there is division of labor within the whole. Some people make the nets, some people man the nets, some people chase the rabbits— one minute you're a bunch of independent foragers, and the next minute you're a single, integrated, rabbit-catching team, differentiated yet united. Complex coherence has materialized.
Note that this particular bit of social self-organization was mediated by a technology, the rabbit net. The invention of such technologies, technologies that facilitate or encourage non-zero-sum interaction, is a reliable feature of cultural evolution everywhere. New technologies create new chances for positive sums, and people maneuver to seize those sums, and social structure changes as a result. A successful Shoshone rabbit hunt would culminate in a fandango. Sounds like a spontaneous and carefree celebration, and indeed, fandangos featured, as one anthropologist put it, gambling, dancing, philandering. Still, as scholars have noted, the fandango was eminently utilitarian. First, it distributed fresh meat among the rabbit hunts, various kinds of workers. Second, it was an occasion for trading such valuables as volcanic glass. Third, it was a chance to build up a network of friends. Even the ritual exchange of knickknacks, though economically trivial, can be a way to bond, forming the conduits for future favor swapping of greater moment. Fourth, the Fandango was an opportunity to trade information about, say, the location of other food. All of these are non-zero-sum functions, and the last is especially so. Giving people data, unlike giving them food or tools, has no inherent cost. If you know of a place where the supply of pine nuts far exceeds your own family's needs, it costs nothing to share the information with a friend. So, too, if you know the location of a den of poisonous snakes. Sometimes, of course, surrendering information is costly, as when the supply of nuts doesn't exceed your family's needs. Still, data are often of little or no cost and great benefit. Swapping them is one of the oldest forms of non-zero-sum interaction, People by their nature come together to constitute a social information processing system and thus reap positive sums. The Fandango, the academic conference, and the Internet are superficially different expressions of the same deep force. In the Genes Though Shoshone life, like life everywhere, seems to have been filled with non-zero-sum calculation, calculation isn't quite the right word. When people interact with each other in mutually profitable fashion, they don't necessarily realize exactly what they're doing. Evolutionary psychologists have made a strong, in my view compelling, case that this unconscious savviness is a part of human nature, rooted ultimately in the genes, that natural selection, via the evolution of reciprocal altruism, has built into us various impulses which, however warm and mushy they may feel, are designed for the cool, practical purpose of bringing beneficial exchange. Theories from evolutionary psychology, including the theory of reciprocal altruism, rest on eclectic argument. Doing justice to these theories is itself a book-length endeavor, so this book, while grounded in evolutionary psychology's view of human nature, won't try to justify that view in detail. Readers can turn to my previous book, The Moral Animal, for elaboration. Among these impulses, generosity, if selective and sometimes wary, gratitude, and an attendant sense of obligation— a growing empathy for and trust of those who prove reliable reciprocators, also known as friends, these feelings and the behaviors they fruitfully sponsor are found in all cultures, and the reason, it appears, is that natural selection recognized non-zero-sum logic before people recognized it. Even chimpanzees and bonobos, our nearest relatives, are naturally disposed to reciprocal altruism, and neither species has yet demonstrated a firm grasp of game theory. Some degree of social structure is thus built 
into our genes. Actually, the genetic basis of social structure goes beyond reciprocal altruism. Love of kin is human nature. In every hunter-gatherer society, the family is the basic molecule of social organization. But the genetic logic behind families is another story, best saved for later. For now, the point is that human nature itself, unadorned by technology, carries mutual benefit and thus social structure beyond the confines of family. The arrow of human history, the arrow that heads toward more non-zero sumness and deeper and vaster social complexity, doesn't begin at zero. A universal feature of hunter-gatherer societies, some anthropologists say, is generalized reciprocity, not just within families, but between them. It is important to be clear on what generalized does and doesn't mean. Ever since Morgan wrote Ancient Society and Marx and Engels read it, people have been straining to portray our ancestral hunter-gatherer cultures as dens of communal bliss. Richard Lee, a pioneering observer of the Kung San, contends that hunter-gatherer societies lend strong support to the idea that a stage of primitive communism prevailed before the rise of the state and the breakup of society into classes. He writes that the giving of something without an expectation of equivalent return is almost universal among foraging peoples, and he cites in particular the Kung's habit of sharing food in a generalized, familistic way. Sounds great. Yet Lee also notes that the Kung often argue and that accusations of improper meat distribution, improper gift exchange, laziness, and stinginess are the most common topics of these disputes. However generalized the giving among the Kung, it is expected to be ultimately symmetrical. Here again, though, the expectation isn't merely a matter of conscious calculation. When we accuse others of laziness or stinginess, we are driven by something deeper and hotter than sheer reason, by a feeling of moral indignation, of just grievance. And that feeling, found in cultures everywhere and expressed in predictable circumstances, seems to be grounded in our genes. According to evolutionary psychologists, it is part of the emotional equipment designed by natural selection to govern reciprocal altruism, to help us play non-zero-sum games profitably. The Trouble with Non-Zero-Sumness Why would this sort of vigilance have been so crucial to our ancestors' prospects that genes conducive to it would flourish? There are two properties of non-zero-sum games, two kinds of pitfalls that make instinctive wariness vital. One is the problem of cheating or parasitism. People may accept your generosity and never repay it. Or they may sit around getting a suntan while everyone else is rabbit hunting and then expect to have char-broiled rabbit for dinner. Game theorists call this free-riding, contributing nothing to the pie of positive sums created by collective action, yet cheerfully eating a piece. In the intimate context of hunter-gatherer life, moral indignation works well as an anti-cheating technology. It leads you to withhold generosity from past non-reciprocators, thus insulating yourself from future exploitation, and all the grumbling you and others do about these cheaters leads people in general to give them the cold shoulder, so chronic cheating becomes a tough way to make a living. But as societies grow more complex, so that people exchange goods and services with people they don't see on a regular basis, if at all, this sort of mono-a-mono -mono indignation won't suffice new anti-cheating technologies are needed, and as we'll see, they have materialized again and again, 
via cultural, not genetic, evolution. The other principle of game theory that makes wariness adaptive is subtler than cheating. Within almost any real-life non-zero-sum game lies a zero-sum dimension. When you buy a car, the transaction is, broadly speaking, non-zero-sum. You and the dealer both profit, which is why you both agree to the deal. But there is more than one price at which you both profit— the whole range between the highest you would rationally pay and the lowest the dealer would rationally accept, and within that range, you and the dealer are playing a zero-sum game. Your gain is the dealer's loss. That's the reason bargaining takes place at car dealerships. Oddly, such zero-sum games are ultimately a tribute to the magic of non-zero-sumness, Watch me pull thirty rabbits out of my hat. Just take twenty Shoshone, who, if hunting individually, would be lucky to snag one rabbit each, and turn them into a team. Presto! Fifty rabbits instead of twenty. It is the question of how to divvy up this magical thirty-rabbit surplus that the zero-sum game, the bargaining, is about. Of course, you could just divide the rabbits equally, but haven't some people worked harder than others or brought rarer talents to the project? Besides, if you do divide the spoils equally, the bargaining just gets subtler. Some people may try to do slightly less work than average for their 1.5 rabbits, not so little work that their contribution isn't a net plus, but less work than you're doing. This zero-sum tension, this implicit bargaining, is the reason that hunter-gatherer societies feature gripes about laziness and stinginess. At least, it is the second reason, the first being out-and-out cheating. These two reasons, applied over millions of years of biological evolution, have given people everywhere an innate tendency to monitor the contributions of others, whether consciously or unconsciously. In all cultures, friendships have underlying tension. In all cultures, workplaces feature gossip about who is a slouch and who is a team player. In all cultures, people scan the landscape for the lazy and the ungrateful and rein in their generosity accordingly. In all cultures, People try to get the best deal possible. I stress the natural dearth of selfless giving, true, pure altruism, indifferent to ultimate payoff, not to show that truly communist economies aren't practical. The twentieth century has already made that point. I'm just trying to get clear on the parts of human nature that, in conjunction with technological evolution, give history its basic shape, and one of those parts is firm self-interest. This fact may be disappointing from some moral standpoint, but if you are a fan of complex social organization, it is a godsend. Human nature's laser-like focus on ultimate payoff is a prime mover of cultural evolution— Instinctively enlightened self-interest is the seed that has grown into modern society. At the heart of every modern capitalist economy, as at the heart of the hunter-gatherer economies from which they evolved, is the principle of exchange. One hand washes the other, and both are better off than they would be alone. The very definition of a well-played non-zero-sum game— the difference between the two economies lies in the number of hands involved and the intricacy of their interdependence, two quantities that cultural evolution has a stubborn tendency to raise. Social status The bent for reciprocal exchange is not the only aspect of human nature that helps propel society toward complexity— Evolutionary psychologists, and, for that matter, non-evolutionary psychologists, have shown that human beings naturally pursue social status with a certain ferocity. 
we all relentlessly, if often unconsciously, try to raise our standing by impressing peers, and we naturally, if unconsciously, evaluate other people in terms of their standing. We especially value the friendship of high-status people, since alliance with the powerful tends to come in handy, and we especially fear their disfavor, since the enmity of the powerful tends not to. Human beings evolved amid social hierarchies, and our minds are designed to negotiate them. This gives social complexity a head start in at least two ways. First, deference to the high and mighty, though the deference is far from reflexive, as we'll see, paves the way for complex hierarchical organization. Hunter-gatherer peoples may or may not have a formally designated head man, but they recognize a leader when the occasion demands. Just look at how readily a Shoshone rabbit boss pops up when the rabbits do. Second, the ongoing quest for social status is a great spur to cultural innovation. We don't know who invented the rabbit net, but we can safely assume it didn't hurt his or her popularity. And so it is in all societies. One sure way to elevate your standing is to create something that is widely adopted and praised. There is an irony here. To compete for high-status positions is to play a zero-sum game, since they are by definition a scarce resource. Yet one way to compete successfully is to invent technologies that create new non-zero-sum games. This is one of various senses in which the impetus behind cultural evolution, behind social complexification, lies in a paradox of human nature. We are deeply gregarious and deeply cooperative, yet deeply competitive. We instinctively play both non-zero-sum and zero-sum games. The interplay of these two dynamics throughout history is a story that takes some time to tell. For now, I'll just say that, though they have been responsible for much suffering, the tension between them is, in the end, creative. One point of dwelling on human nature is to stress that the arrow of human history though awe-inspiring, is not mystical or uncanny. Technological evolution and cultural evolution, more broadly, are not alien forces visited upon the human species from the great beyond, magically imbued with non-zero sumness. Technology and other forms of culture come from within. The directionality of culture, of history, is an expression of our species, of human nature. Indeed, cultural evolution is doubly reflective of human nature. Humans not only generate cultural innovations, they pass judgment on them. You can write any song you want, but other people will have to find it appealing if it is to spread. Your brain may give birth to any technology, but other brains will decide whether the technology thrives. The number of possible technologies is infinite, and only a few pass this test of affinity with human nature. One could invent, say, a battery-powered, helmet-mounted device that at random intervals jabs a sharp stick into the face of the helmet wearer. But a robust market for such a device is unlikely to materialize. So, a battery-powered face-jabber is unlikely to affect human history as profoundly as, say, the telephone, or even the rabbit net. Nature's Secret Plan The mixture of cooperative and competitive human instincts, the subtle but potent quest for status, the ingenuity it fuels, these were evident long before Darwinian theory came along to explain their reason for being. In the 18th century, for example, Immanuel Kant noted the unsocial sociability of man, with special emphasis on the unsocial part and its ironic consequences. Through the desire for honor, power, or property, it drives him to seek status among his fellows, whom he cannot bear, yet cannot bear to leave. Via this quest for status, 
The first true steps are taken from barbarism to culture, which in fact consists in the social worthiness of man. Thus commences a continued process of enlightenment as all man's talents are now gradually developed, his taste cultivated. Without these asocial qualities, far from admirable in themselves, human beings would live an Arcadian pastoral existence of perfect concord, self-sufficiency, and mutual love, but all human talents would remain hidden forever in a dormant state, and men, as good-natured as the sheep they tended, would scarcely render their existence more valuable than that of their animals. In that event, the end for which they were created, their rational nature, would be an unfilled void. Nature should thus be thanked for fostering social incompatibility, enviously competitive vanity, and insatiable desires for possession or even power. Kant made those remarks in an essay called Idea for a Universal History with a Cosmopolitan Purpose, which suggested that human history embodied a hidden plan of nature. Perhaps as history unfolds, he wrote, we will see how the human race eventually works its way upward to a situation in which all the germs implanted by nature can be developed fully and in which man's destiny can be fulfilled here on earth. Kant imagined that this destiny would include enduring peace among nations, ensured by a kind of world governance, a final ironic payoff for millennia of antagonism and unsocial striving. This was all conjecture, Kant stressed. Writing in 1784, before the harnessing of electricity, before the telegraph or typewriter or computer, he admitted that so far there was just a little evidence of such a purposeful natural process. Only time would tell. For this cycle of events seems to take so long a time to complete that the small part of it, traversed by mankind up till now, does not allow us to determine with certainty the shape of the whole cycle and the relation of its parts to the whole. Well, that was then. Chapter 3 Add Technology and Bake for Five Millennia The propensity to truck, barter, and exchange one thing for another is common to all men. Adam Smith What is society, whatever its form may be, the product of men's reciprocal action, Assume a particular state of development in the productive faculties of man and you will get a particular form of commerce and consumption. Karl Marx When Europeans, beginning with Columbus, entered the New World in the 15th and 16th centuries, there were a number of things they didn't pause to appreciate before commencing with the pillaging one is that they had happened upon a rare and precious natural experiment. The ancestors of Native Americans had migrated from Northeast Asia during the late Stone Age, the Upper Paleolithic, then around 10,000 B.C., with the climate warming, the land they'd walked across was deluged by the Bering Sea. The Old World and the New World were now two distinct petri dishes for cultural evolution. Any basic trends inherent in the process should be evident in both. The experiment wasn't perfect. Certainly by 2000 B.C. and possibly earlier, the Eskimos, also known as the Inuit, had boats— though paddling across the Bering Sea wasn't the kind of thing you would do for weekend recreation, and travel from one Alaskan village to another was often arduous, there now existed the theoretical possibility for innovations to move glacially from Asia into North America. Still, for most of prehistory, cultural change in the New World appears to have been indigenous, and even during the last few thousand years, contact with the old world was tenuous. 
The two hemispheres, west and east, are the closest things to huge independent examples of ongoing cultural change that this planet has to offer. There is one other reason that primitive American cultures are so enlightening. As of Columbus's voyage, they had an advantage over primitive Eurasian societies as objects of study. Namely, they still existed. They had not been steamrolled by the expansion of old world civilizations. And though Columbus and other Europeans tried to make up for lost time with their own steamrolling, they were not wholly effective. Observed and recorded in the New World was an unprecedented array of cultures with diverse technologies and social structures. From this diversity, a few basic patterns emerge, patterns that turn out to be consistent with the archaeological remains of those steamrolled Old World cultures. Native American cultures thus offer unique evidence of the universal impetus toward cultural complexity. Indeed, they virtually show that impetus in action. Snapshots of the different American cultural fossils amount to a kind of time-lapse sequence in which cultural evolution pushes social complexity beyond the level of the Shoshone toward the modern world. Two Kinds of Eskimo Consider two kinds of Eskimo. The Nunamute Eskimos are comparable to the Shoshone, a basically family-level social organization that occasionally reaches a higher level. During seasonal caribou migrations, renowned hunters lead big hunts. The Nunamute's neighbors, the Taramute, are closely related and speak the same language, but there's one difference— Whereas the Nunamute live inland, the Taramute live on the coast and hunt whales. And as the cultural anthropologist Alan W. Johnson and the archaeologist Timothy Earle have noted, this whale hunting technology seems to have propelled Taramute social organization up the ladder of complexity. Each whaling boat is run by an umilik, a boat owner, who recruits a crew that includes such specialists as a helmsman and a harpooner. There is no better metaphor for a non-zero-sum relationship than being in the same boat, and that's especially true when capsizing means death by freezing. But in this case, the non-zero-sumness extends well beyond one boat. It often takes several boats to kill a whale— and boat owners must coordinate both the hunt and the food distribution. Perhaps building on this interdependence, the boat owners within a village have created a kind of joint insurance policy. If any one owner has fallen on hard times, he and his crew can draw food from other owners, with the promise of future reciprocation. The Taramiut say proudly, We don't let people starve and indeed the long winters, the season of scarcity, are less precarious for them than for the Nunamute. This spreading of risk doesn't end at the village's bounds. An umilik who has had a banner whaling season invites boat owners from other villages to a messenger feast, where he lards them with surplus blubber and meat. This may seem magnanimous, but, as with the smaller-scale altruism among the Kung, Generosity is a veneer. Future reciprocation is de rigueur. Like insurance policy holders, the region's boat owners are playing a non-zero-sum game, finding in large numbers security against misfortune. Long before economists were drawing graphs showing how diversified stock portfolios could serve the human aversion to risk, cultures were evolving by the same logic. The Taramiut are more socially complex than the Shoshone, the Kung, or the Nunamute. Their villages, with 100 to 200 people, comprise numerous families living interdependently year-round. These villages are truly supra-familial, whereas members of the smaller Kung camps are often so closely related by blood or marriage 
as to be more like a big extended family. The Northwest Coast Indians The Taramute, with their entrepreneurial boat owners and their intricate whale hunts, belie the standard image of the simple hunter-gatherer society, but not nearly so much as the natives of the northwest coast of North America, the Salish, the Haida, the Kwakiutl, the Nootka, the Chilkat, and others. These peoples, arrayed north and south of the present-day border between Canada and the United States, had taken yet another step up the ladder of complexity. In the popular mind, these peoples are best known for the potlatch, the famously ridiculous ritual in which local chiefs indulged in fierce duels of generosity. It got to the point, sometimes, where they would prove their wealth by heaping prized possessions not just on one another, but on bonfires. But the culture of the northwestern Native Americans illustrates more than the human penchant for showing off. Namely, the ongoing conversion of non-zero sumness into positive sums, and the resultant growth in social complexity. The Northwest Coast Indians were blessed with mind-boggling natural bounty. The salmon in their rivers may not have been so dense that, as one explorer claimed, you could walk across their backs, but they were dense. There were also halibut, cod, and herring, and the sea was rich with shellfish, sea otters, seals, and whales. And then there was the incomparable candlefish, so oily that supposedly you can stick a wick in it and use it to light a room. Diverse game called for diverse technology. The Nootka had an array of fish hooks ranging from a heat-treated spruce hook for halibut to a bone hook for cod. They made harpoons and tied them to inflated seal-skin floats to sap the energy of struggling whales. Boats ranged from one-man canoes to eight-man whalers to sixty-foot cargo boats. The Nootka had traps for bear, for deer, for elk. They had four kinds of salmon traps, ranging from cubic to cone-shaped, some as big as a small house. The actual houses suburban ranch styles, were routinely larger than 2,000 square feet and sometimes as large as 4,000. There were smokehouses for curing fish, cellars for storing cured fish, and watertight cedar boxes for storing berries. Not all the technology was so utilitarian. Luxury goods ranged from ornate copper shields to decorative robes, whose creation was an exercise in economic interdependence. Chilcat women spun the yarn from the wool of mountain goats and made twine out of cedar bark imported from Indians to the south. The yarn was dyed one of four colors, including a true blue, rare among hunter-gatherers, that was made by importing copper from the north and soaking it in urine. On a loom, the women wove intricate patterns, animals or abstractions. The finished product was exported to various northwest coast Indians whose aspiration was to someday be buried in an attractive robe. Much of this technology involved that classic non-zero-sum game, division of labor, through which, as Adam Smith noted, a group of people can expand overall output. Though all Northwest Coast Indian families would hunt and gather, many also had a sideline craft, carpentry, say, that was handed down through the family. These Native Americans also played the non-zero-sum game played by the Taramiut and the Shoshone, collective hunting, as reflected in their whaling fleets and the huge fish traps they affixed to the river floor with massive posts. These things were major capital investments. To build a salmon trap or a whaling boat took weeks. The workers had to be paid for their labor, if only in the sense of being fed. So before building began, resources had to be saved and committed to the project. Capital investment and division of labor are things we take for granted. 
They happen naturally in an economy with a currency, a stock exchange, and a bond market. The Northwest Coast Indians didn't have a capitalist economy or even a currency, yet they managed to play the same basic non-zero-sum games capitalists play. How? Through the great enemy of Adam Smith aficionados, centralized planning. The big man goes to market. The chief planner was the political leader, the big man. He held the allegiance of a clan, maybe a village. He orchestrated the building of salmon traps or fish cellars, and he made sure that some villagers specialized in, say, making canoes that other villagers could then use. To pay for all of this, he would take one fifth or even half of a hunter's kill. Some of this revenue would be returned to the people in the form of chief-sponsored feasts, but for the most part, this was simple taxation used for public goods. Only in this case, many of the public goods were things that a modern capitalist society might deem private goods. The U.S. government doesn't have a bureau of canoe making. Needless to say, the big man skimmed a little off the top. He lived in a nicer than average house and owned a nicer than average wardrobe. Whether he skimmed off more than he deserved is a complex question that gets at an unresolved academic dispute about how exploitive ruling classes are. We'll get to this debate later. For now, I'll just note that skimming a little off the top isn't exactly unheard of in a modern economy. Investment banking isn't charity work. The Northwest Coast Indians' rudimentary government wasn't only a stand-in for the market. It did things that governments do even in capitalist societies. For example, if fishermen were allowed to compete without restraint, they could deplete the salmon stock, hurting everyone. This is an instance of what the biologist Garrett Hardin famously called the tragedy of the commons, a textbook non-zero-sum problem in which overgrazing of public land by privately owned herds would be ruinous, so all herd owners can benefit by mutual restraint. The Northwest Coast Indians solved the problem by deciding when fishing would begin and end, much as governments today enforce a hunting season so that deer and ducks will live to die another day. There was even a specialist, a kind of fishing warden, who would go around from trap to trap inspecting the hall to decide when the fishing must end. Northwest government also blunted misfortune. Goods that big men gathered as tax, blankets, sea otter furs, hammered copper, were in times of scarcity traded for food with another region's big man and the food then divvied up among followers. Here, big men were together tapping one of the most hallowed forms of socially integrating non-zero sumness, the diffusion of risk, as practiced by the Kung with their giraffe meat dinner parties and by Eskimo boat owners with their inter-village feasts. The more widely this risk is spread, the better for all concerned and the Northwest Coast Indians spread it as widely as any known hunter-gatherer people, even across tribal and linguistic boundaries, as Johnson and Earl note. The resulting safety net has been called by various anthropologists social security, a life insurance policy, and a savings account. The diversity of labels illustrates that, even today, people argue over whether this function belongs in the public or private sector. The issue is partly a moral one, turning on judgments about whether the wealthy should help the poor. But to some extent, the issue is technological. Modern information and transportation technology make it easier to do all kinds of exchanges without central coordination. Today, a middle-class citizen of an industrialized nation can diffuse risk to the ends of the earth, 
buying mutual funds that invest east and west, north and south. Two economists of differing ideologies could have a long argument about whether the Northwest Coast Indians, even with their primitive technology, couldn't have put some of the big man's functions in the private sector. But almost any economist would admit that, given the absence of money, these Native Americans had a remarkable economy, with great specialization, large capital investment, and disaster insurance. All of this is a tribute to how steadfastly, even unconsciously, human nature pursues non-zero-sum gain, shaping social structure to that end. In this case, the requisite social structure was elaborate. Villages of up to 800 people, with dozens of families, recognizing a single, central authority. To be sure, the big man's powers were hardly absolute, or even very formal. To keep the economy humming, he sometimes had to cajole or browbeat reluctant donors. Still, the big man's system carries economic and political complexity to a level higher than any other society we've seen so far. The Northwest Coast Indians are testament to the arrow of cultural evolution and to its guiding force. Freaks of nature? Yet they've often been depicted as the opposite. Anthropologists of a Boazian stripe have presented Northwest culture not as a natural progression toward modern social complexity, but as a freak of nature, proof that no universal evolutionary scheme can accommodate all cultures. The Northwesterners, wrote the archetypal Boazian Ruth Benedict, were a vigorous and overbearing people who had a culture of no common order. Its values were not those which are commonly recognized, and its drives not those frequently honored. Actually, its values and drives are quite familiar, strikingly like those of the modern world. There was jockeying for status, an attendant accumulation of wealth, and thus an economy driven partly by demand for non-essential items. Indeed, there is every reason to believe that, if not corrupted by white men, Northwestern culture would have kept doing what it had done up until then, modernizing, producing wealth more and more efficiently. The Northwesterners may have been on the verge of a de facto currency, strings of dentalia shells, used as a sign of prestige and occasionally as compensation for public service. Certainly the idea of abstractly embodied wealth was familiar. One big man, in exchange for goods, issued tokens that entitled the holders to blubber from the next whale that washed up on his people's beach. If he had been born a century later, he might have founded the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. Granted, the Northwesterners did, as Benedict suggested, have their oddities. Tossing hand-woven blankets onto a bonfire seems more wasteful even than modern means of conspicuous consumption, but not by much. Besides, the absurdity of the potlatch has been exaggerated. It became flagrantly wasteful only after white traders filled Northwest culture with new luxury goods and in other ways jostled tradition. In pristine form, the potlatch had mainly served non-zero sum ends. It was a time to share useful information, and since the generosity was ultimately reciprocal, it was a rudimentary and perhaps vestigial way of using surplus to dull future risk. Even Benedict's mentor, Boaz himself, had said that one point of the potlatch was to assemble an audience for large-scale altruism between villages, thus ensuring that the debt was recorded in the public mind. Of course, Boaz didn't mean to affirm an evolutionary schema. In observing that the Northwestern economy was largely based on credit just as much as that of civilized communities, he was trying to throw a wrench into the evolutionary works— after all, weren't hunter-gatherers in such standard evolutionary theories as Lewis Henry Morgan's supposed to have communal economies? 
Yes, they were. But one thing cultural evolutionists later decided was that Morgan had erred in defining his evolutionary stages in such tightly technological terms. In his scheme, for a culture to graduate from lower barbarism to middle barbarism, it had to domesticate plants or animals, and to move from savagery to lower barbarism in the first place, it had to have pottery. But as the Northwest Coast Indians show, an affluent hunter-gatherer society can be more complex than some societies with domestication. In the early 1960s, when the mid-century revival of cultural evolutionism was in full flower, Elman Service, one of Leslie White's students, proposed a new taxonomy, band, tribe, chiefdom, state. The four grades were demarked not by technology, but by political and economic organization. The Shoshone, hunter-gatherers, were a band. The Northwest Coast Indians, also hunter-gatherers, were a chiefdom, because they had extensive economic specialization coordinated by a central authority. Defining evolutionary stages in terms of social structure was a great advance, but even so, things remain fuzzy. No two societies in the same stage are exactly alike. Besides, cultural evolution can move so gradually as to resist division into stages in the first place. To be sure, there are thresholds that get crossed somewhere between the earliest hunter-gatherers and ancient Mesopotamia. The suprafamilial threshold, in which multiple extended families come under unified village governance, and the supravillage threshold. But even these concepts lack platonic clarity. Among the Northwest Coast Indians, the strength of supravillage leadership firmed up during wars and loosened in peacetime. So, scholars who consider such leadership a hallmark of chiefdomhood have dissented from services assigning the chiefdom label to Northwest culture. Alan Johnson and Timothy Earle, whose 1987 book The Evolution of Human Societies proposed a new sevenfold taxonomy, classify it as a big man collectivity, just shy of a chiefdom. Whatever. The main point is that, since Boaz's day, when the Northwest Indians were considered so aberrant as to almost single-handedly refute cultural evolutionism, they have begun to seem less peculiar. One reason is this realization that technology doesn't work as the basic gauge of evolution, even if it is a basic impetus of evolution. But there are other reasons, too. For starters, the ruthless generosity on display during the potlatch has been found in a number of societies at roughly the same level of social organization. A big man in New Guinea, having bestowed piles of food and wealth on another big man, was heard to proclaim, I have won, I have knocked you down by giving so much. The satisfaction of delivering that one line seems meager compensation for the months it took the big man and his followers to scrape together the largesse. But the line impresses people, raising his social status, and social status, however ephemeral it sounds, has long brought tangible rewards. For example, big men, if big enough, can attract multiple wives. For that matter, a successful big man's stature can rub off on his lieutenants. At one feast in the Solomon Islands, observed in 1939, a big man named Sony parted with mounds of sago almond pudding and 32 pigs at a feast attended by 1,100 people. Sony's closest followers, who had toiled long and hard toward this day, watched proudly, but, like Sony, ate nothing. They consoled themselves with this refrain, We shall eat Sony's renown. Whether their share of Sony's renown, along with any other patronage Sony passed along, justified the work they put into his elevation is an open question. Though every coalition has a non-zero-sum premise, 
the prospect of a win-win-win outcome for its members, every coalition also has its natural zero-sum dimension, tension over how to divide the costs and benefits of collective action. In the end, even if the coalition attains its collective reward, some members may get such slim pickings that they'd have been better off not joining in the first place. In cases such as Sony's, my guess is that this sort of out-and-out -out parasitism is the exception, not the rule. I say that not because I assume Sony is a nice guy, but because I assume his followers, being human, are naturally good at guarding their interests. In any event, regardless of whether their gain indeed warranted their labors, Sony's job was to convince them that it did. And in thus mobilizing a productive coalition of scores, even hundreds of followers, for a project whose payoff is distant and vague, the big man carries politics to a level beyond that of the Shoshone rabbit boss. Indeed, though he lacks formal powers of office and must rely on persuasion, the generic big man foreshadows the modern politician. He is usually a good speaker, convincing to his listeners, writes Alan Johnson of the Melanesian big man. He has an excellent memory for kinship relations and for past transactions in societies where there is no writing, the big man is a peacemaker whenever possible, arranging compensatory payments and fines in order to avoid direct violent retribution from groups who feel they have been injured. But if peacemaking fails, he leads his followers into battle. Central among the big man's political challenges is to keep different families united in a single polity. It is a loose polity by modern standards, but it is firmer than, say, the essentially leaderless communities of the Taramiut. Crossing this threshold to the centralized, suprafamilial political unit was assuredly no easy task. Affection and trust by nature come more easily and less conditionally within families than between them. It is striking how often, around the world, big man societies have used the same cement to keep friction between families low, rituals and language that harness the natural emotional valence of kinship. Thus the various families in a northwestern clan would celebrate their common, distant ancestor, sanctified by their totem pole, though it's not clear that this ancestor had in all cases actually existed. And in a New Guinea big man society, a men's organization that lent cohesion to the suprafamilial fabric was called Brothers Under the Skin. The Aberrant Kung But if the Native American societies of the Northwest Coast were not a freak of nature, and in fact represent a natural phase in cultural evolution, then why do so few hunter-gatherer cultural fossils record that phase? Why is it that most other big man societies on the anthropological record, including those above, had domesticated crops? Why are a large majority of known hunter-gatherer societies labeled by anthropologists as egalitarian, at least relatively egalitarian, such as the Kung and the Shoshone? Maybe because that's all that was left by the time the anthropologists showed up. One reason the Kung and the Shoshone are so culturally simple is that they live in barren lands. This means, for example, that they must move often to keep fed, and so can't accumulate the weighty status symbols that the more sedentary Northwesterners spent their time crafting, never set out on a fifteen-mile trek with a thirty-foot totem pole balanced on your head. What about hunter-gatherers who live on choice land? Well, by the time anthropologists happened on the scene, most of those societies were gone. Their cultures had either evolved to a higher level, perhaps the ones the anthropologists had come from, or been overwhelmed by a culture that had. 
Agricultural societies, after all, are known to lust after good land, and hunter-gatherer societies are known for succumbing to their advances, willingly or not. So hunter-gatherers who may have inhabited the fertile shores and valleys of Europe and Asia are not available for inspection. Similarly, in Africa, the Bantu and other agriculturalists long ago swept across the best land, erasing past culture. Even in North America, much of the richest land along the Mississippi River, around the lower Great Lakes, was being farmed by the time white men arrived. And of the remaining affluent hunter-gatherer cultures, many, in Florida and California, for example, were pushed aside before 19th-century anthropologists could marvel at their peculiarity, though in both of those areas white intruders got a clear glimpse of impressive social complexity before annihilating it. The Northwest Coast Indians, far from the main avenues of Western onslaught, are one of the few hunter-gatherer societies closely observed by anthropologists in such a rich natural habitat. For all we know, they are typical. Indeed, archaeologists have lately amassed evidence to that effect. On various continents, between 6,000 and 15,000 years ago, hunter-gatherer remains show signs of growing complexity. There are capital projects, such as storehouses, and prestige technologies sit alongside the familiar stone blades and arrowheads. There are bracelets, necklaces, finely sculpted amber pendants, and headdresses. Jewelry is made of bone or shells or malachite or volcanic glass. Even practical things, bowls, knives, get more ornate. And within a given society, some people are buried amid more of this wealth than others. In short, the remains of these societies look rather like the remains of the Northwest Coast Indians. That is why it is not mere conjecture to call the Northwest Coast Indians cultural fossils, rough exemplars of a particular stage in cultural evolution. Boazian anthropologists can spend all the time they want denying evolutionary pattern, but archaeologists have found a trend too widespread to be meaningless. The more recent the hunter-gatherer remains in a given region, the more likely they are to speak of social and technological complexity. And in particularly lush spots along rivers, lakes, and oceans, the complexity often approaches that of the Northwest Coast Indians. As the archaeologist Brian Fagan has written, artifacts unearthed in recent decades speak of a global trend toward great complexity in hunter-gatherer societies in well-defined regions as widely separated as Northern Europe, Southern Africa, Japan, the American Midwest, and coastal Peru. The 19th century evolutionists lacked these data. They can be forgiven for overgeneralizing from a biased sample and typecasting hunter gatherers as poor and communal. And Boaz and Benedict, having this typecasting in mind, can be forgiven for considering the Northwest Coast's advanced culture a problem for evolutionary theories. Still, the fact remains that they were wrong. A mature evolutionary theory is bolstered, not undermined, by the parallels between complex hunter-gatherer societies and modern economies. For that matter, evolutionary theory is bolstered by simpler hunter-gatherers, including the Shoshone. They, too, embody directional cultural change. When the first Americans crossed Beringia, they possessed upper Paleolithic technology— which had begun to flourish around 35,000 B.C. This was a big advance over Middle Paleolithic technology, but it was still pretty basic. Long stone blades, fine bone points for spears or harpoons, spear-throwing contraptions. Then, around 12,000 years ago, after Upper Paleolithic people reached America and started carrying this technology all over the New World, the old world was swept by the next big thing, 
mesolithic technology. This included various fish hooks, hunting and fishing nets, complex traps and snares, racks for smoking meat to preserve it, storage baskets, and mortars and pestles for grinding wild seeds, and the bow and arrow, invented at the very end of the Upper Paleolithic, now spread widely. An Evolutionary Mirror How closely was this old-world trend mirrored in the New World, our hemispheric petri dish? Very. Every society in the Americas, by the time the Europeans arrived, had reached or surpassed the Mesolithic level, which for obscure reasons of academic history is called the Archaic in its American manifestations. Even the lowly Shoshone had their rabbit nets and commensurate institutions. Of course, not every American society independently reinvented everything in the Mesolithic toolkit. The bow and arrow may have come all the way from Eurasia via Eskimos a few thousand years ago, but much of the New World technology is too local in its utility to have come across the Bering Sea. All of this helps explain why we can call the Shoshone cultural fossils, because, like the Northwest Indians, they correspond roughly to what the archaeological record depicts as a natural phase in a worldwide evolution from simple to complex social structure. If there were a single continent, or even a single large piece of turf that didn't reflect this trend, then the skeptics of cultural evolution would have ground to stand on. But the once standard example of cultural stagnation, Australia, land of the Aborigine, has now been swept from under their feet. Archaeologists have found a trend in Australian hunter-gatherer culture toward more subtle subsistence, featuring, for example, fish hooks and a neat trick for harvesting eels, digging dead-end ditches. And when was the last time you invented anything as clever as the boomerang? Meanwhile, trade was growing as Aborigines tried to get their hands on such fancy items as green stone axes. This and other evidence of a shift comparable to the Mesolithic has undermined the traditional static model of Australian prehistory, observes the archaeologist Harry Lorondos. Maybe there's a limit to how flattered the Aborigines should be by this revisionism, for here I'm using it to support the notion of an upward arrow of human history, and on this arrow their culture ranks lower than most others. Still, embracing this notion isn't as insulting as denying it, for to deny any directionality in cultural evolution is to say that the Aborigines, or the Shoshone, or the Kung, left to their own devices, would show no natural tendency toward higher levels of technological sophistication and social complexity. This is, of course, ridiculous. Every known hunter-gatherer culture embodies a technological evolution that speaks of stubborn ingenuity focused on the resources at hand. The Kung's one-liter ostrich egg canteens, their four-liter antelope stomach sacks, their bone arrowheads coated with beetle, pupae, poison paste, all have their counterparts in comparably smart hunter-gatherer innovation around the world. The Aborigines use kangaroo incisors as chisels. They attach wooden handles to their stone knife blades by heating gum from eucalyptus to make a glue as strong as epoxy. The Andaman Islanders fuse vegetable gum and beeswax for the same purpose. They use bivalve shells for woodworking, a trick also discovered by the Alakaluf of southern Chile. The Copper River Eskimo took copper from the river, heated it, and forged it into daggers and arrowheads with stone hammers. The Greenland Eskimo used sandstone to saw chunks of iron from local meteorites and then pounded it into tools and weapons. The Chukchi of Siberia made webbed snowshoes, and the Australians of the Great Sandy Desert made webbed sand shoes. And again and again, as with the Northwest Coast Indians, we find technology that goes beyond the demands of subsistence.
The Ainu hunter-gatherers of Japan made mustache lifters to keep their soup facial hair free. All of these cultures show long-standing incremental progress. That this trend would continue indefinitely had it not been interrupted by outsiders is a central tenet of cultural evolutionism, or more precisely, of the kind of cultural evolutionism championed in this book, a hardcore kind that sees the coming of the modern world as having been all but inevitable. To deny that tenet is to deny, explicitly or implicitly, the unity of humankind, the fundamental equality of aptitude and aspiration among people of all races. Not that all of the aspirations are noble. Among the drivers of cultural evolution are the quest for status, the pleasure in showing off, and the thirst for material goods, ranging from key survival tools to needless gadgetry. The archaeologist Brian Hayden, having lived with indigenous peoples in Australia, North America, the Near East, and the Far East, has this to report. I can say categorically that the people of all the cultures I have come in contact with exhibit a strong desire to have the benefits of industrial goods that are available. I am convinced that the non-materialistic culture is a myth. We are all materialistic. Of course, notwithstanding the psychic unity of humankind, different peoples have moved along the arrow of history at different speeds, and there must be a reason. But if there is one lesson to take away from Native American cultures, it is that race doesn't seem to be that reason. The various peoples living in the New World, when white men showed up, were not genetically homogenous. Both biological and linguistic evidence suggest that they came from Asia in three successive waves. Still, the distinctions were not large. To the extent that the concept of race has coherence, the Native Americans were all in the same race. Yet, within that race, all basic levels of social evolution were represented, from the Shoshone, the irreducible minimum, through the complex hunter-gatherers in the northwest, through the agricultural chiefdoms to the east and south, to the state-level societies in what we now call Latin America. Indeed, if we take linguistic affinity as an index of genetic affinity, as it usually, though not always, is, we can see how little genetic differences mean. The Shoshone and Nahuatl languages are close relatives, both members not just of the Amerind subset of the New World languages or of the Central Amerind branch of Amerind, but of the Uto Aztecan subbranch of Central Amerind. Yet the Shoshone were at the bottom of the ladder of cultural evolution, and the speakers of Nahuatl, the Aztecs, who built pyramids and had hieroglyphic writing, were at the top. Blood would seem to mean little compared to environment, historical contingency, and cultural legacy. Or consider, again, the peoples comprising the Northwest Indians. All belonged to what anthropologists recognize as a basically unified, though hardly homogenous, culture. Yet recent studies show them to be as different genetically as any group of Indians living contiguously in a comparably small space and they speak languages so different as to suggest that some are descended from the first great migratory wave from Asia and some from the second. Yet they had a common habitat and intertwined cultural histories, and these proved decisive. Okay, so if genes aren't the answer, what is? What exactly was it about the Shoshone that so handicapped them? So far in this chapter, we've more or less assumed that an environment of plenty, such as the northwest coast, conduces to advance, while barren land does not. But, as we'll see in the next chapter, that explanation is incomplete at best. To be sure, fertile environments often accelerate cultural evolution, but not for the reasons you might think— not just because they yield natural affluence or permit the accumulation of surplus. The real key to cultural advance is more subtle, 
and, as we'll see, it is a powerful key, capable of explaining broad patterns in the past. For example, not just why the culture of the Shoshone was slower than that on the northwest coast, but why the New World in general had slower culture than the Old World. Chapter 4 The Invisible Brain All thought draws life from contacts and exchanges. Fernand Brodel Explaining the affluence of the Northwest Coast Indians seems simple at first. They lived amid natural abundance, and abundance, after all, is affluence. Presumably that's why so many of the affluent hunter-gatherer societies, recently discerned by archaeologists, lived near large bodies of water. If you want to be rich, settle on rich land. But this explanation won't wash. For starters, population tends to rapidly reach the carrying capacity of the environment— Although it's true that an acre of Northwest Territory offered more food than an acre of the Shoshone's desert, it's also true that an acre of Northwest Territory had a lot more mouths to feed. Granted, even on a per capita basis, a day's work brought in more food for the Northwest Coast Indians than for the Shoshone. Bushels of fish were hauled in and packed away for winter dining— but this efficiency was due to high technologies, the massive salmon traps, the smokehouses, the storage cellars, as well as the social structures that governed them. And the technology and social structure are part of the Northwesterners' advanced economic development, part of what we're trying to explain when we seek the causes of affluence. To make them the cause as well as the effect would be cheating. Besides, the Northwesterners' affluence goes well beyond food, and thus can't be merely the direct outgrowth of a fertile homeland. The designer robes, the spacious homes, these things don't grow on trees. Earlier this century, anthropologists thought it easy to explain such arduously crafted wealth as the indirect outgrowth of a fertile homeland. The key was surplus— this scenario assumes that the carrying capacity of the environment wouldn't quickly be reached, perhaps because there's a limit to how many hunter-gatherers can peacefully coexist in a small space. With tons of salmon just begging to be eaten, you could meet your daily food needs in an hour or two and have plenty of time left over to weave robes and build homes. After all, such industriousness comes naturally to people. No? Apparently not. In 1960, the anthropologist Robert Carnero published an influential paper about the Quikuru, who inhabited the jungles of Amazonia and tended gardens of manioc, a staple food, once you remove the poison, which they did, and the source of tapioca. The Quikuru could have doubled or tripled their manioc output, Carnero calculated, but they preferred leisure time. Since then, anthropologists have found various hunter-gatherer societies that, similarly, had time left over after their daily food gathering. And, as one scholar tartly put it, they rarely spend this time designing cathedrals or, in general, improving their lot. So much for the theory that potential surplus always equals economic development— Indeed, against the backdrop of the Quikuru and other apparently laid-back societies, it almost seems that the conventional wisdom about the Northwest Coast Indians might be right. They weren't examples of a general trend in cultural evolution. They were just weirdly ambitious. If surplus isn't the ticket to wealth, what is? What did create all the specialization and trade found in complex hunter-gatherer societies? What did the Northwest Coast Indians have that the Shoshone didn't have? What was the key to prehistoric economic development? Working Overtime Maybe we should direct these questions to a noted authority on economic development and on non-zero sumness, though he long predates such terminology. Adam Smith. 
Two factors, Smith noted in The Wealth of Nations, are especially conducive to the growing division of labor that characterizes economic advance. One is cheap transportation. Spending your afternoon making yarn for a chill cat robe makes sense only if the finished product can be transported at a cost acceptable to its buyer. The second factor is cheap communication. The costs of finding out what buyers want and the cost to buyers of finding out what's available and at what price have to be bearable for transaction to ensue. Note that the costs of transport and communication apply not just to the final purchase of the robe at the retail level, but to the links in its creation, such as getting cedar bark from the south and copper from the north. At all levels, the movement of Smith's invisible hand gets smoother as information and transportation costs drop. The lower these costs, the more highly non-zero sum the relationship among the players. The more each can gain via interaction, the more productive per capita the web of exchange. How to keep these costs low if your communications and transportation technologies are primitive? One way is to stay near your customers and suppliers. In other words, live in a society with high population density. This may be the key to the wealth of the American Northwest. Not natural abundance per se, an abundance quickly diluted by thick population anyway, but rather the thick population that does the diluting. Back before communications and transportation were sufficiently high-tech to catalyze markets, the stimulus came instead from a habitat that would tolerate large, close populations. And conveniently, such habitats were often near water, which could give both technologies an added boost. Goods and data sometimes travel better by boat than by foot. Not only were patches of the Northwest thick with people, one of whom could make blankets while a next-door neighbor focused on wood carving, larger stretches of the coast, hundreds of miles to the north and south, were thick with peoples, the various linguistic groups that constituted Northwestern culture. Their diversity of natural resources and of cultural heritage worked in synergy, Trading for cedar bark and copper was feasible, and the robes made by drawing on local tradition struck nearby peoples as enticingly foreign. Maybe, then, what the ostensibly carefree manioc growers of South America lacked was not driving ambition, but population density. In the rainforests of the Amazon basin, settlements were small and sparse. Had there been more nearby peoples, especially peoples with handicrafts and natural resources different from those on the local menu, farmers would have felt inspired to grow more manioc for exchange. In fact, this speculation has been confirmed. Though many scholars have cited Carnero's 1960 paper in dismissing the surplus theory of economic development, Few have noted how Carnero clinched his argument that manioc production in the rainforests was far below capacity. When Europeans showed up with lots of neat gadgets to trade, manioc production skyrocketed. So, all along, the difference between Native Americans of Amazonia and of the Northwest Coast hadn't been their work ethic. The difference had been that the Amazonians weren't getting paid to work overtime. Neither were the Shoshone. The arid Great Basin was even less conducive to thick population than were South American jungles. Adam Smith Amended Maybe we should amend Adam Smith's trademark metaphor of the invisible hand— Smith's point, of course, was that a bunch of far-flung people pursuing individual gain can, without really trying, collectively orchestrate a large-scale social process. The ingredients of a beautiful robe just seem to magically congregate, assemble themselves, and then find a buyer as if guided from above. It's a nice image, and in some ways apt. After all, 
A hand can do more work if moving goods is easy, if transportation costs are low thanks to the proximity of the players. Still, this metaphor gives short shrift to the other kind of cost that Smith stressed, the cost of processing data and deciding where the various resources should go. Hands aren't very cerebral, after all. Guiding any invisible hand, there must be an invisible brain. Its neurons are people. The more neurons there are in regular and easy contact, the better the brain works. The more finely it can divide economic labor, the more diverse the resulting products. And not incidentally, the more rapidly technological innovations take shape and spread. As economists who espouse new growth theory have stressed, it takes only one person to invent something that the whole group can then adopt, since information is a non-rival good. So, the more possible inventors, that is, the larger the group, the higher its collective rate of innovation. All told, then, the Northwest Coast Indians outproduced and outinvented the Shoshone not because they had better brains, the sort of conclusion Franz Boas worried about, but because they were a better brain. The fact that population density and size lubricate economic and technological development has been largely ignored by archaeologists and cultural anthropologists. True, some of them, such as Marvin Harris, do stress population growth. Indeed, some see it as the prime mover of cultural evolution. But they emphasize a different side of the growth, a downside, not an upside. Irresistible reproductive pressures, writes Harris, have led recurrently to the intensification of production, which in turn puts stress on the environment, leading to an ecological crisis that only new forms of technology and social organization can solve. In short, innovate or die. Population density, in this view, drives technological and social development not by creating opportunities, but by creating problems. This is not the place to ponder the relative importance of the upside and downside of population growth, though it is the place to suggest that the downside has been overemphasized. The key point is that these two scenarios are compatible. Even if new ideas flow mainly from the synergy of a large, dense, invisible brain, environmental stress could also spur innovations, and in any event could make people more receptive to them. If, for example, one village, for whatever reason, had developed a serviceable salmon trap and a means of managing it, chronic food shortage would make nearby peoples acutely receptive to the idea. Also, peoples who lacked the technology might perish, freeing up real estate for those who did adopt it. So, whether or not stress often triggers the birth of technologies and social structures, it could certainly hasten their spread. To borrow some terminology from biological evolution, stress raises the rate at which cultural mutations proliferate. It raises the selective pressure. In both the upside and downside scenarios, non-zero sumness looms large. Whether people are trying to add to their wealth or avert disaster, their rational pursuit of self-interest is leading to economic cooperation and social integration that make them better off than they otherwise would be. So either way, you expect population growth to foster upward cultural evolution. And since the human population has grown with few interruptions ever since it was human, the impetus behind cultural evolution would seem to be strong. If this view is correct, that one way or another, more and denser population means more advanced technology and more complex social structure, then there should be a close connection between population size and density on the one hand and technological and social complexity on the other. And there is. 
Consider the indigenous societies that once flourished on the variously sized islands of Polynesia. The larger and more dense the island's population, the greater its division of economic labor, the more advanced its technology, and the more complex its polity. The story told by these and other such cultures on the ethnographic record, these living fossils of cultural evolution, is repeated by the archaeological record. During the Middle Paleolithic, as the human population grew slowly, the rate of technological innovation, not just the total number of technologies, also rose slowly. Then, around 40,000 years ago, both of these trends passed milestones. The human species was, for the first time, large enough to encompass the old world, occupying virtually all inhabitable parts of Africa and Eurasia. Population growth would hereafter raise population density. Meanwhile, cultural evolution reached a level that warranted a new archaeological label, the Upper Paleolithic. During the Upper Paleolithic, the average rate of technological change would be one innovation per 1,400 years, compared to one per 20,000 years during the Middle Paleolithic. Then, after 10,000 BC, during the Mesolithic, with population growing faster than ever, the rate of technological innovation reached one innovation per 200 years, including such gifts to posterity as combs and ice picks. Hunter-gatherer societies, as we've seen, reached a new level of social complexity. Of course, correlations between population size and density, on the one hand, and cultural innovation, on the other, don't prove that population growth is the driving force. Maybe things work the other way around. Maybe cultural advances are what allow population to rise. In fact, that is undoubtedly part of the story. Take away the Northwesterner's salmon traps and the big man's guidance of their construction and use, or the Shoshone's rabbit nets and the rabbit boss's leadership, and population would have to thin out. But that really is the point. Technological, economic, and political development spur population even as population spurs them. In this symbiotic growth lies the inexorable power of cultural complexification. Whether you stress the negative side of population growth or the positive side, whether you stress problems or opportunities, the link between that growth and cultural evolution is one of mutual positive feedback. The more people, the more culture. The more culture, the more people. The negative side of population growth, environmental stress that makes subsistence precarious, may or may not be a big part of the story, but it is certainly not the whole story. The gadgets that pile up at an ever faster rate as population grows are not just subsistence technologies. Even back during the Middle Paleolithic, more than 50,000 years ago, people were intrigued by ochres for painting and pyrite crystals. As we've seen during the Mesolithic, such prestige technologies as jewelry became an appreciable chunk of gross domestic product. Great effort went into creating these status symbols, they seem to have been traded over hundreds of miles, back in a time when hundreds of miles was nothing to sneeze at. Even by 30,000 B.C., long before the Mesolithic, beads made of pierced seashells were migrating 400 miles from their point of origin. Later, regular networks of exchange blossomed, linking local invisible brains to distant invisible brains. The faint outlines of giant regional brains began to form, and the driving force wasn't periodic environmental stress, but a more constant force, human vanity, powered by the status competition that is part of all known societies and seems to be innate. The fitful but relentless tendency of invisible social brains to hook up with each other and eventually submerge themselves into a larger brain is a central theme of history. 
the culmination of that process, the construction of a single planetary brain, is what we are witnessing today, with all its disruptive yet ultimately integrative effects. Continental Divides Once you appreciate the importance of population size and density, the cultural gap between the old and new worlds starts to make sense. Twelve thousand years ago, as the occupation of the Americas was just picking up steam, population was larger and thicker back in the Eastern Hemisphere. Thereafter, so far as we can tell, the New World lagged behind the Old World in population by several millennia, which is roughly how far the New World lagged behind the Old World in reaching early technological thresholds, such as agriculture, and early political thresholds, such as the chiefdom. Indeed, if anything, post-agricultural social evolution unfolded slightly faster in the New World. Michael Creamer, an economist who stresses the link between population size and technological evolution, and who has pointed to the New World's lagging technical level as Exhibit A, has also found Exhibit B, the melting polar ice caps that severed the old and new worlds also severed Tasmania and Australia. Tasmania's small population promptly fell culturally behind the more numerous Australians. Modern explorers, on contacting the Tasmanians, found them to lack such Australian essentials as fire-making, bone needles, and boomerangs. Thus the four petri dishes created by the melted ice caps, Old World, New World, Australia, Tasmania, behaved in accordance with theory. Larger and denser populations equal faster technological advance. Certainly, as we'll see, social advance can be retarded by things other than scanty population. Still, population is vital. It helps explain why we can call a people less advanced, the Shoshone compared to the Northwest Coast Indians, Native Americans in general compared to Europeans, without insulting them. After all, an individual Shoshone's brain could house as much information as a European brain. A hunter-gatherer is a vast and general data bank, featuring arcane knowledge about local flora and fauna and a basic grasp of all known technology. The average European in Columbus's day knew much less about nature and very little about most European technology. He or she used the cerebral space thus saved by specializing in one narrow economic task. It was the synergy of many such specialized European brains that created the technology with which Columbus and other such men intimidated Indians. Individual Native Americans weren't stupider than individual 15th century Europeans. They just had the disadvantage of being Renaissance men. If the mutually positive feedback between culture and population were the whole story of cultural evolution, then we could end our narrative here with the words, and so on. But it isn't. As we've seen, there are forbidding thresholds that got crossed somewhere between the Shoshone and modern America. Among them are the supra-familial threshold, crossed by the northwestern Native Americans, and the supra-village or chiefdom threshold, which the Northwesterners flirted with but may have never quite crossed. The reason these thresholds are so dicey is that typically, along with all the benefits of affiliation, comes a loss of autonomy, subordination to a political leader, and clusters of families, like individual families and, for that matter, individual people, prefer autonomy to subordination, all other things being equal. To be sure, human nature in some ways lubricates these transitions. Our species is naturally hierarchical, in the sense that people tend to sort themselves out by social status, and the resulting facility with which leaders lead and followers follow has no doubt eased the evolution of social complexity, but according to modern Darwinian theory, 
social hierarchies didn't evolve for the good of the group, so followers don't cheerfully submit to the leader for the sake of the public interest. People by nature like high status, and generally reconcile themselves to lower status only grudgingly and temporarily until a chance for advancement arises. Thus, when any family or any group surrenders autonomy, submerging its identity in a larger body, subordinating itself to a central authority, some natural resistance has been overcome. So far we've been talking as if economics alone can impel people across these barriers. The rational pursuit of wealth and economic security entails non-zero-sum interactions that, at least in societies which lack a currency, seem to call for political hierarchy. So political hierarchy materializes. But is the story really so simple? Can economics alone get people and groups to surrender their sovereignty? And if not, what else has helped to do the job? This is the grim subject of the next chapter. Chapter 5 War. What is it good for? If we think how many things besides frontiers of states the wars of history have decided, we must feel some respectful awe, in spite of all the horrors. Our actual civilization, good and bad alike, has had past wars for its determining condition. William James Ah, Tahiti, the lush island whose carefree natives the painter Paul Gauguin used as icons of primitive bliss, the serene culture which Jean-Jacques Rousseau considered evidence that humans had been noble savages, peaceful and benign, before their corruption by civilization. Unfortunately, as the anthropologist Lawrence Keeley has noted, Rousseau relied for this conclusion on reports of Tahiti that omitted relevant parts of its history— for example, the custom in which a victorious warrior would pound his vanquished foe's corpse flat with his heavy war club, cut a slit through the well-crushed victim, and don him as a trophy poncho. Time and again there have been reports of a truly peaceful primitive people. Almost always the reports have not worn well. Remember the gentle Tosidae? the isolated band of hunter-gatherers discovered in the Philippines in the early 1970s, the people who had no word for war. Their authenticity fell into doubt along with the credibility of their discoverer, Manuel Elizalde. As the New York Times would later note, it did not help when members of a neighboring tribe said Mr. Elizalde had paid them to take off their clothes and pose as tassades for visiting journalists. To be sure, there are hunter-gatherer societies that don't exhibit the elaborately organized violence denoted by the term war, but often what turns out to be lacking is the organization, not the violence. The warless Kung San were billed in the title of one book as The Harmless People, yet during the 1950s and 1960s, their homicide rate was between 20 and 80 times as high as that found in industrialized nations. Eskimos, to judge by popular accounts, are all cuddliness and generosity. Yet early this century, after Westerners first made contact with a 15-family Eskimo village, they found that every adult male had been involved in a homicide. One reason the Kung and most Eskimo haven't waged war is their habitat. With populations sparse, friction is low. But when densely settled along fertile ground, hunter-gatherers have warred lavishly. The Ainu of Japan built hilltop fortresses, and when raiding a neighboring village, wore leather armor and carried hardwood clubs. The main purpose of the raids to kill men, steal women, and settle grievances, real or imagined, is a time-honored goal of primitive warfare. Even today it is part of life among the Yanomamo of South America. The behavior of observed Stone Age peoples is hardly the only evidence that the Stone Age was a bloody time. 
In a cave in Germany, clusters of skulls more than 5,000 years old were found arrayed, as one observer put it, like eggs in a basket. Most of the 34 victims had been knocked in the head with stone axes before decapitation. Anyone hoping that cultural evolution always translates into moral improvement will be disappointed to hear that such evidence of violent death is especially common among remains of the more complex hunter-gatherer societies, and in the yet more complex agrarian societies on the ethnographic record, things are similarly grim. In South Asia, a young Naga warrior was not considered marriageable until he had brought home a scalp or a skull. In Borneo, a Dayak hero returning from war would be seated in a place of honor and surrounded by singing women with the head of one of his victims placed nearby on a decorative brass tray. The warriors of Fiji gave their favorite weapons terms of endearment. One war club was called Damaging Beyond Hope, and a spear was dubbed The Priest is Too Late. All of this forces us to confront the fact that, as Keeley has put it, what transpired before the evolution of civilized states was often unpleasantly bellicose. Human violence has been around a long time, and often it has been not man against man, but group against group. Ever since the early stages of cultural evolution, the era of hunter-gatherer societies, that evolution has been shaped by armed conflict. Comrades in Arms This would seem to throw a wrench into the analytical works. So far, this book has mainly stressed the forces of human cooperation, the win-win situations. The thesis has been that the direction of history results largely from the playing of non-zero-sum games. But, presumably, once someone has decided that he wants to use your corpse as a poncho, the two of you are playing a zero-sum game. His gain is your loss. So, too, with warring villages. When men from one village raid the other, kill the men, and abduct the women, the air is rife with zero-sumness, and so on up the ladder of cultural evolution, whether the contestants are villages, city-states, whatever. War is hardly non-zero-sumness incarnate. Still, war isn't non-stop zero-sumness either. One big reason is that, even as war is inserting zero-sum dynamics between two groups, within the groups, things are quite different. If your village is beset by axe-wielding men bent on slaughter, your relations with fellow villagers can pivot quickly toward the non-zero-sum. Acting in concert, you may fend off the assault, but divided, you will likely fall. Much the same interdependence exists among the axe-wielding slaughterers. In unison lies their best hope for victory. So, whatever side you're on, you and your fellow villagers are to some extent in the same boat. Your fate is partly shared. That, actually, is a good rough-and-ready index of non-zero-sumness, the extent to which fates are shared. War by making fates more shared, by manufacturing non-zero-sumness, accelerates the evolution of culture toward deeper and vaster social complexity. This was a constant refrain of one early cultural evolutionist, the sociologist Herbert Spencer. He overdid it. Only by imperative need for combination in war were primitive men led into cooperation. But... He was on to something. Consider again the Northwest Coast Indians. We've already seen how their evolving technology of sustenance raised social complexity. Division of labor and capital investment grew, and leadership emerged in the form of the big man, who handled the logistics and helped keep social life in harmony. But all of this heartwarming cooperation to harvest nature's bounty was not the only social cement, nor the only cause for the big man's authority. War among the various peoples along the northwest coast was a chronic threat. Just look at their technology. 
not the fish hooks and salmon traps, but the daggers, battle axes, war clubs, and bonehead spears, the stockades, wooden helmets, and coats of armor made of leather and wooden slats. Aggression was a way to obtain land or slaves or women, or just to do some quick plundering. The Haida of the Queen Charlotte Islands have been called the Vikings of the Northwest Coast. But whatever the cause of war, being on the losing end was bad news. So being tightly knit was a good idea, as was having a leader. Someone has to guide the peacetime amassing of military technology. And, as Spencer observed, war, requiring prompt combination in the actions of parts, necessitates subordination. Societies in which there is little subordination disappear. Again and again, societies have chosen subordination over disappearance. Faced with war, they fall in line. Walter Badgett, one of Spencer's contemporaries and an early editor of The Economist, explained the consequent social harmony this way, the tamest are the strongest. That zero-sumness promotes non-zero-sumness should come as no surprise. The standard example of non-zero-sum dynamics, after all, is the game theory exercise called The Prisoner's Dilemma. If two partners in crime cooperate, if each agrees to stay mum when interrogated by the prosecutor, rather than implicate the partner in exchange for lenient treatment, both can benefit, and the source of their common interest is the conflict of interest between them and the prosecutor. In the realm of primitive warfare, this unifying effect can go beyond the people of a single village. One great way for a village to fend off assault, or to conduct assault, is to ally with another village, a standard tactic among the Northwest Coast Indians. And once this alliance exists, any enemies have good cause to themselves find allies. And so on, an arms race of organization that expands the social web outward, weaving more and more villages together. The speed with which hostility can thus move to higher levels of social organization, leaving harmony in its wake, has been much noted by anthropologists. The newer of Sudan, as studied by E. E. Evans Pritchard early this century, were an especially vivid case. A Boer tribesman explained, We fight against the Rengion, but when either of us is fighting a third party, we combine. Evans Pritchard described the dynamic abstractly. Each segment is itself segmented, and there is opposition between its parts. The members of any segment unite for war against adjacent segments of the same order and unite with these adjacent segments against larger sections. It sounds almost like a general law of history, and indeed, history offers lots of examples— formerly contentious Greek city-states forming the Delian League to battle Persia, five previously warring tribes forming the Iroquois League under Hiawatha's deft diplomacy in the 16th century after menacing white men arrived in America, American white men two centuries later merging thirteen colonies into a confederacy amid British hostility, and pithily, capturing extreme non-zero-sum logic with the slogan, Join or Die. In the short run, this impetus for aggregation may seem aimless. Alliances shift, tensions come and go, and large social structures dissolve almost as often as they form. But in the long run, over millennia, the worldwide trend has been toward consolidation— toward higher and higher levels of political organization. And one reason is war. Intense, essentially zero-sum games that generate non-zero-sum games. In past chapters, listing technologies that elevate non-zero-sumness, I cited such contraptions as rabbit nets and huge salmon traps. The fact of war expands this list to include technologies that aren't so obviously conducive to cooperation. 
the spread of iron weapons near the end of the second millennium B.C. may not sound like a recipe for social cohesion, but it was. The Israelites encountered iron weapons in the hands of the Philistines, who, according to one Samuel, brought a very great slaughter for there fell of Israel thirty thousand foot soldiers. In response, the loosely confederated tribes transformed themselves into a unified monarchy. The Israelites were warned that this would mean taxation and conscription, but they insisted, We will have a king over us, so that our king may govern us and fight our battles. Pushing and Pulling One could describe the congealing effect of war by saying it pushes people together into organic solidarity. It poses an external threat that impels them into closer cooperation. And one could describe the causes of solidarity emphasized in previous chapters, the economic causes, as pulling people together. Opportunities for gain originate within the society and draw people into closer cooperation. If you think about this distinction long and hard, it is guaranteed to start seeming fuzzy. Still, the words push and pull provide a handy, if rough, terminology for describing two basic kinds of non-zero-sum forces in cultural evolution. The relative importance of push and pull has been the subject of much disagreement. The dispute tends to focus on the several major thresholds of cultural evolution. Consider the chiefdom threshold. It is one thing for neighboring villages to become trading partners or even to attain a measure of supra-village political organization via loose confederation. It is another thing for neighboring villages to grant real, ongoing power to a central authority, for one village's chief to become the paramount chief. When this happens, a chiefdom has been formed. The anthropological literature features many chiefdoms, from the indigenous peoples of Hawaii and Tahiti to the American Indian princess Pocahontas's people, the Powhatan and the anthropological literature features differing interpretations of them. Some scholars say the villages in chiefdoms were initially pulled together by trade and other economic sinews. Others say they were pushed together by war or the threat of war. And some push enthusiasts go further and say war was doubly important. Not only were villages often united to better fight wars, they were united in the first place by war, by raw conquest. Robert Carnero has written, Given the universal disinclination of human groups to relinquish their sovereignty, the surmounting of village autonomy could not have occurred peacefully or voluntarily. It could, and did, occur only by force of arms. Carnero, a fan of Herbert Spencer, and the editor of a volume of Spencer's writings, was a student of Leslie White, who did so much to revive cultural evolutionism at mid-century. As it happens, White's other star pupil, Elman Service, took a quite different, un-Spencerian view. Service, who died in 1996, envisioned chiefdoms often being formed when several nearby villages were bound by commerce, the village located at the nexus would naturally become the richest and would gradually grow dominant. It could all happen peacefully, Service believed. In his 1962 book, Primitive Social Organization, he wrote, It is, in fact, clear from the record in some cases, and probable in many others, that small neighboring societies, or parts of them, often join an adjacent chiefdom quite voluntarily, because of the benefits of participation in the total network. Carnero's reply essentially is, Networks schmetworks. Force, and not enlightened self-interest, is the mechanism by which political evolution has led, step by step, from autonomous villages to the state, he wrote in 1970. Carnero and Service have come to serve as icons of the push-and-pull views of the world. 
a group of social psychologists studying social evolution in the laboratory even set up elaborate simulations of the service condition. Different groups crafted products and traded with other groups, and the Carnero condition. Groups could trade, but one of the groups was allowed to confiscate the products of other groups. For what it's worth, the experiment showed that leadership, an acknowledged paramount group, emerged in either event, and under the service condition, the standard of living was higher. But in the real world, services theory has been harder to validate. When the political merger of villages has been observed, it has usually come by aggression or intimidation. And when consolidation has been voluntary, it has generally been to fend off external aggression. On the other hand, service might point out economically driven integration is a slower process than conquest or military alliance. Hoping to have seen it during the brief history of anthropology is like taking a few seconds to watch grass grow. Besides, since service's death, some archaeologists have noted how little evidence of warfare they found amid the rubble that reflects the evolution of chiefdoms. Waging Peace In a way, the difference between Carnero's push view of the world and service's pull view isn't as stark as it sounds. Service did acknowledge, even stress, the frequency of war in prehistory. Indeed, in his view, conflict has been so persistent that to talk of the causes of war, as if it needed them, was almost to get the story backward. Better to think of war as a fairly natural condition, and then examine the means by which people have avoided it. We should study not the waging of war so much as the waging of peace. Implicit in this view is the suggestion that the picture of war presented above as a strictly zero-sum game is too simple. And it is. War can be so mutually devastating that both sides clearly lose. In that case, it is a non-zero-sum game. Specifically, you could call it a negative-sum game, in contrast to such positive-sum activities as economic exchange. In The Art of War, Sun Tzu, recognizing war's lose-lose aspect, counsels commanders to leave their enemies a means of escape. Hence the incentive to wage peace. Of course, societies have a stubborn tendency to think of war as a zero-sum game. They heedlessly launch it, even though their own men will surely die. What's more, once the war is launched, it is full of zero-sum dynamics— when opposing soldiers are in pitched battle, their fortunes are inversely correlated. For these and other reasons, I will continue to treat wars as mainly zero-sum games and add nuance as necessary. Nonetheless, service has a point. Even if individual wars are often essentially zero-sum, featuring a clear winner and a clear loser, warfare endless, intermittent, back-and-forth battling, can be, in the long haul, very bad for both sides, and such persistent negative sumness is indeed grounds for waging peace. In service's view, then, war is just another reason to value the harmony that comes from economic integration. It isn't to fight wars that society evolves so much as to escape wars— to carve out broader and sturdier war-free zones. Perhaps, service suggested, not only the evolution of government, but the very evolution of society and culture itself depends on the evolution of the means of waging peace in ever-widening social spheres by continually adding new political ingredients to the social organization. In theory, the first step toward waging peace would be to recognize that ongoing warfare is indeed a lose-lose game. It doesn't take a game theorist to see this. In Papua New Guinea, one man observed, War is bad and nobody likes it. Sweet potatoes disappear, pigs disappear, fields deteriorate, and many relatives and friends get killed. 
but one cannot help it. The second step would be figuring out how to help it, and here some progress can be found in societies at all levels of organization. That includes the Northwest Coast Indians. When two peoples with a history of enmity could benefit through trade, a big man on one side might ritually bond with a big man on the other side. The two would exchange gifts and ceremonial names, becoming brothers. Thereafter, wrote the anthropologist George Peter Murdoch in 1934, neither ever engages in war with the other, and the dwelling of either is a sanctuary where the other can always find refuge. Through this channel, the Haida gave dried halibut, mats, furs, and canoes to the Chimchian in exchange for grease, candlefish, copper, and blankets. Among big man societies generally, perhaps the most common means of waging peace is the lavish feast. One more reason not to consider the potlatch irrational. An anthropologist who studied two societies in Papua New Guinea noted how intervillage feasts were used to create regions of peace and stability in an inherently dangerous world. Then again, to Carnero and other push theorists, this sort of waging of peace looks suspiciously like a tool for waging war. Hosting a feast can win a village a military ally. And even if the feast merely neutralizes a potential foe, that may provide enough leeway for conquest on another front or defense on another front. The more you think about waging war and waging peace, the more inseparable they seem. A single coin with Carnero's visage on one side and services on the other. Consider the Yanomamo of South America. Intensively studied by the anthropologist Napoleon Chagnon, in the middle of Yanomamo territory, where villages are crowded together, war is especially common. Carnero likes to stress that this core area shows signs of political evolution, larger villages and firmer political leadership, especially during war. On the other hand, Carnero and Service might both cite. Each with his own spin, the fact that this area also includes more intervillage bonding, designed in Chagnon's words, to reduce the possibility of warfare between the principles, and both might note again with different spins, Chagnon's surmise that villages sometimes cultivate a kind of phony trade in the name of peace. A village, Chagnon believes. Will refrain from making a particular tool precisely to create interdependence with a neighbor that does make it. What Carnero and Service, and for that matter Chagnon, would agree on is that, in one sense or another, an atmosphere of war can foster the evolution of complexity. Where warfare is intense and migration out of the area not feasible, wrote Chagnon. There is selection for larger local groups and more elaborate intergroup relations. As service realized, the waging of peace long predates war per se. Feuds between two hunter-gatherer families don't qualify as war. Yet, like war, they impede the gains of concerted economic behavior. To enjoy the fruits of supra-familial organization, feuds must be suppressed. Peace must be locally waged, and as it happens, this local broadening of amity is further encouraged by the existence of slightly less local enmity, contention between clusters of hunter-gatherer families, and so it goes up the scale of cultural evolution, the crevices of social organization, the zones of zero-sum contention between families or villages or chiefdoms or states, keep getting filled in by the cement of non-zero sumness, and the zero sumness thus displaced keeps retreating to higher levels of organization, and from there it continues to have its paradoxically congealing effect at lower levels. Still. As service stressed, the congealing also has its own internal logic. Whatever caused the expansion of peace, war, the threat of war, 
the far-sighted avoidance of the threat of war, peace is ultimately its own reward. Just ask the Ayuana of New Guinea. After they were pacified by Europeans, the men rejoiced in their newfound ability to go urinate in the morning without fear of ambush. The first step toward a productive day. Also the first step toward trading with the former ambushers, thus weaving a web of interdependence which can fortify the peace that's been waged. Note how war, or at least the threat of it, narrows the range of choice. In the previous chapter, I more or less assumed that people tend to harvest the fruits of non-zero sumness. They just naturally like to raise their standard of living and to insulate themselves against risk. This fondness for bounty and security assures that they will try to realize positive sums, experimenting with new technologies and new forms of social organization, and this realization sustains the basic directional drift of history. Whether I'm right in this claim about human nature certainly matters, but in a context of war, the context of human history, it matters less. For in that context, people have little choice but to pursue economic and organizational advance. After all, unproductive societies tend to get squashed. An anthropologist described one group of Northwest Coast Indians trapped between powerful neighbors as being ground to bits, reduced to scurrying around nibbling on raw food lest campfires attract attention. People who are conquered may live on after conquest, and they may be lucky enough not to be enslaved, but they will almost surely wind up adopting a new system, the system of the conqueror. And conqueror's systems tend to be productive, to involve, for example, a relatively advanced division of labor. One way or another, non-zero sumness wins in the end. All of this brings us back to Kant's emphasis on unsocial sociability. The realm of sociability, the geographic scope within which peace reigns, has grown massively since our hunter-gatherer days, and commensurately massive quantities of unsociability have been overcome. Yet they are often overcome under the ironic stimulus of higher-order unsociability. To put this dynamic of cultural evolution in the Darwinian language of natural selection, what is selected for is larger and larger expanses of non-zero sumness, but one of the main selectors is the zero-sum dimension of war. In this sense, waging war, in the end, is waging peace. An authority on human behavior once remarked that if two people stare at each other for more than a few seconds, it means they are about to either make love or fight. Something similar might be said about human societies— if two nearby societies are in contact for any length of time, they will either trade or fight. The first is non-zero-sum social integration, and the second ultimately brings it. Chapter 6 The Inevitability of Agriculture The farmer takes a wife, the farmer takes a wife. From the nursery song, The Farmer in the Dell. A favorite pastime of archaeologists is to invent competing explanations for the domestication of plants and animals, which first happened around 10,000 years ago. Perhaps, one theory has it, a hotter climate, by drying up once fertile lands, made the hunter-gatherer lifestyle suddenly precarious, and people groped for a new livelihood— or maybe the extinction of giant elk, woolly mammoth, and other big game had the same effect. Or, on the other hand, maybe the key was a more benign environment, a climate which happened to nourish certain plants that were good candidates for domestication. And then there is a simpler theory. Farming was just a good idea. It was a good idea in the same sense that the various tools and techniques constituting the hunter-gatherer lifestyle had been good ideas, and thus had been added to the human repertoire. 
This was the radical position taken in 1960 by the University of Chicago archaeologist Robert Braidwood. Reviewing his own fieldwork in the Middle East, where farming first appeared, he depicted agriculture's advent as merely the culmination of an ever-increasing cultural differentiation and specialization of human communities. So far as he could tell, there is no reason to complicate the story with extraneous causes. Braidwood is considered the founder of the modern study of agriculture's origins, but this particular opinion wasn't destined for veneration. Notwithstanding his injunction against complicating the story, archaeologists have continued to complicate the story. The above-cited causes and others still jockey for preeminence, more than two decades after Braidwood insisted that agriculture needs no special explanation, an archaeologist, summarizing the consensus, declared that agriculture is not yet satisfactorily explained. The search for causes continues. An air of mystery still surrounds the origins of agriculture. Indeed, if anything, the air thickens. Some scholars now say that, paradoxically, early farmers would actually have had to work longer and harder to grow food than to just get it the old-fashioned way, by hunting and gathering. Thus, the logic behind the origins of agriculture, we are told, is much less straightforward than it seemed back in Braidwood's day. This view poses a problem for cultural evolutionists, or at least for hardcore cultural evolutionists such as me. After all, if farming was such an unappetizing prospect, how could humanity have been virtually certain to take it up eventually? Shouldn't passage through this threshold be counted as a lucky break, a chance venture that could just as easily have been the road not taken? And if so, doesn't that make all that followed farming, ancient civilizations, less ancient civilizations, and so on, look far from inevitable? Plainly, before we can get on with the rest of this book, we must dispel some of the mysteries surrounding agriculture's origins and deflate the ongoing search for causes. Conveniently, that will give us a chance to dispel some misconceptions that persist to varying degrees within the social sciences and in various ways sap enthusiasm for hardcore cultural evolutionism. Happy Hour The case against agriculture's being a natural cultural advance began to gather momentum with the surprising discovery that hunting and gathering isn't such a bad way to make a living. The Kung San Richard Lee found in the 1960s work just a few hours a day, hunting, digging roots, harvesting mongongo trees, and then it's Miller time. In 1972, the anthropologist Marshall Sollins, a former cultural evolutionist turned skeptic of cultural evolutionism, dubbed hunter-gatherers the original affluent society on grounds that all the people's material wants are easily satisfied. And the problem isn't just that primitive agriculture may have been a regression in terms of sheer efficiency. The more populous villages that farming ushered in would presumably foment disease, and the low-protein, high-starch content of some staple crops might be unhealthy. Studying the bones of early farmers, some archaeologists have concluded that they had shorter lives and more rotten teeth than hunter-gatherers. This brings us to misconception number one, that cultural evolutionists believe change is guided by far-sighted reason. Actually, cultural evolution has involved little advanced planning— no prehistoric hunter-gatherers assembled a committee to decide whether a growing reliance on starchy foods would eventually promote tooth decay. Planted food slowly replaced wild food over many generations, and slowly the planted food became less like its wild ancestors. It got domesticated. The question isn't why hunter-gatherers chose farming— 
but why they chose the long series of tiny steps leading imperceptibly to it. Part of the answer is that these hunter-gatherers were people. People are innately curious. They fiddle around with nature and try to bend it to their will. Consider the Kumeye of Southern California. Technically, they were a hunter-gatherer people, but when encountered by the Spanish in the 18th century, they had transfigured the landscape. At high altitudes, they planted groves of oaks and pines, whose nuts they harvested. Elsewhere, they planted yucca and wild grapes. Near villages, they planted cactus for liquid refreshment. The Kumeye burned off unwanted plants to pave the way for their favorites and raised dense shrubs to attract deer. None of the plants they cultivated were domesticated, so this massive intervention didn't qualify as farming. Still, is it really likely that the Kumeye could have gone another thousand years without breeding juicier grapes? The Kumeye are far from the only hunter-gatherers who have given nature a helping hand. Australian aborigines replant the tops of the wild yams they eat. And remember the Shoshone of the Great Basin, often taken as paragons of the primitive? They burned off unwanted foliage, and some Shoshone planted wild food species. Some even used irrigation. Hunter-gatherer societies that cultivate plants but haven't yet domesticated any are sometimes called proto-agricultural. Dozens of such societies have been observed. You might think that anthropologists would look at all these societies and say, the impulse to groom nature seems strong and widespread. Maybe the coming of agriculture wasn't so unlikely after all. You would be wrong. Often the reaction is the opposite. Proto-agriculture, we are told, just goes to show that many hunter-gatherers knew enough to become full-fledged farmers, yet chose not to. Often underlying such pronouncements is the unspoken premise that cultures are static. They have assumed final form. It wasn't just that the Kumeye hadn't taken up farming, but that they didn't take up farming. End of story. Thus, an evolutionary view of culture is dismissed by assuming that cultures are not in the process of evolving. The Myth of Equilibrium The assumption that primitive cultures are static is grounded in misconception number two, the idea of intrinsic equilibrium. The idea that cultures stay the same unless jostled by such outside forces as retreating glaciers or sudden drought. Happily, this notion has lost favor among many archaeologists and anthropologists, but it has more than its share of defenders, that is, more than zero, and has deeply influenced thinking not just about agriculture, but about culture generally. A recent archaeology textbook asserts that cultures do not change in any patterned fashion as long as they are successfully adapted to their environments and the environment does not change. It is the assumption of equilibrium that compels archaeologists to seek an external cause for any development as dramatic as agriculture. Subscribers to the equilibrium fallacy underestimate the unsettling nature of human innovation— the extent to which new ideas and techniques spring from within societies and transform them. But downplaying our species' genius is not the only problem. As we've seen, the main impediment to farming isn't thought to be a lack of inventiveness, but rather a lack of necessity. As Marvin Harris has put it, what keeps hunter-collectors from switching over to agriculture is not ideas, but cost-benefits— the idea of agriculture is useless when you can get all the meat and vegetables you want from a few hours of hunting and collecting per week. Here, aiding and abetting the equilibrium fallacy is misconception number three, that human societies are fundamentally unified, devoted to meeting their collective needs. The mistake gets back to the romantic notion of hunter-gatherer societies as oases of communal bliss— all for one and one for all. 
And if all are getting enough food, then why should any one bother trying something new? The answer is that hunter-gatherers are in truth just like us. They're competitive, they're status-hungry, and above all, they are individuals. In those hunter-gatherer societies that are proto-agricultural, the clusters of cultivated wild foods aren't typically community property. Usually they are owned by a particular family or extended family that dispenses the harvest as it sees fit. Once you start thinking of hunter-gatherers as driven by the physical and psychic needs of themselves and their families, there's no shortage of reasons why they might cultivate plants in their spare time. Consider, once again, the Northwest Coast Indians, whose lavish use of cultivated wild plants is now coming to light through the work of the geographer Douglas Dewar. A quackyoodle household might have its own salt marsh garden for clover roots or silverweed roots, nutritional delicacies, and might tend plots of wild berries or edible ferns. In hard times, when, say, the salmon weren't running, the family might eat the entire harvest, but often the food would serve the family's interests more obliquely. Being a gastronomical delight, it could be swapped for candlefish oil, and sometimes crates of garden-grown food were paired with other foods and handicrafts to fetch a prized copper shield. Often such exchanges took place between villages, orchestrated by big men, but non-zero sumness also welled up within villages. A household might give food to a needy neighbor with a view to future reciprocation. In the meanwhile, the giver, in addition to having garnered an IOU, enjoyed some status elevation, and families chronically in a position to give enjoyed chronically high status, like philanthropists. Even in modern suburbs and small towns, avid gardeners win local esteem by giving neighbors fresh tomatoes or flowers. This strikes most of us as normal behavior. But the possibility that people might behave the same way in a primitive economy, where both the gift and the ensuing IOU were of much greater value, seems rarely, if ever, to cross the minds of archaeologists as they ponder the mystery of agriculture. The various benefits of gardening were an incentive to refine it. There's evidence that the Northwest Coast Indians were weeding out the less robust specimens, the first step toward domestication. And to expand the level land in their uneven habitat, they built retaining walls, which had the added virtue of holding nutrient-rich soils. The Kwakiutl word for garden means place of manufactured soil. In addition to the Northwest Coast Indians and other proto-agricultural hunter-gatherer societies, there are cultural fossils further along in the evolution toward agriculture. Various horticultural societies grow domesticated crops in gardens but still rely on some hunting and gathering. Most of these societies resemble the Northwest Coast Indians, with gardening a private enterprise that pays off at the family level. Thus, a young Yanomamo man in the jungles of South America, having just gotten married, will clear a garden for plantains, maize, cotton, tobacco, and other crops. He is not doing this for the good of his whole village. Indeed, he may surround the coveted tobacco with a fence, even plant sharp bones as booby traps. When he shares his harvest, he will do so selectively, cementing friendships, incurring unwritten IOUs, repaying his own debts, amassing status. The farmer takes a wife, or two. Could something as ephemeral as status really entice people into becoming agricultural innovators, even when they face no regular shortage of food? The answer comes from looking at the top of the pecking order, at the big man, or head man, a version of which is found among the Yanomamo and horticultural societies generally. Big men tend to have not just big gardens, but big numbers of choice wives. The idea here isn't that aspiring big men necessarily sketch out a systematic plan for acquiring multiple wives. 
During the biological evolution of our species, one of the benefits of male status was easier access to sex. So too with our nearest relatives, chimpanzees, bonobos, gorillas. Because of this correlation between status and fecundity, genes imbuing males with a thirst for status have fared well by natural selection. The resulting drive to impress people needn't bring conscious awareness of its reason for being, any more than hunger entails a knowledge of nutrition. Status just feels gratifying. It seems to be its own reward, even if its ultimate evolutionary purpose was genetic proliferation. On the other hand, conscious awareness of the sexual payoff for farming is, if not necessary, hardly out of the question. When Sony of the Solomon Islands, three chapters ago, was preparing those thirty-two succulent pigs that he wasn't going to get to eat, he no doubt knew that the more adroit Solomon Islands feast-givers, that is, big men, got as many as five wives. Indeed, sometimes the link between amassing food and amassing wives is explicit. Among the Northwest Coast Indians and some other polygamous peoples, loads of garden-grown food could be part of the bride price paid for a wife. Archaeologists, faced with the observed correlation between a farmer's status and wealth on the one hand and his number of wives and offspring on the other, have tended to get things backward. Big men are said to seek multiple wives since many wives produce more food than one wife, and to have many children since many children produce more food than few children. To be sure, big men may value the labor provided by a large family, but in terms of the ultimate logic of their quest, the Darwinian logic that selected the genes that fuel the quest, they are amassing food to amass wives, not the other way around. If the food pays off nutritionally, that's great, but even if it doesn't, it is valuable, because it raises their status relative to competing males. Among the Trobriand islanders, one anthropologist reports, farmers aimed to accumulate so many yams that they may rot in storehouses and stimulate the envy of rivals. The problem with scholars mystified by agriculture's origins isn't that they are unaware of status hierarchies in horticultural and fully agrarian societies. The problem is that they tend to view the hierarchy as a product of domestication, in which case it couldn't be a cause. Hence, misconception number four, the notion of the egalitarian hunter-gatherer band. We've already suggested that the venerable notion of the utterly communal hunter-gatherer band is suspiciously romantic, that the Kung San, for example, are subtly permeated by selfishness. Are they also prone to social climbing? The answer isn't obvious, since wealth, even in the form of a little extra food, is hard to accumulate. They live in a desert and often relocate. But it's a good bet that if gardening were more practical, they would find that cultivating extra food was a good way to win wives and influence people. Of course, as the most industrious men exploited this fact most fully, accumulating wives and power, social inequality might grow. Still, social climbing would have been the cause of the farming, not just the result. In a sense, this thought experiment has already been conducted in the form of the Ghana, nearby bushmen who supplement their hunting and gathering with farming. Among Ghana men, the anthropologist Elizabeth Cashden has noted, the allotment of sexual resources is quite unequal. One-fourth of the men have more than one wife. Writing in 1980, near the heyday of hunter-gatherer romanticism, Cashton heretically argued that it would be wrong to see the Ghana's social inequality as having emerged with agriculture. After all, she noted, about 5% of Kung men had more than one wife. The reason the struggle for status is so subtle among the Kung, she contended, is their precariousness. Shortfall could strike any given family, so it is in each family's interest to support an ethic of sharing as insurance. 
The Ghana, Cashton wrote, illustrate the lifting of the constraints that produce strict egalitarianism among other Kalahari hunter-gatherers. And full-fledged domestication is not the first step in that lifting. Proto-agricultural hunter-gatherer societies broadly are more likely than the average hunter-gatherer society to have conspicuous disparities in status. Apparently, the Northwest Coast Indians aren't the only people who found that homegrown food is a social lever. It would be an exaggeration to say that all archaeologists who ponder the origins of agriculture have ignored the quest for status. Brian Hayden has championed a maverick competitive feasting theory inspired by the potlatch and other less famous forms of intervillage feasting. The idea is that if in any society some aspiring big man, some Sony, can get fellow villagers to produce lots of food, he can use it to elevate his status in feasts with other villages. In the process, he can acquire political influence within his own village. So far, so good. But Hayden describes the big man as a genetically distinct personality type present in all societies— the aggrandizer. These aggrandizers are empire builders. They seek to control human affairs for their own benefit and gratification. In short, they are bad guys, different from such good and innocent souls as you, me, and Hayden. This is in some ways a comforting world view, but it is at odds with modern Darwinian theory, not to mention observed social reality. To be sure, some people, for whatever reason, are more ambitious than others. But there's a little big man in all of us. We are all social climbers by nature. Some just manage to climb higher than others. What does it matter whether social ambition is a property of our whole species rather than just of the Henry Fords and Margaret Thatchers of the world? Well, the more widespread the urge to impress the stronger the force that drives cultural evolution. If everyone is always striving for social status, then every increment in the evolution of agriculture, from the tiniest, scruffiest garden on up, is easy to explain. There's a kind of arms race, with food as the weapon. Actually, food is just one of the weapons. Political organization is another. From the early days of agricultural history, as Hayden's theory hints and the Sonys of the world show, coalition building comes into play. Leaders who can harness non-zero-sum logic to draw people into cooperative effort prevail in competition for status and other social resources, inviting future leaders to do the same on a larger scale. Miller Time Reconsidered once you realize that man does not live by bread alone, that status and sex are nice too, the claim that hunting and gathering beats primitive farming as a subsistence technology begins to lose relevance. Of course, the logic behind agriculture would be even stronger if it turned out that this claim about hunter-gatherers was wrong, or at least exaggerated in the first place, and it may have been. The seminal calculations of the Kung workday, two or three hours, then party time, have been put to skeptical scrutiny and found wanting. The calculators forgot to include time spent processing the food, making spears, and so on. It now appears that these hunter-gatherers, at least, work roughly as hard as horticulturists. Further evidence that hunter-gatherer life is not a year-round vacation can be found in proto-agricultural societies. The Shoshones planted wild foods, one anthropologist observed, were insurance crops and frequently served as crucial secondary staples. So too with primarily hunter-gatherer but incipiently horticultural societies, such as the Suriano of Bolivia. While trekking through the forest in search of game, writes another scholar, they would visit their scattered gardens, depending on them as secure sources of food energy. All of this suggests that the layperson's common-sense notions about life among prehistoric hunter-gatherers is on target, 
adversity was part of life, shortage loomed over the horizon, and fortune favored the prepared. Between the quest for status and the quest for sheer survival, we have a powerful impetus behind the evolution of agriculture. The impetus gets even stronger when we add one more factor, our old friend from the previous chapter, war. How would war encourage agriculture? In primitive war, few things come in handier than sheer manpower, and agriculture supports much larger settlements than hunting and gathering does. One of the earliest known farm towns, the ancient excavated village of Jericho, housed hundreds of people on around six acres. Not huge by modern urban standards, but compare it to what lies beneath, remnants of a hunter-gatherer camp one-fifth as large. Imagine a battle between these two villages, and you'll see that farming was a compelling lifestyle. Whether or not early farmers thought about the military edge their lifestyle offered, war would have helped the lifestyle spread. Perhaps fittingly, Jericho is surrounded by a wall. At four meters high and three meters thick, with cylindrical watchtowers, this wall may have once been the largest capital project in the history of the world, a monument to the non-zero sumness created by conflict between groups and thus intensified by farming. Three Struggles In the end, then, the claim that agriculture is not yet satisfactorily explained is misleading at best. If anything, the coming of farming was overdetermined. There is a surplus, not a shortage, of plausible explanations. The struggle for status within societies, armed struggle between societies, and the struggle against scarcity. Of course, excessive explanatory power is no scientific vice when the three explanations are logically compatible. The archaeological record bears the clear marks of the first two struggles, wars and status competition. During the Mesolithic, just before the emergence of farming, wood and bone armor appear. Cemeteries contain lots of people who died violently, and artists start depicting archery battles. Meanwhile, within societies, status competition is getting more conspicuous, with more and more bracelets, beads, and amber pendants showing up in high-status graves. Were people trading food for these, adding an incentive to expand food production? There's no archaeological way of knowing, but such exchanges have been seen among hunter-gatherers, as when the Pomo of Northern California got acorns and fish for their beads. In any event, Jericho, the quintessential farm town, would eventually become a regional trade center. The third struggle, against scarcity, doesn't leave such clear records. But we can say this much. Even assuming this struggle wasn't a central force behind the evolution of agriculture, it would have kicked in if given enough time. As the planet's population grew, and indeed it grew faster and faster as hunter-gatherer societies grew more and more complex, the day was bound to come when nature's cornucopia couldn't feed the teeming masses, however ingenious their hunting and gathering. Whatever the relative importance of these three struggles in driving the evolution of food procurement technologies, the effect was evident before farming. These technologies evolved from the Upper Paleolithic, with its well-crafted stone blades, through the Mesolithic, with its sickles, bows and arrows, mortars and pestles, nets and fancy traps. During the Upper Paleolithic, the menu grew beyond traditional staples, nuts, roots and big game, to include birds, dangerous animals, lions, boar, and smaller animals, such as rabbits. With the Mesolithic toolkit, the menu expanded further, encompassing snails, lizards, frogs, grass seeds, lots of fish and shellfish, and lots of plants, including poisonous ones that had to be detoxified. At one hunter-gatherer village near the Euphrates River around 10,000 B.C., people were processing 157 species of plants. 
With this growing environmental mastery, there was less and less need to migrate, so gardening made more and more sense. Sedentism seems to have preceded full-fledged domestication in most, if not all, cases. This long, clear trend, the ever more intensive search for food, is rather at odds with the image of hunter-gatherers sitting around picking their teeth until some external change created a sudden need for agriculture. More specifically, it is at odds with the assumption that a hunter-gatherer band wouldn't embrace new food techniques unless they were clearly less arduous than the old ones. As the scholars T. Douglas Price and James A. Brown have noted, additions to the hunter-gatherer diet during the millennia preceding agriculture were often more costly in terms of procurement and processing than were existing foods. All of this leaves agriculture looking less revolutionary than evolutionary. Hunter-gatherers had long been working hard to intensify their yield, getting more and more food from a given acre of land. Farming was no great conceptual break with traditional subsistence patterns, in the words of Mark Nathan Cohen, one of the first anthropologists to voice doubts about the notion of a natural equilibrium. To be sure, agriculture would ultimately prove revolutionary, a technology that would restructure society. Indeed, the rate of social change after agriculture so surpassed the more sedate pre-agricultural rate that it is fair to speak of a kind of equilibrium being disrupted. But the point is that the disruptor wasn't some external and whimsical force, such as drought or retreating glaciers, but rather internal and inherent forces, such as social striving and population growth. Moreover, however sudden the changes wrought by farming, the nature of the changes was nothing new. Agriculture's ultimate social implication, sharply elevated social complexity and non-zero sumness, had long been manifesting itself more slowly. Toward the end of the hunter-gatherer era, there were more storage huts and other capital projects requiring political leadership, more long-distance alliances, and more trade, not to mention more kinds of food and tools than ever before. In short, Robert Braidwood was right to dismiss the mystery of agriculture back in 1960 by depicting farming as merely the culmination of an ever-increasing cultural differentiation and specialization— Standard attempts to explain domestication as a response to epic change, a suddenly more barren landscape or a suddenly more fertile landscape, are indeed unnecessary. Certainly, environmental changes can add to the logic of farming and help explain why it arose in one area before another, but if the question is why farming evolved at all, we needn't delve into the details of climate, flora, and fauna. Given enough time, it was bound to happen. This notion of a persistent and universal evolutionary logic behind farming helps explain an otherwise puzzling fact. Farming kept getting invented, and once invented, it tended to spread— the consensus among archaeologists is that farming arose anew at least five times, three times in the New World, twice in the Old World, and possibly seven. Surely this is no coincidence. Of course, different cultures reached this threshold at different speeds. We've already seen some reasons for lags in cultural evolution, and there are others. The biologist Jared Diamond, in his book, guns, germs, and steel, has explained many such disparities via geography. For example, some areas are more blessed with readily domesticable species than others, and species spread east to west more easily than north to south because the climate changes less, so Eurasia was a better place for crops to diffuse than were the Americas or Africa. Even so, Areas that are in these or other ways handicapped often surmount their handicaps. 
In fairness to archaeologists, it should be noted that few would deny directional pattern in the archaeological record, and some would even agree that the advent of agriculture was quite likely, given long enough. Still, once you start throwing around words like inexorable or virtually inevitable, almost all archaeologists grow skeptical, if not disdainful. There is an irony in the refusal of so many scholars to embrace hardcore evolutionism and concede the stubborn force behind culture's ascent to higher levels of organization. As we've seen in this chapter, it is an overly integrated view of human society that blinds many of them to this integrative power. By thinking of hunter-gatherer societies as tightly organic, naturally and deeply cooperative, devoid of envy and one-upmanship, they overlook the subtle but strong and ultimately productive forces of competition within any human society. Kant's unsocial sociability. The harmony they wrongly perceive leaves them deaf to ongoing harmonization. At the outset of this chapter, we suggested that perhaps farming arose simply because it was a good idea. But good in what sense? In the sense that it helped people avoid starvation? In the sense that it helped people win wars? In the sense that it helped people gain status? Yes, in the sense that it helped people do the things that people try to do. And by virtue of thus satisfying people, the idea of farming was good in another very fundamental sense. It was good at getting itself spread. In cultural evolution's war of all against all, the concept of farming was a survivor. Chapter 7 The Age of Chiefdoms When the philosophers of the 18th century made religion out to be an enormous error conceived by priests, at least they were able to explain its persistence by the interest the sacerdotal caste had in deceiving the masses. But if the peoples themselves have been the artisans of these systems of erroneous ideas, at the same time that they were their dupes, how has this extraordinary hoax been able to perpetuate itself throughout the course of history? Emile Durkheim Three centuries ago, when Europeans in North America encountered the chief of the Natchez Indians, they couldn't help but notice his high self-esteem. One Jesuit priest observed that he knows nothing on earth more dignified than himself. And since the chief knew nothing in the heavens greater than the sun, it seemed only natural to deem himself brother of the sun. This logic made sense to the sun-worshipping Natchez people, who vied for proximity to the chief's divine aura. Upon his death, those who had the honor of accompanying him into the afterlife would swallow enough tobacco to lose consciousness and then be ritually strangled. From a modern vantage point, it is hard to relate either to the chief or to his followers— Few politicians today consider themselves gods or demigods, or at any rate, few would admit it. And few citizens aspire to spend eternity in the company of politicians. It's tempting, indeed, to dismiss the Natchez people as a bizarre aberration. But they were actually pretty typical, typical of human beings living in a particular phase of cultural evolution, the chiefdom, in which numerous villages are subordinated to firm, centralized political leadership, and that leadership is distinctly institutionalized. So far as we can tell from the archaeological record, all the ancient state-level societies were preceded in cultural evolution by chiefdoms. So far as we can tell from the ethnographic record, the leaders of chiefdoms have routinely claimed special access to divine force— and, remarkably, their people have typically considered this claim plausible. How can we say with confidence that chiefdom is a standard phase of cultural evolution, a natural transition between the big man society and the states of the ancient world? 
Since the rubble of prehistory, by definition, holds no written records, what lets us discern the social structure of a long-lost people? Here, the chief's characteristically large ego becomes a good source of illumination. We know from chiefdoms observed over the past few centuries that chiefs go to great lengths to underscore their chiefliness. Some Polynesian chiefs turned their entire faces into ornate works of art, enduring a painful, tattoo-like engraving process that leaves the skin looking like the leather on a fancy cowboy boot. Other chiefs have force-fed their wives into obesity, creating vivid testament to their affluence. Unfortunately for archaeologists, fat cells and engraved skin don't fossilize well, but other common forms of chiefly self-advertisement are more enduring, such as monumental architecture, often built in tribute to, and as a reminder of, the chief's distinguished lineage. Hence the huge mounds built in North America as tombs for past chiefs, or the pyramid-like temples on Tahiti, or the earliest ziggurats in Mesopotamia, the giant stone heads on Easter Island, up to ten meters tall, also suggest social organization beyond the big man level. Using these and other hallmarks of a chiefdom, archaeologists have found a clear pattern. After agriculture first spreads across a region, chiefdoms tend to follow. This doesn't mean that farming is a prerequisite for a chiefdom— Natural abundance and attendant population density will occasionally do the trick. As we've seen, the Northwest Indians were on the verge of chiefdomhood, and the Calusa of Florida, also coastal hunter-gatherers, were a full-fledged chiefdom, whose leader dispatched an armada of eighty canoes, not enough, to battle Ponce de Leon. Nor, on the other hand, are we saying that chiefdoms inevitably follow fast on the domestication of plants and animals. In the jungles of Amazonia or New Guinea, farming doesn't become very productive very fast. But, given a friendly environment and a millennium or two, widespread agriculture does seem to propel social organization into the age of chiefdoms. Thus, Farming and cattle ranching come to England around 4,000 B.C., and within a thousand years, megaliths, orderly arrangements of boulders, as at Stonehenge, start appearing. The same pattern, first farming, then chiefdoms, is found earlier in continental Europe. Julius Caesar would happen upon chiefdoms when he ventured into Germany and Gaul. In Mesoamerica, Central America, and the south of modern Mexico, farming villages were common by 2000 B.C., and within a thousand years, immense stone heads in the Easter Island genre had been carved, and so on. Chiefdoms, the scholar Randolph Widmer has written, were at various times the most common form of society found throughout Europe Africa, the Americas, Melanesia, Polynesia, the Near East, and Asia. Around the world, with the multiple invention and rapid spread of agriculture, cultural evolution marched on. Chiefdoms sustained the basic trend toward larger and more complex social organization. They seem to have flourished, in part, by harnessing large quantities of non-zero sumness, the chief, like the Northwest Indians' big man, orchestrated much of the necessary coordination. But the orchestra was larger. Thousands, even tens of thousands of people, sometimes spread over diverse landscapes with diverse resources. So economic integration could be deeper and broader, with more division of labor and larger swaths of regular economic intercourse. Capital projects could be more ambitious, irrigation systems, even the occasional dam. Sounds wonderful, but it poses two puzzles. First, how could the cold logic of non-zero-sumness thrive in a hotbed of ridiculous superstition? 
how, if at all, did things like sun worship and ritual strangulation translate into economic efficiency? The second puzzle is how the stereotypical chief could be a faithful steward of the public good. Chiefs, after all, aren't known for their sensitivity to the welfare of others. Just ask four 16th-century Calusa village leaders who were subordinate to the paramount chief. Not subordinate enough, apparently. He cut off their heads and displayed them at a party. The followers of Chief Powhatan, father of the Indian princess Pocahontas, were described this way by the Englishman John Smith. At his feet they present whatsoever he commandeth, and at the least frown of his brow their greatest spirits will tremble with fear. This attitude is not a good antidote to a politician's self-aggrandizing tendencies. One standard response to this puzzle is simple. Chiefs actually didn't serve the public. They duped the public into serving them, and religion was part of the duping. As one archaeologist puts it, Chiefs co-opt the religious authority of the community for themselves. In this view, a chiefdom's division of labor and its public works did yield positive sums, more output than the same people could have produced working alone, but the chiefs then appropriated the gains rather than returning them to the people whose synergy created them. Chiefs, in short, were parasites. Here we revisit a venerable debate we've already touched on, a debate that applies to much of human history, the question of exploitation by ruling elites. At one extreme are Panglossian optimists, often of a rightward political bent, who can find the sunny side of the most gratuitous social inequality. At the other extreme are those, typically on the left and sometimes Marxist, who see exploitation everywhere they look. One place to seek evidence in this debate is Polynesia, this vast stretch of the South Pacific, dotted sporadically by islands, is a laboratory of chiefdomhood. Between 200 B.C. and A.D. 1000, settlers leapfrogged from island to island, starting new societies. In some cases, such as Hawaii, settled around A.D. 400, these social experiments were thereafter isolated from the others. Such seclusion notwithstanding, a general pattern emerged across Polynesia, the blossoming of chiefdoms that grew more complex over time. The question is, was it good complexity, fairly equitable in its benefits, or was it bad complexity? And where did religion fit in? The Polynesian Chiefdoms The generic Polynesian chief had plenty of sacred clout. He was an earthly representative of the gods, the conduit through which divine power, or mana, flowed into society. Indeed, he possessed tapu, such sanctity that commoners were not to come in direct contact with him, hence the modern word taboo. Some chiefs were carried around on litters and had trained spokesmen, talking chiefs, who handled the dirty business of public communication. The Polynesian chief, observed one Western scholar, stands to the people as a god. At first glance, the chief's sacredness would appear to give him nearly infinite license to exploit, but to some extent, at least, he seems to have served the people solving such classic non-zero-sum problems as risk diffusion and public works. His spiritual aura helped him compel contributions to the communal pool of starch paste that, on various islands, was then centrally stored in case of famine. Other donated foods, tax proceeds, that is, went to feed laborers who built irrigation systems. In Hawaii, Chiefs laced the coast with more than 400 saltwater fish ponds, set off from the ocean by stone walls. Chiefs also handled the making of canoes and the training of navigators. And then there were great taxpayer-financed feasts. Through this redistributive ritual, 
the commoners ate delicacies that they themselves didn't grow, playing a non-zero-sum game that people in a market economy take for granted. Sound like paradise? Not so fast. Especially in the large, highly stratified chiefdoms, the division of labor the chief fostered as a proxy for Adam Smith's invisible hand sometimes did little good for the laborers. In Hawaii, the feathers, dogs, and bark cloth collected for redistribution seldom trickled down to their level of origin. They were largely a kind of patronage for the chief's key subordinates, many of whom, conveniently, were close relatives, and many of the fish in those arduously built ponds were destined for elite dinner tables. In Tonga, the official stonemasons, fed by the toil of commoners, spent their time making chiefly tombs. Still, if power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely, we must wonder why a man who stands to the people as a god wasn't even more self-aggrandizing than Polynesian chiefs generally were. The question isn't so much why chiefs weren't wholly equitable as why they bothered with equity at all. What might keep a chief on moderately good behavior, notwithstanding his awesome stature and the greed inherent in human nature? For starters, fear. Surprisingly, demigods can lead a precarious existence. As Elman Service put it, the rise and fall of chiefdoms has been such a frequent phenomenon that it seems to be a part of their nature. There are two main sources of chiefly demise. One is losing wars. Here are some descriptions by various anthropologists of various Polynesian islands. A chronic state of war, Samoa, in a state of more or less incessant warfare, Niue Island, constant fighting and warfare, Tongareva. In this regard, Polynesian chiefdoms parallel other chiefdoms, such as those in the Cauca Valley of Colombia, where war was universal, acute, and unending. War, as we saw in Chapter 5, works against social structures that lack certain properties. One property is economic vigor, enough wealth to make weapons and canoes, enough food to let large numbers of men live close together in formidable density. Thus does war encourage chiefs to do a good job of imitating the invisible hand. And one key to the invisible hand's success is rewarding people for their labor. That is, return non-zero-sum gains to the workers who produced them as an incentive to produce more, resist the parasitic temptation. But why worry about the commoner's incentives? Why not just command them to work harder, since you are, after all, a demigod? That brings us to the second source of chiefly demise, popular discontent. One of the great misunderstandings about evolved human nature is that people are sheep, that because we evolved amid social hierarchy, true, we are designed to slavishly accept low status and blindly follow the leader, false. People by nature seek the highest status they can attain under the circumstances, and they accept leadership only so long as it seems to serve their interests. When it doesn't, they start to grumble. The Tahitians had a phrase for chiefs who eat the power of the government too much. The upshot is that certain kinds of theoretically possible outcomes of non-zero-sum games are not much seen in the real world. Consider the following payoff matrix for a game we can call the utter exploitation of the hapless commoners game. If the chief and five commoners don't play the game cooperatively, that is, don't constitute a smoothly functioning chiefdom, then the chief gets zero points and the commoners get zero points each. If chief and commoners do play the game cooperatively, then the chief gets five points and the commoners still get zero. Even though this game has no win-win outcome, it qualifies as non-zero-sum 
because the player's fates aren't inversely related. The total payout isn't fixed at zero, but rather can go up via cooperation. Still, I would argue this is the sort of positive-sum outcome that history doesn't much feature, and one reason is that human nature won't permit this degree of exploitation. Pure parasitism under any real-world conditions short of literal slavery. In fact, human nature doesn't often permit this sort of exploitation under fake-world conditions either. In one classic game theory experiment, a pair of subjects is offered a collective windfall, money for nothing. The first subject, the chief in this analogy, decides how to divide up the money between the two, and then the second subject, the commoner, chooses between accepting his allotted share and vetoing the deal, vaporizing the windfall for both of them. Time and again, commoners veto deals that are radically unequal. An offer of $20 out of $100 gets vetoed about half the time, and any offer of less than that is probably doomed. Imagine college students turning down real money for no work, Apparently, there are some kinds of non-zero-sum games that people just won't play. And this pride is found cross-culturally. Experiments in Japan, Slovenia, the United States, and Israel yield the same basic results. To say that people naturally resist extremely raw deals isn't, of course, to say that raw deals don't happen— in 1994, the game theorist John Nash won the Nobel Prize for, among other things, rigorously exploring how various circumstances could weaken one's bargaining position so that logical outcomes of non-zero-sum games may not be what most of us would call fair. Thus, when people of different income levels bargain over how to divide the benefits of their joint and equal labors, the richer person is in a stronger position. The player who needs the money less can more credibly threaten to drop out of the game altogether. In chiefdoms, the commoners' bargaining disadvantage went beyond their low incomes. At sub-chiefdom levels of social organization, people can often vote with their feet. Northwest Coast Indians peeved at their big man could shift allegiance— signing on with another big man. But when you live in a chiefdom, there's often no easy way out. The village next door has the same boss as your village. Powhatan's chiefdom covered more than 100 villages. Besides, the chief may not have an open emigration policy. This bargaining disadvantage, not being able to go find another game altogether, helps explain why social inequality became stark and sometimes rigid with the advent of chiefdoms. The Natchez, for example, divided their society into sun people, nobles, honored people, and stinkards. Nash's work and the Natchez class system is a reminder that non-zero sumness, though a mainly good thing, isn't goodness itself. That it tends to grow naturally during history doesn't mean that common conceptions of justice and social equality will magically prevail in the end without extra guidance. Still, human nature does tend to place some limit on injustice. For a tiny elite to monopolize the fruits of mass labor is not generally feasible. The commoners grow restless. God knows the average chief would be willing to brutally suppress discontent, but his power is finite. He may have some reliable henchmen, but he doesn't have the sort of large police force or army found in state-level societies. One standard distinction between a chiefdom and a state is that a chiefdom lacks a monopoly on the legitimate use of force. Victims of crimes, in concert with kin and friends, may take justice into their own hands, though they're well advised to do so with the chief's blessing. Thus, tyrannical though chiefs may be, chiefdoms ultimately have a certain diffuseness of power. 
Indeed, the tyranny is in part to compensate for this fact. When South American chiefs decorated the fronts of their homes with the impaled skulls of past enemies, lest the awe of a passerby should flag, this was, in a sense, a sign of insecurity. Even in the highly stratified chiefdoms of Hawaii, Tahiti, and Tonga, observes the archaeologist Patrick Kirch in The Evolution of the Polynesian Chiefdoms, chiefs were still expected to work for the communal welfare, and an overly bloated chieftainship might raise the specter of rebellion. Consider the Hawaiian storehouses full of tax revenues, craft items, and food. They served some genuinely non-zero-sum functions, social insurance, capital to support public works, and so on. But from the chief's perspective, this economic function served a deeper political function. As one 19th century Hawaiian chief explained, the storehouses were designed as a means of keeping the people contented so they would not desert the king. After all, the rat will not desert the pantry. This is why leaders serve the public interest, not because they are public-spirited, but because neglecting the public welfare can diminish their own welfare. That same 19th century chief said that a number of Hawaiian rulers have been put to death by the people because of their oppression of the Maka Ayanana, the commoners. A few kind words about chiefs. Scholars who stress only the exploitative side of chiefdoms underestimate the difficulty a chief faces in trying to get things done in a moneyless economy, the difficulty of being a one-man invisible hand. One archaeology textbook says that chiefdoms arose as chiefs achieved the restriction of access to critical resources and exploited the power thus gained. But, of course, markets too restrict access to critical resources. You don't have money, you don't get access, and the way to get money is to work. A common tactic of chiefly restriction, the textbook says, is the extension of control of water into control of people. But sometimes, at least, that's a questionable description. What can we say about the Hawaiian chief who rewarded those who helped build a dam with parcels of land watered by the resulting irrigation? Well, first of all, he got the dam built. Second, he overcame an impediment to non-zero-sum gain, the free rider problem, he made sure you couldn't benefit from the project unless you helped pay for it. Given the good done by chiefs, it's dubious to assume, as some archaeologists have, that the ornate Polynesian grand houses, assembly places, and temple platforms signify wealth being commandeered toward the apex of the socio-political pyramid— Temples and public assemblies are an integral part of a religion that, while abetting some exploitation, also fosters some public welfare. Where in the accounting books they should go is thus arguable. As Marvin Harris has written, viewed within the living context of a redistributive system, tombs, megaliths, and temples appear as functional components whose costs are slight in comparison with the increased harvests which the ritualized intensification of agricultural production makes possible. Enough kind words about chiefs. By and large, they seem to have been ruthlessly self-serving, power-hungry monsters. Then again, aren't we all? Or at least, wouldn't we be if we found ourselves playing for sufficiently high stakes? In any event, politicians often have been, in chiefdoms, in authoritarian states, in democracies. In assessing how exploitative different governments are, the key question is, how much greed can leaders get away with before it comes back to haunt them? The answer depends partly on the level of cultural, especially technological, evolution. The technology of money, for example, 
eventually came along and made it easier for ordinary people to enjoy non-zero-sum gain via markets, with less meddling from on high. But in the pre-monetary economy of the chiefdom, much non-zero-sumness flowed through central channels, inviting exploitation. On balance, this book will argue the technological evolution of the past 10,000 years has been bad news for centralized parasitism. Indeed, the liberating upshot of some new technologies, information technologies in particular, is one of the cheerier themes in the unfolding of cultural evolution. But for now, the point is just that whatever the prevailing technology, however dependent people are on centralized guidance, self-aggrandizement has its limits. Indeed, in the case of Polynesia, the religion had a kind of built-in safeguard against disastrously autocratic government. Mana was not monopolized by the chief. Through him, mana flowed to his subordinates, who possessed less of it than he, and then to their subordinates, who possessed less of it than they. Thus, mana was what rank is to the modern military— a degree of authority geared to your degree of responsibility, a useful property in a top-down command economy. What's more, the chief's king-sized share of mana was supposed to be manifest in good governance. So if a chief, say, suffered military defeats, then, as Kirch has written, the stigma of low mana would attend him, and his authority and power might well be challenged. He might be usurped by a warrior whose triumphs had evinced high mana. Thus, mana was, among other things, a feedback mechanism, a way of ushering inept chiefs off stage. It wasn't as smooth a conduit for discontent as regular elections, but it wasn't the handy tool of subjugation that the chief might have liked. The standard cynical view of religion in chiefdoms that, as one archaeologist put it, chiefs simply invent supernatural sanctions to strengthen their authority, makes the theologizing and the politicking sound easier than they were. A few kind memes about memes. The academic fountainhead of cynical views of religion is Marxism. In tempering the cynicism, I don't mean to dismiss the whole Marxist view of the world. Marx gets nothing but applause from this corner for depicting religion as a mediator of deep economic imperatives. Kudos, too, for the more general Marxist claim that a society's superstructure, religion, ideology, morality, reflects an underlying infrastructure— technology, and the relations of economic power implied by the technology. Even a certain amount of Marx's specific cynicism about religion is hard to argue with. Religion does sometimes function as the opiate of the masses, and elites do try to use their power to shape ideas to their ends. Marx just went a bit too far— and this century, more than a few archaeologists and cultural anthropologists joined him. Toward the end of the century, a new source of excessive cynicism about religion sprang up, not Marxist in orientation, but Darwinian. Arch-Darwinian Richard Dawkins titled the last chapter of his 1976 book The Selfish Gene, Memes, the New Replicators. Trying to accent the parallel between cultural and genetic evolution, Dawkins posited the existence of memes, units of cultural information that can spread through a culture rather as genes spread through a gene pool. It's worth taking a quick look at the Dawkinsian view of cultural evolution, in part to see where it goes awry in depicting religion, but also for a larger reason— this initially disorienting, topsy-turvy view of cultural change is ultimately fertile and will surface repeatedly in this book. A meme can be just about any form of non-genetic information transmitted from person to person. A word, a song, an attitude, 
a religious belief, a mealtime ritual, an engineering concept. Bodies of memes can be whole religions or ideologies, or moral systems or technological systems. The positing of basic units of cultural information, analogous to genes, is far from new. Ideen was among the previously proposed labels. But more than most past thinkers, Dawkins was willing to see memes as active, even, in a certain sense, alive. He asked us to invert our usual worldview. Don't think of songs, movies, ideologies as passive bodies of information that you, the active agent, choose. Think of them as competing for access to your brain, which they use to propagate themselves. When you whistle a favorite song, that song, that meme, has successfully manipulated your brain to its ends. You may object that memes surely aren't conscious. They don't actually calculate stratagems for penetrating your mind. True enough. Then again, genes aren't consciously calculating either. In fact, in a certain sense, genes aren't even active. Their chemical environment just reacts to them in predictably constructive ways. Yet biologists find it useful to view genes as active agents that replicate themselves and compete for precious space in the gene pool. Biologists talk about effective strategies of replication from the gene's perspective. The justification for this metaphorical shorthand is that natural selection preserves those genes that happen to act as if they were pursuing a strategy. And so it is with memes. Songs that affect your brain in a way that causes you to whistle them, songs that deftly manipulate your brain, are the kind of songs that evolve. You are their breeding ground, like it or not. Short of committing suicide or living in a cave, there is no way to avoid that role. So far, so good. Now, here comes the problem. Dawkins compares memes not just to genes, but to viruses. Memes hop from one person to another, much as viruses do. Moreover, memes, like viruses, can be bad for the people who help spread them. The meme of injecting heroin is so pleasurable that a person may do it repeatedly and eventually die from it. The meme then dies with him, but that's tolerable from its point of view so long as some of his friends have picked up the habit from him. The heroin-shooting meme, like the AIDS virus, can thrive even while killing its host, so long as it waits long enough for the execution and transmits copies of itself in the meantime. The problem here isn't that there aren't prolific memes that are like viruses. Heroin shooting is indeed one. The problem is that there aren't many. Human brains, having spent the last couple of million years of their biological evolution in a cultural milieu, are pretty good at selectively retaining memes that are good for them, while aggressively repelling memes that are bad for them. This is one problem with the idea of ruling elites whimsically imposing whole ideologies on brain-dead common folk. Notwithstanding the rarely viral nature of memes, mind virus has now become almost synonymous with meme, and this parasitic view of culture gets applied with particular zeal to religion. The philosopher Daniel Dennett writes of the religious memes themselves, in effect, parasitically exploiting proclivities they have discovered in the human cognitive immune system. Dawkins himself, whose hostility toward religion approaches religious intensity, has compared belief in God to a virus. Well, it depends on the God. Members of the Heaven's Gate commune, who in 1997 got all dressed up and committed mass suicide, indeed seem to have indulged a virulent theology. But many, if not most, religious people are happy and productive, and enviably free of existential angst. Meanwhile, the theology of Heaven's Gate doesn't seem to be catching on. Non-zero-sumness wins again. 
The casual ascription of viral or parasitic properties to religion often rests on the conflation of two separate issues, truth and value. Religious doctrines have indeed often entrenched themselves in people's brains, notwithstanding the fact that they are probably false, heaven and hell, for example. But being false is not the same as being bad for the believer. Though all religions can have unpleasant side effects, neurotic aversion to sin, say, it is hardly clear that religious belief is on balance worse than the various alternatives— heroin addiction, say. Maybe the biggest problem with the viral view of culture is the way it ignores or at least downplays the various levels of social organization at which memes do battle with one another. Cultural evolution isn't just memes leaping from person to person. Often memes leap from group to group. Chiefdoms fight each other, and the culture most conducive to victory tends to prevail. Meanwhile, within a chiefdom, villages vie with other villages for status, clans vie with clans, families with families, and finally individuals with individuals. Since this competition is typically nonviolent, people don't die, but memes do because successful individuals and families and clans and villages get imitated. Their memes displace other memes through cultural selection. A premise of this book is that memes which manage to pass through this gauntlet of cultural selection and come to characterize whole societies often encourage non-zero-sum interaction— after all, a common reason that groups of people get emulated, families, clans, villages, baseball teams, corporations, sects, nations, whatever, is their productive and relatively harmonious interaction. So memes that bring productive harmony get admired and adopted. Consider again the heaven and hell memes. Almost all religions have the functional equivalent good or bad consequences that are said to result from good or bad behavior. And almost invariably, the bad behavior includes cheating in one sense or another, stealing your neighbor's property, lying about your contributions to the communal effort. By discouraging such parasitism, these religious memes help realize non-zero sumness. Cultural evolution, as various scholars have noted, is quite different from genetic evolution, in particular, faster and messier. Cultural innovations, new memes, can be introduced purposefully, not just randomly, and can spread like wildfire. And defining particular memes is famously difficult, given the fluidity of cultural information. Still, memes can leave distinct footprints that help us track them, the footprints may be in the earth, styles of pottery that spread across early Europe, say, or the footprints may come in the form of words. When languages evolve over millennia from a single common source, linguists can reconstruct the vocabulary of that mother tongue by comparing its living descendants. For example, we know from studying languages in Europe and India that the ancient speakers of Proto-Indo-European had horses and harvested grain and mined metal. When a language family spreads across a large area, as Indo-European did, as the Polynesian languages did, it is tempting to look at the reconstructed Proto-language for keys to the culture's fertility. It is not surprising, for example, to find that Proto-Polynesian contained words for sail, paddle, cargo, and voyage. These cultural elements, these memes, no doubt helped move the larger Polynesian culture across the South Pacific and keep it robust. What else might have helped propel and sustain Polynesian culture? It turns out that Proto-Polynesian also contained words for mana and tapu. The details of the concepts have no doubt changed, and indeed came to differ from island to island. Still, 
the basic ideas proved robust over two millennia of manifest cultural fertility. Societies that survived the frequent warfare of Polynesian life were societies that took mana and tapu seriously. This robustness suggests that these concepts were doing more than burnish the vanity of chiefs and were not simply parasitic on the societies that hosted them. It suggests, you might say, that the memes and their host societies had a positive sum relationship. So does the fact that notions strikingly like mana and tapu have evolved separately in various cultures, ranging from the Tiv of Africa to the Iroquois of North America. Chiefs as Soul Savers There is a sense in which many Polynesians and many residents of other chiefdoms owed their very lives to the prevailing system of governance, complete with its religious underpinnings. People, remember, were not designed to live in close proximity to many other people. Homo sapiens evolved in small groups on sparsely settled land. When a hunter-gatherer band exceeds critical mass, tensions typically force a fission into two separate residential groups. The population density on Polynesian islands, and in mainland agrarian societies too, was in this sense well beyond a natural level. Such density wouldn't have been generally possible but for the coming of farming, and even then it wouldn't have been feasible but for a form of governance that subdued social frictions. One of the Polynesian chief's vital functions was heading off disputes between individuals, between clans, between villages. For example, amid droughts when people get edgy, he had to allocate scarce water in a manner perceived as equitable. The Hawaiian word for law means pertaining to water. Had the chief not possessed religious authority, he might not have been able to solve this non-zero-sum problem, or to wage peace more generally. A mere big man, who lacks formal, divinely sanctioned powers of office, and must cajole his followers into following, wouldn't have been up to the job. Thus the chiefdom form of government, whatever its brutalities, its inequalities, did have the saving grace of cramming more and more souls onto the planet. In addition to being good news for the souls in question, this was good news for social vibrance. The residential density of the chiefdom meant a big drop in the costs of transmitting information. An invisible brain could now have more tightly packed neurons, and more total neurons, than ever before. Cultural evolutionists customarily call farming an innovation in energy technology, in the way people obtain the fuel that keeps them alive. And it was. But given these lowered costs of communication in agrarian chiefdoms, it may make sense to think of farming as an advance in information technology as well. Indeed, farming may have ushered in the first true revolution in information technology. Among the functions of the chief was to harness this new technology. The economy he presided over was a more complex information processing system than the big man economy. Its signals, many of them sent by him, orchestrated a greater division of labor, the production of a greater array of goods, and the undertaking of more ambitious capital projects. But perhaps more important than what a large and thick invisible brain did for the daily workings of the economy was what it could do for the long-run evolution of culture, spawning new technologies, even new ideas about how to run a society. In the New World, it took little more than a millennium, sixty, eighty generations, to get from the first chiefdoms to the first state-level society. In China and the Middle East, the pace was comparable. Once political organization reached the multi-village level, once the age of chiefdoms dawned, great things were possible. Chapter 8 The Second Information Revolution 
Their function as a stamp of ownership on this item or that was mundane, but the best of them carry images of astonishing vivacity and refinement. An art critic's view of ancient cylinder seals. The oldest surviving written reference to King Solomon's temple is an inscription on a shard of clay from the 7th century B.C. What might the inscription be? Lines from a prayer? A paean to divinity? No, the inscription is a receipt. Someone donated three shekels of silver to the temple, and the gift was duly recorded. Writing has been an instrument for some of the highest expressions of the human spirit, poetry, philosophy, science. But to understand it, why it came into being, how it changed the human experience, we have to first appreciate its crass practicality. It evolved mainly as an instrument of the mundane, the economic, the administrative, the political. Confusion over this point is understandable. Some scholars have equated the origin of civilization with the origin of writing. Lay people sometimes take this equation to mean that with writing, humanity put aside its barbarous past and started behaving in gentlemanly fashion, sipping tea and remembering to say please. And indeed, this may be only a mild caricature of what some 19th century scholars actually meant by the equation writing equals Greece equals Plato, illiteracy equals barbarism equals Attila the Hun. But in truth, if you add literacy to Attila the Hun, you don't get Plato. You get Genghis Khan. During the 13th century, he administered what even today is the largest continuous land empire in the history of the world. And he could do so only because he had the requisite means of control, a script that, when carried by his Pony Express, amounted to the fastest, large-scale information processing technology of his era. One consequence was to give pillaging a scope beyond Attila's wildest dreams. Information technology, like energy technology or any other technology, can be a tool for good or bad. By itself, it is no guarantor of moral progress or civility. If there is even rough validity in equating writing with civilization, and there is, it lies along a different plane. Civilization, in a more technical sense of the word, is sometimes used to denote societies that have reached the state level of organization. And while writing doesn't guarantee statehood, it is a helpful ingredient. It opens up whole new realms of non-zero sumness and greatly lubricates the transition from chiefdom to state. Around the world, the evolution of state-level societies was intertwined with new ways to record and transmit information. The advance of cultures to the level of the state, to civilization in the technical sense of the word, did in some sense pave the way for civilization in the layperson's sense of the word, civilization as an arena for civilized behavior. With the state would come, for example, the rule of law, which mandated that citizens treat each other with some minimal respect and systematized the punishment for failing to do so. Indeed, one might argue that, as a general but not rigid rule, Writing has made life better in various ways, even eventually eroding the power of tyrants. And one might make similar arguments about other thresholds in data processing, such as the advent of the printing press and of the Internet. But first we must understand the evolution of writing, for the printing press and the Internet are in some ways extensions of this ancient revolution in data storage and transmission. Telling Fortunes Like most truly epic cultural innovations, farming, for example, writing appears to have arisen independently in several places. Scholars long insisted otherwise. Back in the 19th and early 20th centuries, Western historians, especially, 
took a monogenetic view of civilization's spread, insisting that Chinese and New World cultures were largely derivative. In the case of the New World especially, this claim took some ingenuity, but Eurocentric scholars were up to the task. A 19th-century French anthropologist, pondering remnants of Mayan writing, theorized that residents of the mythic continent of Atlantis, having abandoned their homeland before it sank, sailed to the New World, bringing literacy. Today there is no good evidence even for more sober scenarios of East-West contact that could explain American writing, which existed before the time of Christ, as an import from the Old World. And within the Old World, the origin of writing in China after 2000 BC was probably independent of its origin in the Near East around 3000 BC. The academic consensus is that writing arose at least three times independently. And, just as there are proto-agricultural and horticultural societies, illustrating agriculture in the process of evolving, there are examples of writing in mid-evolution. Easter Island featured a primitive and apparently indigenous script called Rongo Rongo, some scholars talk as if writing arose in the Near East, the New World, and China for very different purposes. The simplest version of the stereotypes runs something like this. The Sumerian script of the Near East was heavily economic in function. The Maya were more inclined to history, politics, and religion, including an elaborate astronomy-cum-astrology. The Chinese used their script to tell fortunes— but such generalizations turn out to rest largely on the assumption that in each culture the earliest known example of writing represents the earliest instance of it. Consider the claim, quite common until recently, that Chinese writing arose as a means of divination. It's true that the earliest Chinese examples of true writing are etchings on oracle bones made during the second millennium B.C., questions were engraved in the shoulder blades of sheep, cattle, or pigs. The bones, after being heated, yielded supposedly prophetic cracks, whose interpretation might be recorded as well. It should be Fu Hao whom the king orders to attack Jen. Or this gem of reassurance, in the next ten days there will be no disaster. But as scholars have begun to realize shoulder blades probably weren't the medium of choice for more casual jottings. The Chinese presumably wrote on less durable things, bamboo or silk or wood, that have since decomposed. Mesoamerica has the same problem. Surviving examples of early Mayan hieroglyphics come in durable media, monumental hunks of stone. But of course, Things that societies write on government edifices are not generally representative of things that societies write, as a stop at the Lincoln Memorial, followed by a glance at the New York Post, will attest. The Evolution of Writing Only in the Tigris-Euphrates River Valley, in the land now known as Iraq, is there much hard evidence about the earliest evolution of a script— there, the medium for early writing was not silk or bamboo, but soft clay that, once dried, preserves symbols long enough for archaeologists to find them. Clay tablets were so abundant that whole trash heaps of them have been found. So we can speculate with some confidence about the early evolution of what may have been the world's first true system of writing. Sumerian Cuneiform the sinew that bound what may have been the world's first civilization. The most widely accepted theory about the birth of Sumerian writing was developed by Pierre Amier and documented by Denise Schmont Besserat. It begins with little clay tokens that show up in the 8th millennium B.C. as agriculture is coming to the Fertile Crescent. The tokens stand for particular crops— a cone and a sphere, for example, represented grain in two standard quantities, the bon and the bariga, 
roughly a modern-day leader and bushel, respectively. The tokens seem to have been used for accounting, perhaps recording how much a particular family had given to the granary, or how much it owed. As cities were forming in the second half of the fourth millennium, there came more complex tokens, elaborately shaped and marked. Often they symbolized products of an urban economy, luxury goods such as perfume and metal, processed foods such as bread and beer. The shift from these three-dimensional symbols to two-dimensional, written symbols, illustrates just how plodding cultural evolution can seem when observed up close, on a timescale of decades rather than millennia. Sometimes records were kept by storing tokens in large clay envelopes about the size of a tennis ball. Five clay cones might be sealed inside an envelope to record a debt or payment of five bonds of grain. As a convenience, the tokens were pressed against the surface of the envelope before being enclosed. That way a person could read the contents of an envelope without having to break it open. Two circles and a wedge would mean the envelope contained two spheres and a cone. Apparently it was some time before a key insight dawned. The two-dimensional imprint on the outside of the envelope had rendered the three-dimensional contents superfluous. The envelopes could now become tablets. This was the beginning of Sumerian cuneiform. The system evolved for millennia, growing more abstract and powerful. Thus the tokens for a little grain and a lot of grain, the cone and sphere, became, in two-dimensional form, general numerical symbols. A wedge meant one, and a circle meant ten. These signs could now be placed next to the symbol for an object to indicate its quantity. Eventually, the symbols for objects and for people and actions and so on came to stand for sounds, steering Western civilization toward the modern phonetic alphabet. Some scholars find the link between tokens and cuneiform unconvincing, but even they agree that the earliest examples of Sumerian writing are economic, tabulations of livestock and food and goods, and most agree that such data helped orchestrate division of labor and public works. A farmer brings barley to the temple, the payment is duly recorded, and the barley goes to pay men who build a canal, a canal from which the farmer may in one sense or another benefit. For all we know, Chinese and Mesoamerican script received similarly strong early assistance from non-zero-sum logic. Certainly, in both cases, there were symbols for numbers by the time durable written records were being left. Still, the point here is not that written numerals universally preceded written words, or that the earliest writing was everywhere economic in function. The point is just that everywhere writing seems to have been a practical technology, figuring in economics or politics or both. Yes, there were historical narratives in China, the Near East, and Mesoamerica, but their function was largely to buttress the authority of the ruler, to establish his noble, perhaps divine lineage, to selectively preserve his feats of government and conquest, to convey the vastness of his empire, the deadness of his foes. Yes, the Maya recorded incredibly precise astronomical observations, but this was part of a religion that, like other state religions, helped keep the people obedient and harmoniously productive. Writing and Trust To say that writing transformed the potential for non-zero-sum interaction comes close to redundancy, for the link between information and non-zero-sumness is so basic that it's hard to imagine deep changes in the former that wouldn't deeply change the latter. Indeed, it is hardly an exaggeration to say that non-zero-sum dynamics are the reason information gets transmitted in the first place. As the pioneering game theorist Thomas Schelling has observed, 
in a purely zero-sum relationship, there is no rational reason to communicate. Opposing coaches have no cause to speak before a game. If you see them in extended conference, they're probably talking about some non-zero-sum realm, where their interests partly overlap. Both want to avoid injured players and may decide to reschedule a game in bad weather. But neither coach has an interest in honestly communicating anything about the game itself. As we'll see later in this book, Schelling's point is applicable to the origins of communication in the broadest sense of the term. Primordial communication, back before evolution had produced animals that talked, or for that matter, animals, period, happened because of what can aptly be called a non-zero-sum relationship between bits of genetic material, bits that, by virtue of sitting next to each other, were in the same boat, their fates tightly linked. But for now, let's stick with information in the familiar sense, words, numbers. By following the logic of game theory a bit further, we can see how new ways of storing and sending these symbols expanded and enriched the social fabric. Consider again the textbook non-zero-sum game, The Prisoner's Dilemma. Two partners in crime are being separately interrogated. Each will be better off if neither rats on the other than if both do. But... Though cooperation is in their mutual interest, there are two great barriers to it. One is a lack of communication. You can't agree on a joint strategy if there's a wall between you and your accomplice. And if you overcome this barrier, you face a second one, lack of trust. If you think your accomplice is going to renege on the deal and rat on you after all, then you're better off copping a plea and ratting on him. Somehow, this fear of being cheated must be overcome for things to work out well. If, indeed, barriers to information are one of the two basic impediments to non-zero-sum gain, then obviously new information technologies might unlock some positive sums. Yet the more dramatic effect of writing may have been to overcome the second barrier, the trust barrier. In ancient Mesopotamia, a lender didn't have to fear that the borrower would deny all recollection of the loan, and the borrower didn't have to fear that the lender would exaggerate it. There was an attested record, such as one from Babylon noting that a man had borrowed ten shekels of silver from the priestess Amat Shamash. The man will pay the sun god's interest. At the time of the harvest, he will pay back the sum and the interest upon it. If you doubt the value of such peace of mind, consider how hard people in non-literate societies work to etch financial obligations in the public memory. The ostentatious potlatch seems less absurd when viewed as a way to assemble a large audience to witness the incurring of a large debt. And, on a smaller scale, when one family of Northwest Coast Indians would give food to a needier family, public ritual was de rigueur. Writing was hardly the only thing in the ancient states of Asia, the Middle East, and Mesoamerica that helped solve the trust problem. Another was the systematization of justice, the assurance that cheaters will be punished. But even here, writing helps. Legal codes carry more precision and heft when etched in something solid. The code of the Mesopotamian city of Eshnunna, written a century before the more famous code of Hammurabi, left no doubt what would happen if you paid a man a shekel to harvest your field and he never got around to it. He would pay you ten shekels. Ten shekels, by the way, was also the punishment for punching a man in the face. If you went further and severed his nose by biting it, that would cost you one full mina, sixty shekels of silver. Severed fingers were cheaper, two-thirds of a mina each. These laws, though not governing economic behavior, still served productivity. They made urban living, with all its potential efficiencies, 
including the data processing efficiencies of dense population, tranquil enough to bear. The informal justice system of a chiefdom just wouldn't do now that daily life involved so many close encounters with people who were neither relatives nor acquaintances. So the government had to build a new anti-cheating technology, a new technology of trust. Trust not just in economic justice, but in the larger social contract, the mutual non-aggression pact that by relieving people of fear and suspicion, smooths all kinds of cooperative efforts. This is one sense in which civilization, in the technical sense, a state-level polity, typically featuring writing, often leads to civilization in the non-technical sense, walking around without fear of getting your nose bitten off. Still, this comfortable civility has so often accompanied writing not because literacy soothes the savage soul, but for earthier reasons. Societies that fail to use writing to solve various dimensions of the trust problem, that fail to create space for non-zero sumness, typically fall, often at the hands of societies that better harness writing's potential. In the long run, ancient states had no more choice about whether to adopt new information technologies than they had about whether to adopt chariots, bronze shields, or iron swords. In all such cases, you use it or lose. Bureaucratic Brains The justice system was only one part of the bureaucracy that emerged in ancient states and that is one of the hallmarks of a state. Bureaucracy has since gotten such a bad reputation that one of its dictionary definitions is administration characterized by excessive red tape and routine. But technically, bureaucracy is just government by distinct functional units, each run by a specialist, division of labor in the processing of information. So it's no surprise that new information technologies usually played a role. In Mesopotamia, for example, bureaucrats had ornate cylindrical seals that, impressed on a clay tablet, served as a majestic signature and carried official weight, shoring up trust in loans and other transactions. And then there were the tablets themselves. Today, a big hunk of clay seems like a non-optimal way to store data. But in its day, this information technology revolutionized the large-scale coordination of matter and energy. In a single year of the Ur III dynasty, around 2000 BC, bureaucratic tablets recorded the processing of 350,000 sheep, brought in by taxation and other means, and used for, among other things, paying the salaries of government workers, including bureaucrats, no doubt. Government laborers were also paid in bread, fish, oil, all such disbursements precisely registered, as were the hours spent earning them by, for example, digging canals. And when the work was done, the government, like governments today, took conspicuous credit. In the Babylon of Hammurabi's day, one canal was named Hammurabi is the Prosperity of the People. Your tax dollars at work. All of this bureaucratic accounting required standard units of measurement, a kind of information technology in their own right. One of the most widely found artifacts in the early Near East is the bevel rim bowl, which is thought to have been a measure for foods paid to workers. It shows up in Mesopotamia in the 4th millennium B.C., as do cylindrical seals, writing, and city-states. Ancient city-states had common interests, goods they could trade, mutual enemies they could jointly annihilate. But to reap the fruits of this non-zero sumness, they needed first to breach the information barrier, and back when the fastest mode of transport was the donkey, frequent conferences among kings weren't feasible. Couriers, on the other hand, were a dime a dozen, and with the advent of writing, they could carry long, precise messages. What's more, 
These missives served as hard evidence of deals forged and promises made. They thus made a dent in the trust barrier, and in doing so they spared no rhetorical expense. An ancient peace treaty reads, He who shall not observe all these words written upon this silver tablet of the land of the Hatti and of the land of Egypt, may the thousand gods of the land of the Hatti and the thousand gods of the land of Egypt destroy his house, his country, and his servants. Of course, the trust barrier is a stubborn thing. A certain wariness inevitably remains between people who have had few face-to-face -face encounters. One time-honored wariness reducer, going back to the days of the chiefdom, was to use the bonds of kinship. Potentates sealed alliances with intermarriage of daughters or sons. Yet another approach, going back to the days of the big man, was to use the vocabulary of kinship, along with lavish professions of devotion. During the third millennium B.C., the king of Ebla in the Middle East wrote to the king of Hamazi, You are my brother, and I am your brother, fellow man. Whatever desire comes from your mouth, I will grant, just as you will grant the desire that comes from my mouth. Kingly relations were sometimes lubricated with gifts, so expensive that they amounted to de facto trade, reciprocal exchange of the exotic goods in which each kingdom specialized. This economic ingredient was alluded to by a Babylonian king who wrote, Between kings there is brotherhood, friendship, alliance, and good relations, if there is an abundance of silver and an abundance of gold. This sort of cynicism needn't cause despair. Another way of making much the same point is to say that where non-zero-sum logic leads, amity often follows. Given the power of non-zero-sum logic, this would seem to bode well for the long-run expansion of amity. Piles of Corpses a more legitimate cause for despair is that this amity is often enlisted in the cause of enmity. The point of alliance was often to get aid during war, or at least to ensure the neutrality of a potential meddler. The royal archives of Ebla, so replete with those professions of brotherhood, are also replete with a phrase recorded by the king again and again apparently with pride, piles of corpses I raised. If a city-state succeeded in dominating another by conquest or threat of conquest, and thus formed an empire, then communications technology was of course vital. The Ur III dynasty built a donkey express, roads with stations housing messengers. Other civilizations had their rough equivalents, such as Aztec relay runners with messages tucked into the forked ends of batons. Analogies between societies and organisms go back to the beginnings of cultural evolutionism. A state bureaucracy is a bit like a brain, and Aztec runners, sending commands to military outposts or distant farmers, are a bit like nerve impulses. That these analogies are easy doesn't mean they're worthless— just as you can't imagine an organism as complex as a human being lacking vast data storage and fast data processing and transmission, it's hard to imagine a state-level society without a significant information technology. Scholars sometimes speak of non-literate civilizations, the Inca in South America or such West African states as the Ashanti of the early 17th century or the Dahomey of the 18th and 19th centuries. But on close inspection, such societies seem always to have some good information technology. They may not be able to record their poems, but they can handle more vital data, such as numbers, just fine. The Dahomey, for example, took a census to aid taxation and military mobilization. Their database consisted of a room full of boxes containing pebbles that signified the number of men and women, boys and girls, in each village. Updating was continuous via the registering of every birth and death 
including the cause of death, throughout the land. For similar purposes, the Inca used the quipu, the variously knotted and colored strings that only specialists understood. Today they are understood by no one, but the best guess is that they recorded not just numbers, but historical events. Much of the Inca nervous system consisted of roads, or at least footpaths, that snaked through and around the Andes, sometimes across suspension bridges. The roads were long enough, all told, to just about encompass the world. Runners were stationed one to five miles apart, the flatter the stretch, the longer the gap, and might hand off either quipus or oral messages ritually repeated during the handoff to suppress error. Data could travel 150 miles a day. But that's nothing compared to the Ashanti, who sent data hundreds of miles in a few minutes with a network of talking drums that could summon political leaders, warn of danger, mobilize the military, announce deaths, or, on a less urgent note, broadcast proverbs. Differences in tone had meaning, as in the Ashanti language itself. This book has made little use of such familiar phrases as the Stone Age and the Bronze Age. The reason, clearly, is not an aversion to technological determinism, but rather a belief that metallurgy makes for a bad version of it. The Maya, the Aztecs, and the Inca were basically Stone Age people. What metal they had was used mainly for jewelry and the like, not swords or shields. Yet they had much more in common with Egypt or China in the Bronze Age than with, say, the Stone Age Shoshone of their own hemisphere. A more useful technological dividing line between the Shoshone, on the one hand, and state-level societies, on the other, comes from energy and information technologies. All state-level societies farmed and all had relatively sophisticated means of handling data. Even with energy and information technologies, the word determinism is a bit much. A lot more goes into a state-level society than farming and processing data. For that matter, the term state-level society is itself misleading in its seeming firmness. It's true that the core criteria of statehood including centralized, somewhat bureaucratic government, the power to draft an army, a monopoly on the legitimate use of force, regular taxation, often in the form of labor or goods, tend to be found in clusters. But they don't show up simultaneously, or always in the same order. Hence ongoing arguments about borderline cases. Did Hawaii, after European contact, cross the threshold between chiefdom and state? Still, such fuzziness notwithstanding, some things are clear. Social complexity tends to grow beyond the level of the chiefdom toward the level of the state, and intimately involved in the growth is information technology. Advances in the storage and transmission of data and in the processing of data, including the invention of bureaucracy. By happenstance, we have a fairly clear view of this process in only one part of the world, Mesopotamia. And there, growth in the complexity of society precisely mirrors growth in the complexity of the symbol system. As the social structure becomes more elaborate, so do the tokens, because the symbols and the structure feed off one another. One man's NZS is another man's ZS. To say that writing eroded the two big barriers to non-zero sumness isn't to say that writing turned society into a cornucopia of mutual benefit. Indeed, according to one common academic stereotype, Ancient states carried repression and exploitation to new heights, making chiefdoms look populist by comparison. Workers toiled away so that elites, having precisely recorded the toil, could precisely underpay them. How can we reconcile this scenario with my paean to the benefits of writing? 
where's the win-win dynamic? To begin with, the dynamic exists among elites. When Mesopotamia Big Shots traded wool cloth to Big Shots in other lands for the wood and stone needed for Mesopotamian construction, Big Shots on both ends of the deal benefited. To be sure, the Mesopotamian women who spun the wool into yarn, their output and wages tallied on clay tablets, may have benefited as well. After all, the ability to market yarn internationally raised its value some of which could, in theory, trickle down to the spinners. And presumably, the spinners benefited from various forms of bureaucratically realized non-zero-sumness, the diversity of available foods and crafts, the irrigation canals and other capital projects. Still, it doesn't take extreme cynicism to imagine that in general, elites skimmed more than a bit off the top. Tablets from a state brewery in Mesopotamia show one administrator walking off with 35 jars of beer. I'm suspicious. That the benefits of ancient writing may have clustered near the top of the social pyramid shouldn't surprise us. Power from new technologies tends to accrue to the people who wield them. Ancient wielders of the written word became gatekeepers of the wealth it unlocked. The fewer the gatekeepers, the more power they had. Ancient Mesopotamia had an estimated literacy rate of less than 1%. It's hard to say whether this reflected an attempt by elites to monopolize the technology, but in any event, scribes were a small and esteemed class, complete with an official deity, aptly the goddess of fertility. Entry to the class via lengthy instruction at the tablet house, was granted mainly to the privileged. A Sumerian text describes a rich man giving his son's writing teacher food, a robe, and a ring to ensure a passing grade, in spite of his son's indiscipline. Many scribes were mere transcribers and didn't themselves call the shots. Still, they seem to have reveled in the power emanating from their art. Some Egyptian scribes opined that the lower classes, lacking in brains, had to be driven like cattle. Actually, what the lower classes lacked was their own personal scribe. It isn't just economic power that information technology confers. Concerted political organization, to resist oppression, to lobby for lower taxes, whatever— is a form of non-zero-sum interaction among people who share an interest. As such, it calls for communication. African slaves in America would later demonstrate this fact by organizing slave revolts via talking drum, and writing, of course, would come to play a role in revolt as well. During the U.S. Civil War, most southern states made it illegal to teach slaves to read and write. But in the ancient states, with literacy rare, we find only glimmers of its future subversive use. A piece of graffiti from Egypt in the third millennium B.C. reads, You arrested me and beat my father. Who are you now to steal from me? Some scholars, comparing ancient states to chiefdoms, have argued that writing led to concentrations of wealth and power. But strictly speaking, what they mean is that the concentration of writing abilities led to a concentration of power. The question of how far economic and political power would eventually spread beyond the upper classes was partly a question about the future of literacy. How strong were the forces favoring its expansion? This is a question to which we'll return. Here's a clue. Strong. Meanwhile, even as elites held their monopoly on information technology, there was still some limit on feasible exploitation, including the constraints we saw at work in chiefdoms. In addition to facing revolt, leaders face other polities, and both forms of pressure punish highly parasitic regimes. Writing isn't the only elemental information technology that evolved in ancient states— Money, a standardized currency, 
is an information technology. It is a kind of record of your past labors, of their value as judged by society. And when you spend the money, it becomes a kind of signal, confirming your wants and conveying them, however obliquely, to the various people involved in satisfying them. Passing from hand to hand to hand, money flows through the nervous system of the larger invisible hand, informing suppliers of demand. In modern times, much kvetching has been done about money. Some consider it a tool for oppressing the downtrodden. But in historical perspective, money looks more like a solvent of oppression. By invigorating market economies, it offered an alternative to a command economy dominated by the literate few. If an economic information technology is going to be wielded on your behalf, it's usually best to do the wielding yourself. Money in truly convenient form, coins, portable and widely respected, didn't show up until the 7th century B.C., courtesy of the Lydians. If you don't think coins were a major advance, consider Homer's description centuries earlier of the value of Glaucus's armor. It was worth a hundred oxen compared to nine oxen for Diomedes's shoddy stuff. Imagine the armor store during the holiday shopping season. Actually, even before coins, ancient states were moving toward de facto, if still inconvenient, currencies. Barley or weighed-out silver was used in Mesopotamia, wheat in Egypt, cocoa beans by the Aztecs. And when these were lacking, simple barter was always an option. Indeed, the old idea that ancient states were pre-market is now dead. They had mixed economies, if often with a strong bias toward the government part of the mix. In Mesopotamia, private merchants conducted distant trade, a fact that probably worked to the ultimate advantage of commoners. Political power, too, now seems to have been dispersed more widely in Mesopotamia than the stereotype of the totalitarian ancient state would have it. Still, by today's standards, there was room for progress. And progress there would be. Slavery, human sacrifice, and milder forms of exploitation would diminish over time. Today, civilization is more civilized, in the everyday, non-technical sense of the word, than the ancient civilizations. And a primary reason is the way money and writing would over time evolve and, as we'll see, interact. Chapter 9 Civilization and So On Whenever rulers and military classes tolerated merchants and refrained from taxing them so heavily or robbing them so often as to inhibit trade and commerce, new potentialities of economic production arising from regional specialization and economies of scale in manufacture could begin to show their capacity to increase human wealth. William McNeil There's an old joke about the standard instructions on American shampoo containers, lather, rinse, repeat. A man takes the directions literally and spends the rest of his life in the shower, lathering, rinsing, lathering, rinsing, lathering, rinsing. Sometimes it seems as if ancient civilization followed similar instructions, rise, fall, repeat. The rulers and dynasties and peoples may change, but all seem locked into that same endless cycle of conquest and expansion, fragmentation and collapse. Ancient history thus seems like little more than a parade of strange-sounding names. There's Uruk, not to be confused with Ur, or Ur the Second, or Ur the Third. There are Akkadians, not to mention Achaemenids. Eventually the Minoans and Mycenaeans arrive, or is it the other way around? And then finally come the really familiar names, Greece and Rome. Meanwhile, in China, there is conflict among the Qi, the Qin, the Qin, 
and the chu, this during the late shu. Finally, the Qin win and consolidate China, then quickly fall apart. Over in the New World, civilization begins to stir long before the famous classic Mayan period. There are Olmec and Zapotec, and by the time the Inca and Aztecs occupy center stage, we've also seen Huastec, Mistec, and Toltec, not to mention Chimu and Chincha and Chichimec. It all seems a blur. But really, the problem is that it is not blurry enough. The reason that ancient history seems chaotic is that we are using a zoom lens, focusing on small regions and small time frames. If we relax our vision and let these details go fuzzy, then a larger picture comes into focus. As the centuries fly by, civilizations may come and go, but civilization flourishes growing in scope and complexity. The key is to take the history out of ancient history. Historians tend to dwell on differences. How was ancient China different from Sumer? Why was it different? Good questions, interesting questions, questions we'll get back to. But first, let's ask, how were early states in the various regions where they evolved alike? This is one way to simplify ancient history by realizing that, fundamentally, the same thing was happening everywhere you look. Three Petri Dishes Archaeologists speak of six pristine civilizations, states that arose indigenously and weren't merely copied from a nearby civilization or imposed on the populace by conquest. The standard six are Mesopotamia, Egypt, Mesoamerica, South America, China, and the civilization of the Indus River Valley, about which relatively little is known in South Asia. Some scholars throw in West Africa as well. Calling West African civilization pristine is something of an exaggeration, given earlier contact with states to the north. Then again, calling some of the standard six pristine states pristine is a bit of a stretch. Indus script, still undeciphered, may have been inspired by Mesopotamia, which was exchanging memes with Egypt as well, and some diffusion, however thin, probably linked South America, the Inca and their cultural ancestors, and Mesoamerica, Aztecs, Maya, and others. Still, even after granting these early and occasionally momentous contacts, we are left with three large realms of ancient civilization quite removed from each other, China, the Near East, and the New World. The scholarly consensus is that each developed its energy and information technologies, farming and writing, indigenously, and each then underwent its early civilizational history in essential isolation from the others. Yet, in all three cases, the same thing happened, namely, more of the same. The trend that had gotten humanity to the verge of civilization, bands getting big enough to qualify as villages, which then got bigger and more complex and combined to form chiefdoms, continued. The chiefdoms' villages evolved into something more like towns, which themselves then got bigger and more complex. In all three regions, loosely defined city-states, urban cores surrounded by farmlands and villages and towns, seem to have evolved, though in some places, such as Egypt and the Andes, the city part of the state may have been so small as to stretch the definition of the term. And these city-states merged, forming multi-city-states, and these multi-city states grew into empires. Sure, there were setbacks aplenty, droughts, barbarian hordes, and other catalysts of epic collapse, but in the long run the setbacks proved temporary. Indeed, the setbacks attest to ongoing progress. Their increasing vastness charts the growing magnitude of the systems that are being set back. So there you have it, ancient history in a nutshell— onward and upward, to higher levels of social complexity. 
Paragraphs such as the previous one, asserting simple patterns in history and suggesting that they reflect general laws, are a fat target for criticism. They seem, as one philosopher of history has put it, to derive a linear law from the alleged trend of the historical process as a whole. And since the process is unique, this looks, at best, like generalizing from a single case. But in ancient history, at least, the process is not unique. There are at least three separate cases to study, and four if you assume, as many do, minimal early contact between Mesoamerica and the Andes. Granted, if we're going to call the patterns that these cases separately evince laws, we should explore the mechanics of the laws and show why they are powerful. We've already done some of that, and we'll do more. But in the meantime, let's at least establish that in the several cases available for study, the basic pattern, deeper and vaster social complexity, more and more non-zero sumness, indeed holds. One Cradle of Civilization In high school textbooks, Mesopotamia, the land of the Tigris-Euphrates River Valley in modern Iraq, is called the Cradle of Civilization. Ancient rulers from China and the Americas could be excused for rolling over in their well-appointed graves on hearing such Eurocentric propaganda. Their civilizations had their own cradles, domestically manufactured, thank you. Still, we have to start somewhere, and Near Eastern civilization did precede the other two civilizations. In the Mesopotamian vicinity, the story of civilization begins, as elsewhere, with farming and attendant social complexity. By 4000 BC, there are the familiar hallmarks of chiefdoms, temples, other capital projects, irrigation systems, and what appears to be a granary. And, of course, special burials for big shots, complete with precious copper and ceramic knickknacks. The chiefdom's villages get bigger and bigger, and at some point cross that blurry line between villages and towns. Around 3500 BC, though true writing had yet to appear, the stirrings of the first information revolution were evident. The cylinder seal, complex tokens, the bevel-rimmed bowl. As writing evolved, growth toward civilization was brisk, in southern Mesopotamia, between 3,500 B.C. and 2,900 B.C., the number of villages grew from 17 to 124, the number of towns from 3 to 20, the number of urban centers, 125 acres, 50 hectares or larger, grew from 1 to 20. By 2,800 B.C., the city of Uruk, covered 617 acres, 250 hectares, and its temples, mounted on massive ziggurats, were visible from miles away. Surrounded by and interdependent with farming villages and towns, Uruk came to anchor an amorphous city-state. Comparable clusters evolved elsewhere in Mesopotamia. Relations among city-states featured that double-barreled source of non-zero sumness, Kant's unsocial sociability. Polities traded and fought, traded and fought, and the result was, as usual, a strong argument for political unification. The logic isn't merely that a two-city state is stronger than its one-city enemy by virtue of size— the strength derives also from the fact that trade between its two cities can now proceed without the disruption of periodic warfare and untrammeled marauding, and without the burden of mistrust. The basic idea, creating large zones for the free play of non-zero sumness, is akin to Elman Service's notion of waging peace. But peace was often not waged peacefully, Though municipal rulers might agree on the virtues of a multi-city megastate, they rarely agreed on who the mega-ruler should be. Like chiefdoms, multi-city megastates tended to get formed with the help of aggression, or at least the threat of it. The first large multi-city state in Mesopotamia was the Akkadian Empire, 
formed around 2350 BC, when Sargon of Akkada conquered Sumerian cities in southern Mesopotamia. Sargon's conquests came with a divine seal of approval. Having toppled a city, he asked local priests to declare his victory the will of the Mesopotamian god Enlil. Perhaps to facilitate clear thinking on their part, he exhibited the vanquished local king in neck stock. As a further aid to theological interpretation, Sargon installed his daughter as high priestess of the goddess Nana at Ur, the religious capital of southern Mesopotamia. Having subdued much of the population in and around the Tigris-Euphrates Valley, Sargon declared himself, a bit provincially, king of the four quarters of the world. Meanwhile, Egypt, though slower than Mesopotamia to develop cities, and never as vastly urban as Mesopotamia, moved more quickly and more enduringly toward regional statehood. The threshold was crossed not long after the Information Revolution arrived. By 3100 BC, Egyptian hieroglyphics were in use, recording ancestral lineages and property ownership. By 3000 BC, give or take a century, Egypt was politically unified and was evincing the generic human combination of lucrative trade, warm alliance, and devastating enmity. Egyptian pharaohs had high self-regard, even by the lofty standards of ancient rulers. On an unusually consistent basis, they convinced the populace not just that they represented the will of the gods, but that they were gods, direct offspring of the sun god Ra. The attendant subservience may partly explain the stunning embodiments of state power, the pyramids, which soaked up unimaginable labor so that pharaohs could have nice roomy tombs and spend the afterlife surrounded by shiny artifacts in garage sale quantities. Divinity aside, the pharaohs relied heavily on a vast bureaucracy whose detailed workings are obscure, but which certainly didn't suffer from a shortage of titles. Overseer of granaries, overseer of works, overseer of the treasuries, overseer of the scribes of the great records, overseer of the great mansions, the courts, and so on. Another Cradle of Civilization In East Asia, farming seems to have evolved a millennium or so later than in the Middle East, but its consequences followed just as surely— Bigger villages, more artifacts, more trade, vaster conflict, bigger buildings, bigger realms of political control, starker status hierarchies, jade and bronze being favored upper-class grave accoutrement. An age of chiefdoms seems to have been reached by the late 4th millennium B.C., and in the 2nd millennium B.C. came testaments to state-level organization, writing, cities, a king who could lead 13,000 men into battle and oversee epic engineering, the fortifications surrounding one urban compound of temples and palaces would have taken 10,000 workers 18 years to build, assuming a one-day weekend and no paid vacations. Royal graves were roomy, 30, 40 feet deep, with terracing and easy-access ramps, Kings were buried with slaves and human sacrifices, sometimes neatly decapitated, and lots of wealth. Even one king's consort, though consigned to a modest grave, was surrounded with 468 bronze items, 775 jades, and 6,880 lovely cowrie shells. All of this belongs to what is known as the Shang Civilization, but the suggestion of homogeneity may be misleading. Some scholars now dissent from the long-accepted Chinese view of a unified national past, and envision the Shang as much like early Mesopotamia, individual, perhaps amorphous city-states that trade and battle, ally and fall out. There is even some question as to whether the Shang had quite reached the state level of social organization— or was more like a precocious chiefdom? Who knows? The main point is that the story in China moves in the same direction as the stories elsewhere. The Shang's successor, the Shu, 
who dominated the first millennium B.C., forged a vast state with many cities. But control was diffuse, and Shu principalities, Qi, Qin, Qin, Chu, and others, finally fell into open warfare. The Qin eventually prevailed, carrying Asian political unity to unprecedented scope, hence the name China. One key to the Qin triumph had been non-zero-sum reforms. The Qin made the law firmer and fairer, less partial to the powerful. They standardized weights and measures and the writing system. Having conquered their rivals, they extended these principles across China. The nation was further bound by a single currency, lots of canals and 4,000 miles worth of new roads, traveled by carts whose wheels were of standard, government-mandated gauge, so the ruts worn into dirt roads would be one size fits all. Shi Huang Ti, who oversaw this unification of China and is thus known as the nation's first emperor, was by many accounts a nasty and parasitic man. He feared dissent and reputedly burned texts that ventured beyond such kosher subjects as agricultural technique and divination. His idea of a valuable use of government workers was the crafting of 7,500 life-sized terracotta warriors, each unique, to accompany him to the grave. His caprice and oppression no doubt encouraged the rebellion that followed his death. Still, his infrastructure for non-zero sumness, all the roads and canals, and the various standards that smoothed the movement of people and goods and data, endured. This legacy would ease the still onerous task of his successors, the Han, as they struggled to keep China politically whole. Meanwhile, back in the Near East, more names had come and gone, and the regions they represented had continued to get bigger and bigger, if fitfully. The Assyrian Empire dwarfed the Akkadian, the one that had covered the four quarters of the world, and was in turn dwarfed by the Persian Empire and its king of this great earth far and wide, which was then overcome by Alexander the Great, the son of God and general governor and reconciler of the world, whose Macedonian Empire would soon be overshadowed by the Roman Empire, its emperor being the savior of all mankind. American Civilization if in 200 B.C. the Han or the Romans had magically gotten a peek at life in the undiscovered New World, they would have been unimpressed. A casual glance across the Americas would have suggested a hemisphere full of savages and barbarians. Almost everywhere, social structure fell somewhere on the spectrum from simple band to chiefdom. But here and there, visible on close inspection, were cradles of civilization, small pockets where culture was crossing the hazy line between chiefdom and state. As the archaeologists C. C. Lamberg Karlovsky and Jeremy Sabloff have noted, the first known city in Mesoamerica, Monte Alban, in southernmost Mexico, not far from Guatemala, is reminiscent of the first big city in Mesopotamia, Uruk. In both cases, the city-to-be was at first a mere town, outshining its neighbors in size and architecture and dominating them politically, in the classic fashion of a chiefdom's hub. In both cases, war and trade helped drive complexity upward, and in both cases, information technology and urbanization proceeded hand in hand. In Monte Alban, by 300 B.C., there were calendrical notations and glyphs used to label sculptures of dead enemies. By 200 B.C., the population had grown to 5,000, and it would eventually surpass 30,000. But Monte Alban was destined to be outclassed by Teotihuacan, a trading partner to the north that by A.D. 550, with 125,000 residents, would be one of the six largest cities in the world, unbeknownst to the other five. Teotihuacan is not to be confused with the nearby city of Tenochtitlan, 
the Aztec capital that, when seen by Cortes in 1519, housed around 200,000 people, more than any European city, and anchored a state twice the size of Portugal. Cortes called Tenochtitlan the most beautiful city in the world and compared it to Venice. Built on islands in a saltwater lake, it was laced with canals and bridges and adorned with floating gardens, a zoo, and an aviary. The city's waterborne commerce involved tens of thousands of canoes, and its central marketplace, according to Cortes, could accommodate 60,000 buyers and sellers. Of course, the Aztecs had their unpleasant side. Just ask any of the captives, hundreds each month, who shortly before being rolled down the temple steps would have their hearts torn out so the sun would not lack nourishment. At the main temple in Tenochtitlan, one of Cortez's men counted, or at least estimated, 136,000 skulls. Then again, human sacrifice was not uncommon in ancient civilizations, New World or Old. Even classical Greece, that acme of early enlightenment, seems to have indulged. And Aztec government was in other ways progressive. The commoners were well off by ancient standards, able to swap homemade wares for exotic imports. In simple adobe homes in the provinces, archaeologists have found obsidian knives, jade jewelry, bronze bells. One reason for this affluence is that the government did a good job of breaching the trust barrier that can impede exchange. Inspectors prowled the urban markets in search of unscrupulous commerce, ranging from false measurement to passing counterfeits, wax or dough, of the cocoa bean quasi-currency. Aztec law, more than most ancient legal codes, seems to have treated rich and poor alike. Judges were sometimes punished, hanged in one case, for favoring nobles at the expense of commoners. Torture wasn't used to induce confession, a fact that, one scholar has opined, makes the Indians appear in a better light than their European conquerors. Aztec is what most people think of if they think of pre-Columbian Mesoamerica at all, a shining gem in the desert, a miraculous exception to the primitive norm of American Indian life. But Aztec civilization wasn't really so special— just the next step in a millennia-old regional ascent whose other rungs included Teotihuacan, the Zapotec of Monte Alban, and many others, such as Toltec, Mixtec, and Huastec. And these, in turn, all had their antecedents. The Maya, though not at first densely urban, had reached statehood around the 3rd century B.C., a bit before the Zapotec did the same, and earlier, there were the Olmec, with their mammoth-sculpted Easter Island-esque heads, and a society complex enough that their academic champions have occasionally suggested a promotion from chiefdom to state. I could go on, naming more and more obscure Mesoamerican cultures, in a procession stretching all the way from the Aztecs back to the origins of Mesoamerican agriculture. I could also try to make a neat picture of this process— drawing textbook lineages of cultural descent. The Aztecs were heirs of the Toltec, who were heirs of Teotihuacan, and so on. But such charts mislead. From the days of the Olmec and early Maya, back in 1200 BC, cultural influence was subtle and profuse, and with time it got only more so, as Mesoamerica's population grew denser and cultural contact, via trade and war, expanded. The whole region came more and more to resemble a single social brain, testing memes and spreading the useful ones. True, distinct polities and peoples rose and fell ad nauseum, but these seemingly pointless cycles of growth and decay added up to a larger arrow of cultural evolution— the arts of writing and agriculture and handicraft and construction and government advanced. The Aztecs, like the Romans, were administrative and engineering whizzes. They had their well-oiled bureaucracy, their bridges and their aqueducts. 
With the sluice gates on their ten-mile dam, they controlled the level of the lake surrounding Tenochtitlan. But the Aztecs weren't exceptional people, and neither were the Romans. Both were just like the people who had come before them, human beings muddling through, incrementally adding to their cultural inheritance. So too with the Inca, down in South America. In the popular mind, they get credit for the vast road network that smoothly moved goods and data, binding a 16th-century empire of 12 million people. But many of the roads were built by their predecessors. Construction had started by 500 B.C. under the Chavin, and the infrastructure was expanded by such societies as the coastal Moche, who reached statehood around A.D. 100. Moche roads, like Inca roads, were traveled by relay runners, who, some scholars believe, conveyed data not just orally, but by symbols etched on lima beans. And, like Inca roads, and Roman roads, and Chinese roads, and other ancient roads, the Moche roads were used to coordinate both military and economic activities. Hence, a twofer, there were enough prisoners of war to keep Moche warrior priests busy with ritual throat slittings, and then, when it came time to drink the blood, there were finely wrought metal goblets ordered just for the occasion. Under various cultures, the states of Chimu and Wari, for example, the web of South American roads continued to grow, as did irrigation works, after this infrastructure had been laboriously expanded by millions of laborers over a couple of millennia, the Inca came along and said, Why, thank you. Conquering chieftains here, states there, they carried South American political unity to unprecedented extent, and by deft bureaucratic governance, they held it more or less together. As proud as Sargon and no more worldly, they called their empire Tahuan Tinsuyu, or Four Quarters of the World. The new scope of political organization, by subduing the frictions of war, brought new productivity, rather as the Pax Romana had in the Old World. Both Mesoamerica and the Andes illustrate how much you can do with limited materials. Bronze metallurgy was nascent, scarcely applied to weapons and tools. There were no chariots or wagons. Indeed, there were no wheels and no horses. Nature seems to have blessed the new world with few readily domesticable animals. But regardless of natural endowment, there are always means of storing and transmitting data, and thus the means to run a bureaucracy and control a big army. Such is the power of data processing that advances on this front can almost single-handedly carry cultures over the threshold of statehood, notwithstanding stagnation in other realms. And so great is the power of cultural evolution that such stagnation doesn't last forever. In Mesoamerica, by Aztec times, the principle of the wheel was understood— but in the absence of draft animals, was applied only to toys, such as red clay rolling animals. Meanwhile, down in South America, the llama had been domesticated and was used as a pack animal. If Europeans hadn't intervened, cultural diffusion almost surely would have brought the wheel south or the llama north, and people would have put two and two together. Century by century, America's two biggest social brains were getting bigger and heading toward merger. Indeed, there is grim evidence that filaments had begun to link north and south. The smallpox the Europeans brought to Mesoamerica reached the Andes by land, apparently killing one Inca king shortly before Pizarro arrived by sea to kill another. With the arrival of Pizarro and Cortez and other conquistadors, the long American experiment in autonomous social evolution was over. In the old world, by contrast, the natural expansion of early civilizations and their ultimate interconnection had not been short-circuited by murderous aliens. By the first century A.D., the process had reached a culmination of sorts. 
the tendencies that had carried China and Rome to their glory, growth in the degree and scope of social complexity, had been at work in the lands between them. Just to the east of the Roman Empire was the Parthian Empire, around modern-day Iran and Iraq. East of Parthia was the Kushan Empire, from modern-day Afghanistan through northern India, and to its east was the western extremity of China under the Han. Eurasia was now wall-to-wall -wall empires. In the terminology of the historian William McNeil, the Eurasian ecumeny had been closed. One could travel from the Atlantic to the Pacific one-third of the way around the world while passing through only four polities, and commerce did so along the Silk Road. Commerce was of growing importance, not just among states, but within them. Rulers increasingly found that trying to minutely control the creation of wealth was not the way to maximize it. By the first century A.D., McNeil observes, military and political power had come to depend heavily on materials and services supplied to the rulers by merchants who responded to pecuniary and market motives more readily and more efficiently than to bureaucratic command. Slowly and fitfully, the basic chiefdom model of top-down, state-controlled economics which seems to have lingered into the early phase of ancient civilization, was ceding ground to the logic of the market. What caused the shift? One good candidate is the growing practicality of decentralized data processing. A phonetic alphabet, much more user-friendly than the old ideographic scripts, evolved in the Near East during the second millennium B.C. and was transmitted widely, in part by the traders who used it. Then, during the first millennium B.C., coined money emerged and spread via the same conduit. These developments jibe nicely with McNeil's observation that the tendency of markets to outproduce command economies was beginning to be discovered in the second millennium B.C. and became normal and expected in the course of the next millennium. The belt of commerce across Eurasia didn't create deep interdependence. The Silk Road, as the name suggests, was mainly for luxury goods. But within empires, an earthier division of labor now existed. Romans got wheat from Egypt, figs and salted meat from Spain, salted fish from the Black Sea. Even if imported fish weren't exactly daily fare for peasants, the benefits of non-zero sumness were slowly beginning to reach below the ruling class. Nagging Questions So, there you have it. Ancient history in a nutshell, onward and upward. This sort of simple summary tends to inspire objections, such as Complaint number one. What about the quirks? This view of history, intent on generalizing, ignores the fascinating and consequential differences between civilizations. For people who lodge this complaint, there is a simple reply. You're in luck. There are thousands of books you'll love reading. Narrative histories tend to focus on the differences, the particular, often to the exclusion of the commonalities, the general, to combat this bias, to spend a book dwelling on the common, is not to deny the differences, which are indeed large and interesting. Ancient Egypt, as we've seen, seems to have fused religion and government more than many other early civilizations. No mean feat. And China managed to keep an unusually large piece of turf politically unified under unusually long-lived dynasties. It is always tempting, if you're me at least, to try to explain such differences technologically. Is China's vast unity partly due to the use of a script that, because it was largely ideographic, allowed speakers of different dialects to comprehend a single written Chinese language? And might the flip side of this script, the difficulty of learning it, have kept power from diffusing rapidly beyond the ruling class? And as for the intensely divine status of Egypt's pharaohs, well, who knows?
Not even an ardent technological determinist tries to explain everything in terms of technics. The main point is that acknowledging these differences doesn't detract from the commonalities, and in fact, in a sense, underscores them. Early China was just an unusually good example of the general rule that all early civilizations draw some unity from their information technology. Similarly, the pharaoh's divinity points to a general trend. Church and state have grown more distinct over time, worldwide. There are today no states, not even so-called theocracies, run by people who declare themselves gods. And there are no economically advanced states in which leaders even call themselves divinely ordained. Whatever the causes of Egypt's pure theocracy, it was a relic in the making. Other contrasts among ancient civilizations also hint at larger patterns. Markets played a larger role among the Aztecs than among the Inca, and in Mesopotamia than in Egypt. But all of these civilizations had an economy that harnessed non-zero-sumness through capital investment and division of labor. A command economy and a market economy are two roots to this universal imperative— even if one of them had a brighter future, especially in light of coming trends in information technology. Complaint number two. What about the Greeks? This chapter, supposedly about the birth of civilization, hasn't even mentioned classical Greece, which in many minds is synonymous with the birth of civilization— Shouldn't we have paused for a paean to Socrates and Sophocles, Pythagoras and Archimedes? Fine men, all of them. Smart, too. Still, from the perspective of world history, they don't deserve to hog the spotlight. Great literature and philosophy are not Western monopolies. The ethics of ancient sages in India, such as the Buddha, and China, Confucius, hold their own in comparison with Greek moral philosophy and were massively consequential. And as for Pythagoras and Archimedes, far be it from me to minimize mathematics or science or technology, but we should certainly minimize the importance of any one person in these fields because all three are on autopilot. The bent for innovation is so deeply human that progress doesn't depend on anyone in particular. Pi was calculated with precision by Archimedes, but also independently by the Chinese, and the Pythagorean theorem, it now seems, had been grasped in ancient Mesopotamia. The concept of zero was invented not in Greece, but in India, and also independently in Mesoamerica by the Maya. The histories of math, science, and technology are chock full of such independent inventions— if Pythagoras and Archimedes and Aristotle had died in the crib, the long-run picture in math, science, and technology would not have changed appreciably. Therefore, neither would the long-run course of cultural evolution. None of this is to say that Greece shouldn't hold a special place in our hearts. For one thing, the Greeks helped test a thesis that the previous chapter hinted at, that, as a society's information technologies become broadly accessible, the result can be not just economic vibrance, but political freedom. The Greeks added vowels to the phonetic alphabet, carrying it to its height of accessibility. They grasped the virtues of coins and started minting their own. And to this mix of information technologies, the Greeks astutely added the ingredient of trust— making it easy for private parties to strike legally binding contracts. On balance, the results of the test were encouraging. Classical Athens, in its better moments, was economically vibrant, broadly literate, by ancient standards, and democratic. Ditto. Actually, the general notion that economic decentralization disperses political power had gotten some support from earlier phases in cultural evolution as well. The relatively market-oriented Aztecs had their unusually egalitarian legal code, 
and in relatively market-oriented Mesopotamia, justice was sometimes administered by citizens' assemblies. Indeed, the written remnants of Mesopotamian civilization provide a virtual play-by-play -play account of how information, economics, and politics might benignly co-evolve. In the early third millennium, with writing a new and elite craft, still the province of scribes, records reflect mainly state-controlled transactions. But a millennium later, in northern Mesopotamia, a profusion of clay contracts speaks of a robust private sector, with, for example, traders sending tin and textiles to Anatolia in exchange for gold and silver. How did private citizens reach such heights? One clue may lie in the simplified, less esoteric cuneiform script used in these contracts, whereas professional scribes generally monopolized the ancient writing business, some archaeologists think these traders had broken that tradition, becoming literate themselves. It is in this period when the diffusion of information technology seems to have helped carry economic power well beyond the control of kings and priests that we find evidence of something like democracy. The documents from community assemblies now show them not merely meting out justice, but assuming a deliberative, quasi-legislative function. There are even references to a city hall. Of course, meanwhile, elsewhere in ancient civilization, there was tyranny aplenty, and there were ham-handed government attempts to control the economy. Still, this example from northern Mesopotamia was auspicious. If economic freedom harnesses non-zero sumness, bringing the wealth that makes states powerful, and if economic freedom tends to entail political freedom, then history might turn out to be on the side of political freedom. After all, powerful states have a tendency to prevail over weaker ones. What's more, Maybe later information technologies would strengthen this theoretical logic behind freedom. Still, at this stage in history, we find only a glimmer of evidence for such hopes. Complaint number three. Where's the chaos? This picture of civilization's ascent has been a bit selective. It's all very well to talk about the Silk Road or the seaborne commerce along the southern coast of Eurasia, as if such non-zero-sum sinews grow longer and stronger under divine providence. But what about all the disruptions? What about the pirates? What about the wild-eyed marauders from the primitive north who swooped down on Silk Road caravans? First of all, Travel during the first century A.D. was sufficiently civilized so that the rewards of trade warranted the risks in the judgment of ancient traders. So non-zero sumness did survive the parasitic assault of zero-sum ambitions. But it did more than survive. It prevailed. Disruptions of trade spurred the evolution of governance. After all, Pirates and marauders are just another form of the trust barrier that can block mutually fruitful exchange. They erode your faith that when you send goods eastward, silk will show up in return. And cultural evolution, given long enough, reliably devises means to breach the trust barrier, notably expanded political control. One of the early goals of Roman expansion in the 3rd century B.C., had been to squelch pirates and thus defend Italian commerce by drawing the Dalmatian coast of the Adriatic Sea into a Roman sphere of influence. And one of the ongoing rewards of subsequent expansion was to dampen such disruptions of commerce and that other classic disruptor, war. That is one reason the Pax Romana brought new affluence. It created not just a war-free zone, but a relatively brigand-free zone. This pattern is hardly peculiar to Rome. In ancient times, commerce persistently ventured beyond political bounds. 
when an official from Han, China, ventured past the western border into terra incognita, he was shocked to find, on reaching Afghanistan, Chinese goods for sale. And political control often caught up with commerce, strengthening its logic. By making passage easier and safer and extending the reach of a uniform legal code, governance lowered both the communications and trust barriers. Indeed, it is largely the surmounting of these two barriers that separated the dominant civilizations from the rest of the pack. Ask a historian to name two things that made Rome great, that served as paragons for posterity to emulate, and there's a fair chance you'll hear Roman roads and Roman law. Imperial expansion isn't the only way to fight pirates. There are also international accords. And in the late Middle Ages, as we'll see, there were private sector solutions. But all of these fixes, as we'll also see, amount to a kind of expanded governance. Pirates, however you handle them, are just one example of how turbulence and chaos often turn out to be harbingers of new forms of order. And so it is today. New information technologies bringing new kinds of international commerce bring new kinds of disruption. A thief can sit in one nation and steal money from banks in another. The solutions to such supranational problems inherently amount to small steps in the direction of supranational governance. How far we'll walk down that path is quite arguable, but the path's basic direction is less so. Whenever technology has expanded the envelope of non-zero sumness, new zero sum threats have materialized, only to be combated by larger governance in one sense or another. Complaint number four. You've missed the point of complaint number three. Pirates and brigands are hardly the only form of chaos. What about large-scale chaos? What about decade-long droughts and deadly plagues? And what about barbarians? Not bands of highway robbers, but whole hordes of raping and pillaging brutes. After all, the Roman Empire did eventually fall before their onslaught, right? Indeed, didn't the whole Eurasian Ecumene, the vast belt of civilization that had evolved by the first century A.D., begin to fall apart? Didn't the Silk Road spend much of its life in tatters? In that light, what does it matter if civilizations tend to get bigger and more complex? The bigger they are, the harder they fall. The barbarians who sacked Rome don't seem to have had as their motto, onward and upward. Actually, that assertion is debatable, as we'll see in the next chapter. Chapter 10 our friends, the barbarians. We have to remember that the annals of this warfare between civilization and barbarism have been written almost exclusively by the scribes of the civilized camp. Arnold Toynbee In A.D. 410, the Visigoths sacked Rome. St. Jerome, who had studied in Rome and had translated the Bible into its language, was in Bethlehem when he heard the news. He wrote to a friend, What is safe if Rome perishes? He answered his own question. The whole world perished in one city. This was a somewhat insular view. As Romans watched the Goths wreak havoc, the Maya, for example, went about their business as usual— Still, there is a sense in which the stakes of the barbarian assault were indeed larger than the city of Rome and larger than the whole empire. The belt of civilization that had spanned the Eurasian continent by the first century A.D. thereafter began to unravel in various places, thanks largely to barbarian tribes, Huns, Goths, Vandals, and others. China battled marauding nomads often, and sometimes lost. The Gupta Empire of northern India fell under assault from Huns and finally crumbled. Sassanid Persia barely kept the Huns at bay, sometimes becoming, in effect, their vassal state. 
in the New World, budding civilizations faced the same problem. Citadels of urbanity were besieged by rapacious bumpkins, and some fell. All told, barbarians had enough success to raise the question, what if they had prevailed? What if their devastation had been more thorough and widespread? Can we really be so sure that the basic thrust of cultural evolution would have resumed any time soon, or indeed ever? Did barbarians stand a real chance of ending the world's basic movement toward vaster and deeper social complexity? No. Indeed, the existence of barbarians, far from impeding cultural advance, may have, on balance, promoted it. This fact is illustrated even by the most famously devastating barbarian triumph, the fall of the Roman Empire. Common Misconceptions About Barbarians What is a barbarian? To the cultural evolutionists of the 19th century, as we've seen, barbarian denoted a stage between savage, a simple hunter-gatherer band, and civilized, a state. This is indeed the level that most barbarian tribes of ancient times had reached. Today we would call them chiefdoms, though some were unusually mobile chiefdoms. Historians use barbarian more loosely. Barbarians are peoples with a culture less advanced than their neighbors, and perhaps with a tendency to violently exploit their neighbors' advancement. Sometimes the exploitation, the pillaging, was done by swooping down on horseback, though this luxury was not available to New World barbarians. To the Romans, barbarian was a less technical term. Its origins sound innocent. It came from the Greek word for foreigner, but its connotations were decidedly disparaging. Some Romans referred to the land within the empire's bounds as oikumeni, inhabited land. The Roman view of barbarians, as uncouth, perhaps depraved, even subhuman, lingers on, making barbarians one of the most misunderstood and unjustly maligned of groups. Several misconceptions in particular need dispelling. Misconception number one. Barbarians are less civilized than their neighbors in a moral sense, less decent, less humane. Behaving less humanely than the Romans would be hard. It was Roman cavalrymen who informed their nemesis Hannibal of the outcome of a recent battle by tossing his brother's head into his camp. It was Romans who avenged an early defeat at the hands of the Goths by taking Goth children, seized as hostages years earlier, and marching them into public squares in various towns, then slaughtering them. The emperor Nero bound Christians, smeared pitch on them, and ignited them, purportedly to light his gardens at night. One of his successors, Titus, celebrated his brother's birthday by publicly killing 2,500 Jews, pitting some against each other in combat, pitting others against wild animals, and burning the rest. On a smaller scale, of course, this sort of spectacle was a regular form of Roman entertainment. Sacking cities was standard Roman procedure, and indeed common in ancient wars generally. St. Augustine, reflecting on the Goths' looting of Rome, wrote, All the destruction, slaughter, plundering, burning, and distress visited upon Rome in its latest calamity were but the normal aftermath of war. What was unusual, he observed, was that fierce barbarians, by an unprecedented turn of events, showed such clemency that vast basilicas were designated as places where refugees might assemble with assurance of humanity. The Goths had burned only a few buildings, over a few days, before moving on. Misconception number two. Barbarians lack culture. If by culture you mean fine sculpture, Greek tragedies, or eating salad with your salad fork, this charge has merit. But if by culture you mean what a cultural evolutionist means, all products of the human mind, especially practical ones, 
then barbarians needn't hang their heads in shame. Given their dearth of formal education, they've contributed a fair amount to humankind's great upward-flowing stream of memes. It was a barbarian plow that opened the heavy soil of northern and western Europe to farming during the Middle Ages. It was Asian barbarians who gave the stirrup to the Chinese and ultimately to the West. And back during the Shu era, barbarians assaulting the state of Qin had displayed a new style of warfare based on the horse archer. The Qin used the technique not only to fend off later barbarian waves, but to conquer rival states and unify China. Romans used to complain about the smell of barbarians, but that just goes to show there's no accounting for taste. It was the Romans who didn't use soap, and the barbarians who invented the stuff by boiling fat in alkali. Misconception number three. Barbarians are beyond true edification. Granted that they've thought up a few neat ideas, often related to riding horses and killing people, when it comes to imparting culture to barbarians, you might as well be talking to a stone. Actually, barbarians, being human, are receptive to the same kinds of memes that people in general are receptive to. They like functional things, novel things, glittery things. Roman emperors used to dissuade Attila from pillaging by sending him gold. He would then do what any normal human would do after getting a big paycheck, go shopping. So the Huns wound up with silk, pearls, gold platters, silver goblets, gem-studded bridles, comfy sofas, linen bedsheets, and, of course, sturdy iron swords with which to extract more gold from Romans. Even bookishness was not beyond the barbarian mind. By the end of the 4th century A.D., a bishop had converted some of the Goths to Christianity and translated the Bible into their language. This was the beginning of Germanic literacy. The dispelling of misconceptions 2 and 3 suggests a larger truth. If barbarians are reasonably good at generating memes and at absorbing memes generated by others— and are prone to travel, then you would expect them to be valuable meme spreaders and synthesizers. Indeed, they are veritable mixmasters of culture. Consider the Celts, the chiefdom-level people who touched various parts of Europe in the centuries before and after Christ. According to one archaeologist, the Celts were nomadic, boastful, quarrelsome, sumptuous, wild, and warlike, and they were headhunters— but whatever you do, don't call them uncultured. They sold salt and metals to the Greeks and used the proceeds to buy wine, pottery, and metalworks. They transmitted Greek artistic motifs northward and conveyed ironworking technologies across broad swaths of Europe. Eventually, Celts would popularize horseshoes, iron locks, and barrels. The Romans learned the virtues of the short sword the hard way, while the Celts were sacking Rome in 390 B.C. By Caesar's day, Celts were coining money in the fashion of Romans. Some Celts mastered the Greek alphabet. Thus, above and beyond, the Celts' erratic bursts of marauding and trading was a larger role, data processing and transmission. Amid the hubbub, memes, conglomerations of cultural information, got selectively preserved and replicated. They included one of the most important material technologies ever, ironworking, and two of the most important information technologies ever, writing and money. Thank you, head-hunting Celts. The moral of the story is simple. When thinking about cultural evolution, don't get wrapped up in the particular people and peoples. Instead, Keep your eye on the memes. People and peoples come and go, live and die, but their memes, like their genes, persist. When all the trading and plundering and warring is done, bodies may be lying everywhere and social structure may seem in disarray. Yet, in the process, culture, the aggregate menu of memes on which society can draw, may well have evolved. 
Eventually, social structure will follow, coalescing around the newly available technological base. It may take a while for the social structure to catch up with the technology, see next chapter, but given enough time, it will. Misconception number four. Barbarians are by nature transient and chaotic. It is true that the barbarians of Europe and Asia were sometimes seized by wanderlust, and understandably so. If parasitizing painstakingly constructed civilizations is your line of work, you have to travel. But parasitism was in fact not the vocation of most barbarians most of the time. When they found nice fertile land or a nice nexus among trading peoples, they often settled down to earn a living, an honest living even. You wouldn't know this to read the dramatic Roman accounts of barbarians, but then they were based on dramatic encounters between Romans and barbarians, not on a random sampling of barbarian life. Archaeologists have since found that the Germanic barbarians north of the empire lived in stable and enduring communities, their economy probably essentially similar to peasant agriculture within the western Roman provinces. What's more, barbarian societies, whether nomadic or sedentary, tend to evolve, just like other societies, toward higher levels of organization— one reason the Romans felt growing torment during the 4th century was that their tormentors possessed increasingly deft administration, some of it copied from the Romans. The barbarians were growing more civilized, in the words of one historian, and thus more terrifying. Another historian writes of the barbarians menacing North China. They became really dangerous to the extent that they became civilized, and versed in the arts of organization, production, and war. One such barbarian memorized Confucian scriptures and was fond of saying, to be ignorant of even one thing is a cause of shame to the gentleman. His well-schooled son sacked the capital of the Qin in 311, an event roughly comparable to the sacking of Rome. The Huns, in particular, though nomadic, were organized on a vast scale, sometimes described as an empire. Like ancient empires generally, the Huns violently subjugated peoples and exacted tribute from them. Who were the Romans to complain about that? Meanwhile, over in East Asia, a barbarian confederacy called the Toba was assembling its own empire during the 4th and 5th centuries. The Toba eventually found themselves ruling most of North China and having to defend their turf against fresh waves of irksome barbarians. That barbarians can be just as happy upholding a civilization as tearing one down is nowhere better illustrated than in the Roman Empire. For centuries, Romans had used Germanic tribes as mercenaries, and by the time Rome was sacked, some of the empire's finest generals were of barbarian extraction. By and large, the Romans discovered you could do business with these people. With the successful invasions of the 5th century, the barbarian tribes made this clearer. Before them lay vast expanses of Roman farmland tilled by peasants who paid stiff taxes to a government that was increasingly unable to defend them how to exploit the situation. One approach might have been to sweep across the agrarian countryside, battling Roman soldiers, slaughtering peasants, then taking their land. Another approach was to leave the peasants more or less alone and simply cut a deal with Roman officials under which you begin to replace them as tax collectors. The barbarians of legend would have taken the first path, the real-life barbarians took the second, thus realizing every person's dream, a high ratio of income to work. Over the 5th and 6th centuries, the Roman tax apparatus came to be, in the words of one historian, under new management. There is a famous put-down applied to public servants who begin their careers with high ideals and wind up corrupted. They came to do good, and stayed to do well. 
of the barbarians who fought Rome, we might say they came to do bad and stayed to do well. They may have begun their invasions in a mood to pillage, but they eventually found a more sedate livelihood. This flexibility is one reason that by A.D. 500, Western Europe had evolved fairly smoothly from a single empire to several large barbarian kingdoms, such as the Visigothic in Spain and the Ostrogothic in Italy. And how did Greco-Roman culture fare at the hands of barbarians? The Goths weren't the sort to ponder Plato's dialogues, but they praised the texts of Euclid. Eschewing squishy subjects, they stressed nuts and bolts disciplines. Architecture, they restored some of the empire's monumental buildings. Surveying, helpful in tax collection. Mathematics, especially as applied to coinage and measurement. Medicine, among the booty the Visigoths carried south after sacking Rome was the physician Dionysius. The Goths disdained the study of rhetoric, which had loomed large in Roman law schools, but law itself was another matter. Employing Roman jurists, they adapted Roman law to the governance of their Roman subjects, and also formalized their own legal traditions, which had previously been oral. One barbarian published tome was called Roman Law of the Visigoths. None of this is to suggest an easy continuity between the final century of Roman rule in Western Europe and the centuries to come. The Goths and Franks and other barbarians, however eager to be Rome's heirs, were ill-equipped to assimilate a whole body of advanced culture. Besides, counterattacks from the still formidable eastern sector of the Roman Empire, based in Constantinople, were disruptive. The Emperor Justinian's reclamation of Rome did more damage than the original sacking by the Visigoths. In the end, the great barbarian kingdoms did not endure intact. Still, the barbarians didn't send Roman culture through a paper shredder either. Misconception number five. Barbarians were a peculiar affliction that for some reason materialized in the age of Rome and then recurred occasionally as with the Mongol maraudings of the late Middle Ages. The very fact that cultural evolution proceeds unevenly from place to place means that for millennia before Rome, civilizations had been surrounded by less advanced cultures. These have-nots, being human, had the capacity for predation, and sometimes exercised it. Middle Eastern civilizations seem to have been beset by at least two waves of barbarian devastation near the beginning and end of the second millennium BC. So why do we hear relatively little about these earlier barbarians? Several reasons. First, the further back in time you go, the less recording of history there is. Archaeologists find the ruins of former civilizations and signs of violent clash, but they seldom find clear testament to what presumably was the perspective of the afflicted civilization. That hostile, uncouth, inferior aliens were on a mindless rampage. Indeed, when the barbarian assault is successful, its history, if ever recorded at all, will probably be written by descendants of the barbarians— and you can't expect them to trumpet their ancestors' barbarism. Consider the Aztecs. They started out as semi-nomadic brutes, lingering on the periphery of more advanced cultures, raiding them here, serving as their mercenaries there. Sound familiar? When they had finally learned enough to found their own great city and conquer literate peoples, they destroyed texts that described their own past as primitive, they wrote new histories, depicting themselves as the sole legitimate heir to the late, great Toltec civilization. For that matter, the Toltec themselves had started out as semi-nomadic barbarians, soaking up the culture of the peoples they would then push off the local pedestal. Indeed, if you explore the murky recesses of just about any famously civilized people, you'll find this dark secret. They started out as barbarians. The Romans weren't exactly hailed by the Greeks as cultured equals when they happened on the scene. 
In fact, even after generations of Hellenic edification, the boringly practical Romans didn't exude quite the cerebral air of classical Greece. Yet they were massively infiltrated by classical Greek memes, which they then spread across the wider world. In Horace's phrase, the Greeks, captive, took the victors captive. And anyway, who were the Greeks to look down on intrusive barbarians? They had their own checkered past. Their lowly ancestors took a big step in the long trek towards snobbery by invading Europe's first bureaucratic monarchy, Minoan civilization on Crete, in the 15th century BC. The early Greeks had a title of honor, Toli Porthos, that meant sacker of cities. And Dorian Greeks may have been among the troublemakers who wreaked havoc near the end of the second millennium BC. You can play this game all day, going back and showing the ignoble social origins of what would later become dominant civilizations. But whether these barbarians sack cities, or hover on the periphery and trade with them, or ally with them in war, or ally against them, one outcome is nearly certain. Win, lose, or draw, the barbarians become vehicles for advanced memes. As William McNeil wrote in The Rise of the West, the history of civilization is a history of the expansion of particularly attractive cultural and social patterns through conversion of barbarians to modes of life they found superior to their own. This century, English has been virtually synonymous with civilization and refinement, yet the word England means land of the Angles, a tribe that, back in the days of Rome, was just another bothersome bunch of barbarians. Misconception number six. Barbarian eruptions, in their chaos and destruction, are ironic punctuation to the supposedly progressive flow of cultural evolution. We've seen that barbarians, in the long run, fall in line, assisting the upward flow of memes— but there's a second sense as well in which barbarians, however defiantly they may seem to swim against the stream of cultural progress, are in fact going with the flow. The reason they're so well equipped for the brief display of defiance in the first place is because the flow of memes is so inexorable. When a civilization such as Rome dominates its neighbors, it typically possesses some sort of cultural edge— better weapons, say, or better economic organization. Yet this dominance is hard to maintain precisely because these valuable memes tend naturally to spread beyond its borders, empowering its rivals. In the case of Rome, the barbarian empowering memes included military strategy, but the exact memes will differ from case to case. As the historian Mark Elvin has observed, the diffusion of Chinese iron-making technology to the Mongols during the 13th century would come back to haunt China. Elvin was among the first to clearly see that this is a general dynamic in history. The very advancement of advanced societies can bring the seeds of their destruction. As Elman Service put the matter, the precocious developing society broadcasts its seeds, so to speak, outside its own area, and some of them root and grow vigorously in new soil, sometimes becoming stronger than the parent stock, finally to dominate both their environments. The point can scarcely be overemphasized. The turbulence that characterizes world history is not only consistent with a progressivist view of history— it is integral to it. The turbulence itself, including the sometimes devastating empowerment of barbarians, is a result of the fact that technology evolves, with the fittest technologies spreading rapidly. Hegemony can bring stasis, such as the Pax Romana, but in the long run such imbalances of power naturally undermine themselves, and stasis ends. The ensuing turbulence may look for all the world like regression, but it is ultimately progressive. It reflects, and, as we've seen, often furthers the globalization of new and improved memes, 
on which the next stasis will rest. Misconception number seven, barbarians prey on innocent victims. The phrase barbarians at the gate conjures up a Manichaean image. Inside Rome's walls, librarians are shelving painstakingly translated editions of Euripides when smoke starts seeping through the stacks. What had the Romans done to deserve this? Plenty. For starters, the economy of imperial Rome, to an extent notable even by ancient standards, had been built on slaves. This may sound like a moral critique, and it is, but it is also something more. It is an evaluation of Rome by the basic gauge of cultural evolution. How thoroughly did Rome realize potential synergy among its people? Not very. When a society keeps people in chains and confiscates the fruits of their labor, it is trying to play a non-zero-sum game in utterly parasitic fashion, a strategy that, I've argued, has its pitfalls. First, oppression takes time and energy. Rome more than once had to put down slave revolts, and vigilance was constant. No one can feel safe even if he is a lenient and kind master, lamented Pliny the Younger, who inferred from this fact that slaves are ruined by their own evil natures. Second, slavery rather weakens a worker's incentive to work, thus making close oversight a prerequisite for efficient labor, and oversight is costly, so efficiency suffers in any event. Third, slavery keeps workers from becoming robust consumers. Fourth, by keeping labor artificially cheap, slavery dampens the society's incentive to develop more productive technologies. Rome's ruling class was famously indifferent to labor-saving innovation, and technological progress was unspectacular. There is evidence that slavery waned toward the end of the empire, but at the same time, workaday peasants were becoming less free, more like medieval serfs, tied to land they didn't own. And the government started trying to stop craftsmen and shopkeepers from changing vocations. It even insisted that their children follow in their footsteps. One classical historian believes that the Mediterranean world came closer to a caste system than at any other time in its history. Again, leaving aside the moral critique, this is just bad social engineering. It stifles the gains that can arise spontaneously from freedom of choice in a market economy. Even Rome's great contribution to commerce, the large, low-friction zone created by the Pax Romana, was hardly an unmixed blessing. It had its element of simple exploitation, especially visible to those who had to be subdued for the sake of the Pax. To robbery, slaughter, plunder, they give the lying name of empire, opined one Briton. They make a desert and call it peace. After subjugation was complete, there were often unwarranted taxes and greedy administrators on the take. By most accounts, this sort of parasitism grew as the political culture became more corrupt, oppressive, and dictatorial. In the late imperial period, emperors were claiming divinity and acting like pharaohs. They stayed secluded, cultivating a mystique, and Romans who were granted an audience had to start by kissing the hem of the emperor's robe. The Senate was by now impotent, with emperors chosen by the military, sometimes through a kind of civil war bake-off. None of this is to deny Rome's celebrated legacy— Roman principles of law and administration were lasting paragons, even if, in practice, they were progressively adulterated. Still, once these principles were on paper and Roman engineering had left its mark, the Romans had little else to give posterity. Whether you are a champion of moral improvement or just of cultural evolution— you might defensibly conclude that, by the time the barbarians descended on the Western Roman Empire en masse, it deserved to die. 
Obviously, any conclusion this neatly gratifying should arouse suspicion. What actually caused the demise of the Western Roman Empire is still debated, and some conjectured causes, disease, depleted soil, chance geographic exposure to unusually large barbarian hordes, don't reflect on the quality of Rome's government. Whether the empire's decline really is the morality play that many historians make of it, an interpretation I've happily adopted, is an open question. Whole civilizations can rise and fall on the basis of chance events. It is only in the long run and in the broad sweep of events that basic dynamics of cultural evolution sustain history's direction. Still, it is notable how many of the commonly posited causes of Rome's decline are blights on non-zero sumness, an artificially frozen labor market, an increasingly unfair legal system, corruption in the delivery of public goods by officials, excessive taxes and tariffs dictated by the costs of supporting an empire that is parasitic on its provinces. All of these weaken the fabric of mutual benefit that holds well-run societies together. The Verdict of History so thank heavens for barbarians. If dominant civilizations are stagnant and decaying, contributing little, if anything, to the march of non-zero sumness, it is just as well, from cultural evolution standpoint, to have troublemakers nearby. Better to tear the system down and start over. And because barbarians turn out to be so partial to civilized memes, you don't have to start from scratch. The barbarian role of cultural demolition crew is especially important when you consider how often cultural reconstruction is needed. Many of Rome's glaring defects, exploitation, authoritarianism, corrupt self-aggrandizement, flow from deeply human tendencies. Time and again they've transformed promising civilizations into decaying, oppressive monstrosities. Time and again, history seems to cry out, bring on the demolition crew, and time and again, barbarians cheerfully respond to the call. Their previous massive reeking of destruction near the end of the second millennium BC had come after civilization went through centuries of apparent ossification. In a way, barbarians are just a special case of that general and potent zero-sum dynamic in cultural evolution, brutal competition among neighboring societies. This rivalry renders ossified cultures vulnerable to a makeover, minor or major. They may be taken over by a vast neighboring civilization which will revamp them in its image, or they may be infiltrated and perhaps even disassembled by barbarians, paving the way for future reassembly. Or they may revive and prevail, an example of the challenge and response dynamic stressed by Arnold Toynbee. In any event, the point remains the same. However deeply human the tendencies of exploitation, authoritarianism, and self-aggrandizement, cultures that surrender to them may not be long for this world. But wait, when did exploitation and authoritarianism suddenly become political liabilities? Didn't most of the early states, as well as their precursors, the chiefdoms, employ terror when useful, take slaves when possible, and claim the mantle of divinity, or at least of divine blessing, to nudge the masses into compliance with central dictate? However morally reprehensible these tactics, why should they have become ineffective by Rome's day? Part of the answer, as we've seen, may be that technology changes the rules of governance. With the coming of standard, universally accepted coins and a fully phonetic alphabet, complete with vowels, the potential existed for a more decentralized economy than ever before. So, for example, slavery, the ultimate in exploitation, now carried a higher cost in foregone productivity. The better lubricated the market, the more it can benefit from untrammeled participation. A mind, as they say, is a terrible thing to waste. 
even if, in an ancient economy, it is focused mainly on toiling the fields for the highest wage offered and then turning around and spending the money. Though Rome had a largely market economy, there was, from the beginning, a certain obliviousness to its potential. When the Romans started minting coins in the 4th century BC, the stated purpose was not to smooth commerce, but just to create a medium by which the government could buy things. Of course, coins did flood the private sector willy-nilly. The eastern half of the empire, which survived the collapse of the west, was less guilty of some of these sins. The east seems all along to have had fewer slaves than the west, in the East, the economy was less afflicted by such stultifying policies as the virtual ban on changing vocations. And, for historical reasons, the East had a more integrated economy, which ably moved goods from one region to another. There were large old market towns, whereas many Western towns were more like shells, administrative centers lacking an organic core. Of course, in the battle for survival, the East had one other big asset, a shorter barbarian frontier. And certainly, in any event, the East, which shared many of the West's ossifying tendencies, was no paragon for a high-tech future. The entire empire was vulnerable, some parts just more so than others. The historian Chester Starr once wrote, Every so often, civilization seems to work itself into a corner from which further progress is virtually impossible along the lines then apparent. Yet if new ideas are to have a chance, the old systems must be so severely shaken that they lose their dominance. This may strike some as teleological, even mystical, as if the god of progress looks down and weeds out civilizations that aren't prepared for coming ideas. But Starr's point sounds more reasonable once you view technological evolution as an active force in history. It is metaphorically true that cutting-edge technologies, economic technologies no less than military technologies, punish societies that don't embrace them and use them well, leaving those societies at risk of being severely shaken. It is also metaphorically true that those technologies reward societies that employ them more profitably. Of course, technology isn't some extraneous force visited on the planet from outer space. It is selected by human minds through cultural evolution. People are the arbiters of technology. But technologies, in a broad sense at least, are in turn the arbiters of social structure. The question for Western Europe, as of the 5th century A.D., was to what kind of social structures would technology next give its blessing? Chapter 11 Dark Ages This is the old story. Whenever one sets out to discuss collapse, one ends up by talking about continuity. G. W. Bowersock In the 1969 book Civilization, companion to the BBC television series of the same name, Kenneth Clark had a chapter called By the Skin of Our Teeth. Its premise was that Western civilization was lucky to be alive— the Dark Ages, as some have called the Early Middle Ages, truly had been dark. Just barely had the smoldering embers of the West's classical heritage survived to illuminate the world another day. But for the labors of a few monastic scribes, carefully copying the great works, who knows what sort of cultural backwater Europe would be now. This theme is a hardy perennial, more recently on display in Thomas Cahill's best-selling book, How the Irish Saved Civilization, in which Irish scribes were singled out for special praise. Clark and Cahill have in essence looked back to St. Jerome's despairing question, What is safe if Rome perishes? and deemed it a very good one. In the previous chapter, we found reason to consider Jerome's question alarmist, Namely, barbarians are people too. 
unlike Conan the Barbarian, whose professed aim in life was to defeat the enemy, see him run before you, and hear the lamentations of the women. Most real-life barbarians are eager to settle down and savor the fruits of civilization, to defeat the enemy, tax him, visit his doctors, marry his daughters. Another reason to deem Jerome a bit melodramatic is that, as historians have come to realize, the term Dark Ages is misleading. Even in the early Middle Ages, and especially in the later, there was creativity and vibrance. Still, it is true that the early Middle Ages must have seemed fairly dim at the time. There was indeed a collapse in the Roman vicinity. Roads that once carried goods safely to market fell into disrepair and were beset by outlaws. Towns contracted and farmlands were reclaimed by the wild. Mines were abandoned and metal production dropped. Reliable coinage, especially gold, grew scarce, and people found themselves in a nearly moneyless economy, bartering goods or paying with their labors. Population continued to drop. The scope of government vacillated, barbarian kingdoms grew and shrank, and sometimes their kings had little real power anyway. So even if barbarians aren't deeply barbaric, and even if the Dark Ages weren't pitch black, things did look dicey in Europe for a time. Any basic tendency of cultural evolution to carry society to higher and higher levels of complexity was not vividly apparent. So those of us who believe in such a tendency must say a few words about the Dark Ages. What firm dynamics of history made their end just a matter of time? Why does Reconstruction reliably follow collapse and disarray? The question is not confined to the most famous Dark Ages, the European ones. Chinese cohesion suffered a big setback in the 4th and 5th centuries A.D., as barbarians poured in from the north, and the barbarian onslaughts at the end of the 2nd millennium B.C. had wreaked havoc from the western Mediterranean to the Middle East. In the New World, there's the famous Mayan collapse, among others, and so on, a lengthy menu of regression to choose from. In asking why collapses in general tend not to prove fatal, we'll focus mainly on Europe's Middle Ages. They are the best documented example of major collapse and recovery, and the most famous. They're also the most widely cited challenge to directional views of history. After all, if civilization really did survive by the skin of its teeth, then it must be pretty fragile. There is one other reason to focus on Europe. In the skin-of-our-teeth view of history, it isn't just civilization in the generic sense that was lucky to survive. Kenneth Clark might concede that, even without the monks, Europe would eventually have made leaps economically, technologically, politically. Clark's concern is more with Western civilization. Would its distinctive emphases on political liberty, for example, have survived if the barbarians had permanently broken the link with classical Greece, the cradle of Western freedom and democracy? This is a subtler question, with a more tentative answer. But, as we'll see, there is reason to believe that many historians overplay the role of the peculiar heritage of the West in shaping its modern form, and underplay the role of universal forces of history as played out amid the quirks of medieval history. Keep keeping your eye on the memes. The first step toward appreciating the inexorability of the West's resurgence in the later Middle Ages is to drain the early Middle Ages of the melodrama given them by the skin-of-our-teeth view of history— and the first step in this melodrama reduction is to repeat the mantra from the last chapter. Keep your eye on the memes. In deciding whether a culture has collapsed in the first place, ask not what has happened to a particular people or a particular land. Cultures can hop from person to person and place to place, leaving ruin behind yet staying healthy themselves. 
Well before the sacking of Rome, the Roman Empire's headquarters had been officially moved to Constantinople. There, in the Eastern Empire, in Byzantium, much of classical culture remained alive and well, in books, in minds, in practice, until Europe's dark ages had passed. This is a common story with collapses. Empty Mayan ruins are standard imagery in accounts of lost civilizations. Seldom noted is that the Mayan collapse afflicted only part of Mayan civilization. To the north, whole cities survived and kept Mayan culture, including its precious script, intact. Similarly, the famous collapse of Indus Valley civilization in South Asia during the second millennium BC is often depicted as an overnight vanishing. But people lived on and regrouped and retained key technologies, their advanced system of standardized weights and possibly their script. One of the area's modern-day scripts may well be a descendant of the original, the family resemblance blurred by millennia of evolution. The second great antidote to melodrama is to remember that political maps aren't always a good guide to social complexity. True, the Roman Empire had been a state-level society, a civilization, and true, much of Western Europe, including modern-day France and England, had technically been part of the empire, paying taxes and possessing elements of civilization, some roads, shiny coins, a few bureaucrats. But roads and coins don't turn a simple society into a complex one overnight. Marvin Harris has written that transalpine Europe did not lapse back into the Dark Ages, never having gotten out of them in the first place. This may be an exaggeration, but not a huge one. Of course, the rustics of transalpine Europe, if not themselves fully civilized, had grown dependent on Roman governance, so pulling this rug out from under them was an interesting experiment in cultural evolution. What would they do? Go into free fall and finally land somewhere near the Shoshone, scurrying around in small bands and digging up roots? No. They not only held on to their agricultural technology, as if landing in a safety net, they fell back onto the remnants of their indigenous political system, the chiefdom, or at least a reasonable facsimile of it. As various cultural evolutionists have noted, European feudalism, though distinctive, had much in common with chiefdoms as observed from Polynesia to the Americas to pre-Roman Europe. Under feudalism, peasants, serfs, got land to farm, but they also had to do some farming for the local chief, or, as he was called in Europe, their lord. In return, the chief provided them not just with their land, but with public services. He offered military defense, no small thing during the Middle Ages, and administered justice, such as it was. Serfs are often depicted as virtual slaves, and they certainly weren't free in the modern sense, but more than the slaves of the Roman Empire, they could expect protection and even some minimal respect in exchange for their subservience. Serfs obey your temporal lords with fear and trembling, one French cleric advised. Lords, treat your serfs according to justice and equity. The principle of mutual obligation and of payment in services rendered, not in cash, extended upward. The local chief was himself subordinate to a higher chief. Though lord over his serfs, he was a vassal to a higher lord. As a vassal, he had to serve as his lord's soldier, often on horseback in shining armor. This obligation was his payment for the land on which his serfs worked, and for the defense of that land by the larger army to which he belonged. Though the details of feudalism differed from time to time and place to place, the above is a schematic simplification, its upshot was indeed broadly reminiscent of the classic chiefdom. There was a cluster of local units, manors, sometimes distinct villages, each of which had its own boss, and one of these bosses ranked above the other bosses, was lord to these vassals. 
so the units constituted a larger supra-village polity with centralized leadership. A key purpose of this hierarchy was the swift mobilization of men for war, but the lords also, like chiefs, orchestrated the local production of tools and other crafts. With a classic, simple chiefdom, the story would end there, a bunch of villages with local chiefs, one of whom was paramount. With feudalism, the story often went much further. The paramount chief, the lord among lords, might himself be vassal to another lord, who in turn might be vassal to a still higher lord, all the way up to the ultimate lord, the king. It was as if several chiefdoms in a region formed a super-chiefdom, and several of these chiefdoms in turn constituted a super-super-chiefdom. Sometimes the hierarchy went ten levels deep. The Fractal Beauty of Feudalism Feudal is today a pejorative term, but feudalism was in some ways well-suited to a time of instability— like the classic chiefdom, it kept food on the table without relying on a sound currency or on trade with distant peoples. It also kept warriors at the ready. This was especially impressive because, with the ascendancy of armored cavalry, due largely to the coming of the stirrup, equipping warriors got expensive. It was almost as if today no soldier could safely set foot on the battlefield without his own personal tank. The solution to this financial challenge, giving knights lordship over chunks of property they could subdivide for the use of peasants, worked well enough, and making each lord a governor of his immediate subordinates, not just peasants but any other vassals, made for a decentralized government— a handy thing in a time of poor roads, low literacy rates, and other barriers to distant administration. Perhaps most important, feudalism's nested structure, its long chain of mutual obligation, gave the system a kind of resilience. Each link in the chain was a simple and direct, non-zero-sum relationship. A lord and his vassal both benefited from the deal— and had consecrated this interdependence with ornate oaths of devotion. So, if for any reason the bonds at the highest level broke, the lower levels of the hierarchy tended to stay intact out of mutual self-interest. When kingdoms collapsed, they broke up into regional or local polities, not into anarchy. Moreover, because larger units were structurally identical to the smaller units constituting them, Mathematicians call this a fractal, or self-similar structure. Subsequent reassembly could proceed readily. Consider the Franks, in modern-day France and Germany. Of all the barbarian kingdoms that emerged with the fall of the Western Roman Empire, the Frankish kingdom had proved the most vibrant. In A.D. 800, after aggressive expansion, its leader, Charlemagne, was declared by the Pope to be emperor of a newborn Roman Empire. But the empire's coherence depended on Charlemagne's savvy and charisma, which in turn seems to have rested partly on his much-remarked-upon height, impressive enough to compensate for his also-remarked-upon squeaky voice." So his death in 814 boded ill for the continued unity of the empire, all the more so because his demise roughly coincided with the Viking onslaught from Scandinavia. On paper, it might have looked as if the Vikings would establish an immediate rapport with residents of northwestern Europe. The Vikings were a Germanic people, stigmatized as barbarians and the residents of northwestern Europe were a largely Germanic people whose not-so-distant ancestors had been stigmatized as barbarians. But, of course, the Vikings were not the sort to discuss their self-esteem problems, and anyway, the northwestern Europeans had now reached a higher social station. To them, the Vikings, in their wild-eyed savagery, seemed like members of a lower species— notwithstanding their ethnic affinity. Just goes to show, it's all in the memes. 
In any event, the Franks now faced double trouble, hordes of pillaging Vikings on the one hand, and on the other, the crumbling of Carolingian leadership as Charlemagne's heirs evinced their various shortcomings. Yet feudalism's links basically held. In northern France, counts, the second to highest ranking lords in the land, ceased to feel obligation to the highest ranking lord, the king, but they mostly retained the loyalty of their own vassals and set about expanding their domains by allying with or conquering other counts, thus fusing counties. So no sooner had the kingdom fragmented into building blocks than the blocks began to reassemble themselves. In other regions, disintegration proceeded further, below the level of counts, so the polities were smaller. Still, Feudalism's fractal structure meant that polities of any size had the same basic structure, the same ingredients for internal cohesion, and the same potential for subsequent reassembly. As a result, whether the Vikings confronted large military organizations or small ones, they always confronted organizations, and in the end the organizations, or at least the organization, won. Even where the Vikings were triumphant, they tended to melt into the fabric of feudalism rather than tear it apart. Like so many barbarians, they discovered that using existing social structures could be more profitable than destroying them, and less hazardous to your health. Though European feudalism was peculiarly resilient, human society in general is good at regrouping under duress— when centralized authority has collapsed, true anarchy has seldom ensued. Political and economic reconstitution at some level is typically immediate. Sometimes the result is sufficiently reminiscent of the Middle Ages that scholars note its feudal elements. But regardless of how feudal the recoveries, they typically rest on the same basic cement that kept Europe orderly in the early Middle Ages— the human instinct for non-zero-sum relationship. People are good at finding zones of mutual self-interest and striking deals of mutual obligation. Greeks, during their own dark ages, were a good example. After the collapse of the Mycenaean state at the end of the second millennium BC, they regrouped into what appear to have been chiefdoms, which then evolved into the city-states that would make Greece famous. Spontaneous Renaissance was also visible in northern China in the 4th century A.D., when government dissolved under barbarian onslaught. Facing chaos, families clustered together in large camps, built fortresses, and agreed to submit to a common leader. Leaders of the camps conferred and agreed to do the same. Presto! Instant political structure, complete with improvised legal codes, economic self-sufficiency, and military might. The Chinese consecrated these bonds of mutual obligation by drawing on their spiritual heritage, Confucianism, whereas the Europeans sealed feudal bonds with Christian ceremony. But the same thing was happening in both places. Human nature was ensuring that when structure collapsed, a safety net would materialize and religion was adapting itself to this mandate, the mandate of non-zero-sumness. The World Makes Backup Copies By the beginning of the 11th century, the Viking threat had subsided. Europe had weathered the storm. But it had done much more than that. It had gradually accumulated cultural capital and was now poised for a great leap forward. The cultural capital, this precious stock of memes, had little to do with Europe's classical heritage. In How the Irish Saved Civilization, Cahill gasps at what might have been lost in the barbarian invasions. Had the destruction been complete, had every library been disassembled and every book burned, we might have lost Homer and Virgil and all of classical poetry, Herodotus and Tacitus, and all of classical history, Demosthenes and Cicero, and all of classical oratory, Plato and Aristotle, and all of Greek philosophy, 
and Plotinus and Porphyry and all the subsequent commentary. Well, them's the breaks. But what people of the early Middle Ages most needed wasn't a good stiff dose of Demosthenes. They needed mundane things, such as a harness that wouldn't press on a horse's windpipe. This new device, in use by A.D. 800, tripled the weight a horse could pull and thus relieved European farmers from dependence on slow and lazy oxen, easing both transport and agriculture. Combined with other key advances, the heavy plow and later the nailed iron horseshoe, the harness drove an expansion of cultivated land. These sorts of memes, nuts and bolts, practical technologies, are more durable than those generated by, say, Sophocles, most of whose plays were lost forever. There are several reasons. One is gut-level utility. Literature is nice, but putting food on the table is nicer. A related reason is the ease with which practical technologies cross cultural and linguistic borders. Medieval Europeans didn't speak Greek, much less read it, so copies of Antigone would not have been in great demand even among unusually literary peasants. An iron horseshoe, on the other hand, speaks the universal language of utility. The final reason that practical memes are so durable is that if they die, they can be reincarnated. No one will ever write one of Sophocles' lost plays. But if the conceiver of the horseshoe had perished right after his or her epiphany, someone else would have stumbled onto the idea eventually. The point isn't that any one useful idea is, strictly speaking, certain to spread or certain to be reborn if extinguished. The point is that the more useful the idea, the more likely both spreading and rebirth are. And as the spread of useful ideas raises the world's population and raises intellectual synergy via improved communication and transport, these likelihoods grow all the more, until finally they do approach certainty. Increasingly, societies resemble large, thick brains, their neurons spreading incremental innovation rapidly and reliably, spurring further innovation. Today, this vast interconnectedness on a global scale is obvious, but even in the early Middle Ages, all of Eurasia and northern Africa had begun to constitute a single data processing system. A slow system, yes, especially when trade would fall off after political dislocation, but a big system. The iron horseshoe and the windpipe-friendly harness seem to have been invented in Asia and then to have leapt from person to person to person maybe hitching a ride with nomads for a time, all the way to the Atlantic Ocean. One key to the resilience of this giant multicultural brain is its multiculturalness. No one culture is in charge, so no one culture controls the memes, though some try in vain. This decentralization makes epic social setbacks of reliably limited duration— the system is fault-tolerant, as computer engineers say. While Europe fell into its slough of despond, Byzantium and southern China stayed standing, India had ups and downs, and the newborn Islamic civilization flourished. These cultures performed two key services, inventing neat new things that would eventually spread into Europe, the spinning wheel probably arose somewhere in the Orient, and conserving useful old things that were now scarce in Europe. The astrolabe, a Greek invention, came to Europe via Islam, as did Ptolemy's astronomy, which, though ultimately wrong, worked for navigational purposes. To an observer in Italy or France in A.D. 650, it might have seemed as if there was what we would now call a total system failure— as if the whole world's hard drive had crashed. But from a global perspective, there was no cause for alarm, because the world makes backup copies. Useful memes replicate themselves en masse, 
ensuring the planet against regional crashes. Given this indomitability of technological evolution, it follows that cultural evolution more broadly, growth in the degree and scope of social complexity and of non-zero sumness, is similarly hard to stop. If, that is, this social evolution depends fundamentally on technological evolution and not on the chance preservation of particular works of literature or poetry or philosophy. In the European Middle Ages, as we'll now see, that seems to have been the case. Even stereotypically Western features, such as the blossoming of personal liberty after centuries of serfdom, are in essence byproducts of technology. An energy revolution. The revolution in agricultural technology, plow, harness, horseshoe, slowly but surely raised Europe's population, making its social brain larger. The result was more and more indigenous innovation, or often indigenous refinement of foreign innovations. As usual in cultural evolution, and for that matter in biological evolution, the most important innovations were of three kinds, energy technologies, information technologies, and materials technologies. Horses aside, medieval Europe's key energy technology was the water wheel. It had existed since Roman times, but the Romans used it rarely and only to mill grain. Europeans improved the wheel and expanded its use, preparing malt for beer, crushing ore, pumping a blast furnace's bellows, forging iron, driving saws. Perhaps most important, by the 11th century, mills were used to full cloth. This textile technology spread across Europe over the next two centuries and finally provoked French fullers to violently protest the water wheel's job-killing potential. This, a pre-Luddite Luddite protest, was an early harbinger of the Industrial Revolution, a sign that energy technologies were raising productivity. In the 12th century, Europeans invented the vertical windmill, perhaps having heard of the horizontal variety already used in the east, and it won favor on the plains of northern Europe, where water wheels had a habit of freezing up in winter. The textile business also profited from a new loom, perhaps descended from the Chinese silk loom, but now powered by pedals that freed the weaver's hands for subtler work. By the 11th century, Flanders had started specializing in wool fabrics, and by the 12th, there were silk and cotton centers in Italy. Cotton was ginned with a device picked up from Arabs, who had picked it up from Indians. Increasingly, making goods wasn't just wintertime work for farm families, but a calling in itself. In an Arthurian romance composed in the 12th century, a character looks upon a town and sees... This man is making helmets, this one mailed coats, another makes saddles, and another shields. One man manufactures bridles, another spurs. Some polish sword blades, others full cloth, and some are dyers. Some prick the fabrics, and others clip them, and these here are melting gold and silver. They were rich and lovely pieces, cups, drinking vessels and bowls, and jewels worked in with enamels also rings, belts, and pins. Pins, indeed. The description hints at Adam Smith's famous analysis of the division of labor in a pin factory. Compare this town with the essentially agrarian Europe of a half millennium earlier, when the division of labor, as summarized by one economic historian, was as follows. There were those who prayed, those who fought, and those who labored in the fields. Capitalism makes the world safe for itself. The difference between these two Europes lies not just in manufacturing technologies. One could in principle have specialized in polishing sword blades or dyeing cloth two millennia earlier. Why did almost no one do so, 
And why, even during the heyday of imperial Rome, does division of labor seem to have been modest compared to the towns of the 13th and 14th centuries? And why was late medieval regional specialization also sharp? The answer has to do with the fact that, as we've seen, Adam Smith's invisible hand depends on an invisible brain, and invisible brains depend on information technology, not just conspicuous information technologies like the abacus, though its rediscovery around A.D. 1000, after centuries of European neglect, did help, or writing, though the growing literacy of the Middle Ages helped too, or money, though the revival of currency was vital. At least as crucial was information technology in a subtler sense, what you might call information meta-technologies, social algorithms guiding the use of such information technologies as money. In particular, what made the later Middle Ages a bridge between ancient times and the Industrial Revolution was the rudimentary meta-technology of capitalism. Today we take for granted that the people who start a business and the people who provide the money for it are often not the same people. We have stock markets, limited partnerships, bank loans, and various other ways of turning John's profits into Mary's seed money. But this basic idea, efficiently converting savings into investment, had to be invented, and at the time the Western Roman Empire fell apart, Europe's machinery for capital formation had been crude. The Middle Ages changed that. In southern Europe, the Contrato di Comenda, in use by the 10th century, allowed investors, large and small, to underwrite a ship's trading expedition. They were guaranteed in writing a share of the capital and the profit which God shall have granted— the commenda was just one of many medieval tools for linking savings to investment. By the 14th century, Venetian bankers had realized that they could lend out a fraction of their deposits, since depositors were unlikely to all withdraw their cash at once. The rest is European banking history. All such instruments had this in common. They were distinct steps toward modern capitalism— Europe had long had markets for goods and services. Now it had markets for capital. It also had new ancillary meta-technologies of capitalism, such as insurance and double-entry bookkeeping. All to the good. But does this really answer the question of why the economic complexity of the late Middle Ages had been so slow in coming? If the missing ingredients were the various meta-technologies of capitalism, then the question becomes, why had they taken so long to evolve? After all, once you've got coins and writing, all that stands between you and capitalism is a little imagination. In principle, there could have been stock exchanges, which finally showed up in the 17th century A.D., in the 7th century B.C., when the Lydians started coining money. Why did nearly two millennia pass before European capitalism got off the ground? Maybe part of the answer lies in where exactly it did finally get off the ground, not in Byzantium, where ancient government and social structure endured, but in the West, where central rule collapsed and tumult came and went and came, and authority was often dispersed. The average ancient ruling class, after all, would have blanched at full-fledged capitalism. For ordinary people to have potent ways of turning savings into investment meant a loss of leverage for aristocrats. What ships and grand buildings to build and what to do with them, more and more of these decisions would now be made diffusely, by diverse investors and entrepreneurs, not centrally by the government and the entrenched elite. What's more, the fruits of investment would now be hard to monopolize. This points to a general problem faced by ruling classes. To stay strong, a society must adopt new technologies. 
in particular, it must reap the non-zero-sum fruits they offer. Yet new technologies often redistribute power within societies. They often do this precisely because they raise non-zero-sumness, because they expand the number of people who profit from the system and so wield power within it. And if there is one opinion common to ruling classes everywhere, it is that power is not in urgent need of redistributing. Hence the Hobson's choice for the governing elite. Accept valuable technologies that may erode your power or resist them so well that you may find yourself with nothing to govern. Maybe it was Western Europe's freedom from ancient elites that helped hasten the coming of capitalism. To be sure, Western Europe in the Middle Ages, like ancient Rome, had elites who disliked big power shifts. The instinct of feudal lords was to exploit the emerging class of merchants with tolls at bridges and feudal bounds. But it didn't take merchants long to sense their common interest. They united into guilds and demanded the freedoms necessary for commerce— not just freedom from outrageous tolls, but freedom to buy or sell property, freedom to enter into contracts, and freedom to decide what other freedoms they needed. Increasingly, in the 11th and 12th centuries, towns won the right of self-government, complete with their own courts and tax collection. What's more, feudal lords soon realized that local prosperity was good for them, and that prosperity required a bit of this freedom. Some started not just granting charters of self-governance to towns, but founding towns in order to grant the charters. Why were these ruling elites more open to change than Rome's ruling elites? One reason, some historians say, was the decentralized nature of feudalism— Feudal lords often had the leeway to rewrite the rules in their territory, and they also had the incentive, competition with neighboring lords. As savvy lords tried to foster more prosperity than their neighbors, the many fractal units of feudalism became, in effect, laboratories for non-zero sumness, competing with each other to raise productivity. This creative tension is what forced rural aristocrats to strike their dangerous bargain with capitalism, fostering the power of the merchant class as an asset in external competition, thus empowering upstart urbanites who might then turn around and challenge aristocratic dominance. Municipal governance wasn't democratic in a modern sense, and it later became even less so, albeit temporarily. It was government of the merchants for the merchants and by the merchants, as one historian put it. Still, compared to the stultifying class structure beyond the town walls and compared to aristocratic Roman cities, where merchants might be tolerated but were hardly revered, towns were radically egalitarian. One backward 12th century nobleman deplored life in Italian towns where society granted honorable positions to young people of inferior station and even to workers of the vile mechanical arts whom other peoples bar like the plague from the more respectable and honorable circles. Within the towns, a different view prevailed. One urbanite wrote, that the countryside produces good animals and bad men. The tension between the urban, more liberal future and the rural, oppressive past would take centuries to work itself out. Freedoms would wax and wane within city walls, and political struggles between the commercial and landed classes would go back and forth. But the good guys won in the end and in the meantime the displays of inchoate capitalism's might were impressive. Merchants in various German cities formed the Hanseatic League to subdue pirates, build lighthouses, and otherwise lubricate their livelihood. The League wound up defeating the King of Denmark in war and controlling maritime trade routes. In Italy, cities that had fast become city-states, complete with fighting among themselves, 
felt their freedoms threatened by the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick I. One early clue, Frederick took an advocate of urban independence, burned him to death, and scattered his ashes in the Tiber River. The cities put aside their differences, formed the Lombard League, and fought Frederick until he gave in. They would pay lip service to his supremacy, but be free to govern themselves. Commerce changed rural living, too. Some serfs migrated to towns. Town air makes one free, was a German saying. Others became less serf-like, as a money economy came to the countryside. Rather than working for their land, they paid rent for it, and some turned a profit by filling urban stomachs. Slavery had faded during the Middle Ages, and now serfdom, the next worst thing to slavery, was fading too. The winning of freedom by medieval towns, the quelling of pirates by the Hanseatic League, and the humiliation of Frederick I by the Lombard League, albeit with papal assistance, were all early examples of a process that would continue for centuries and continues today, capitalism making the world safe for itself. The power of this information meta-technology would time and again prove irresistible. This pattern, in turn, fits into a broader and older pattern, non-zero-sum technologies making the world safe for themselves. The clay tokens that evolved into writing in Mesopotamia flourished because they lubricated economic exchange. Writing then persisted largely because it did the same, if at first in a roundabout, bureaucratic way. Both memes, tokens, and then writing empowered their host societies, fueling their own proliferation. The same is true of currencies— first de facto currencies like Aztec cocoa beans, and then de jure currencies like coins. They brought social synergy, and the resulting momentum carried them far and wide. The metatechnology of capitalism then combined currency and writing to unleash unprecedented social power— Nothing so demonstrates this fact as the sudden shifts of political power from country to city during the High Middle Ages. Basically, a low-tech means of realizing positive sums, feudalism, geared to an age of little money, sparse literacy, and broken-down roads, gave way to a high-tech means, radically changing the power structure. The medieval historian Joseph Strayer once noted an interesting problem in the history of civilization. If there is steady progress anywhere, it is in the field of technology, and yet this kind of progress seems to have little connection with the stability of society. But when you think about it, there is no reason to expect steady technological evolution to translate into the smooth evolution of social structures— Technology, time and again, has changed the balance of power within society, and people tend not to surrender power gracefully. Marx saw this, that politics has an economic and ultimately a material basis, and that the evolution of technology therefore brings unsettling change. He just had some ill-fated ideas about the details of the process— and its direction. Freedom and Other Efficient Technologies When medieval burghers carved out some breathing room for themselves, winning the right of self-governance, they were not spurred by the writings of Demosthenes, nor trying to revive their classical Western heritage. They were just indulging their instincts for self-interest and collaboration, and embracing a productive information meta-technology, Freedom. Freedom to buy and sell, to make contracts, to use one's savings as one sees fit, and the freedom of towns, more broadly, to define and fine-tune these freedoms. All these were fruitful algorithms of governance. They were the political technology that best energized the ascendant economic technology, capitalism. If the monks who copied Greek classics deserve any credit at all for this expansion of freedom, 
It is not for copying the classics, but rather for nurturing literacy generally. Contracts and records are a capitalist tool, so literacy was as well. Notary became a thriving vocation during the Middle Ages. But literacy itself, unlike the Greek classics, was never in danger of disappearing. It was alive and well in the nearby Byzantine and Islamic worlds, and the faraway Indian and Chinese and American worlds, and would surely have engulfed Europe sooner or later, with or without Irish monks. Nor did Demosthenes's paeans to democracy have much to do with the momentous evolution of national representative democracy. Here, too, the basic story is capitalism making the world safe for itself. As some historians have noted, the Magna Carta, though rightly regarded as a milestone in democracy's history, looms too large in the popular mind. Issued by King John in 1215, under pressure from his barons, it guaranteed them the right to be consulted about taxation. But this was not so new. The English monarchy had consulted councils of nobles on major decisions for centuries. And if that tradition was grounded in England's heritage, the heritage was more likely from quasi-democratic Germanic tribes than from Greek orators or Roman law. The bigger development was the expanding realm of representation over the following century, as the King's Council, the Parliament, came to include burgesses, representatives of the towns. As markets distributed economic power more broadly across British society, political power followed. That's how the world works. Today the legacy of this early concession to capitalism's emerging power is Britain's House of Commons, created in the 14th century for burgesses and also for the knights who administered counties, and the legacy of capitalism's growing power since then is the fact that the other house, the House of Lords, is today nearly powerless. The Greek and Roman writings that championed freedom and democracy are wonderful things. The freedom and democracy that dawned on Western Europe are also wonderful things. But in the end, there is no good reason to attribute the latter to the former. Indeed, we might just as well attribute the blossoming of freedom and democracy in Europe to the corruption and tyranny of the later Roman Empire. This desertion of Rome's earlier ideals may well have hastened the empire's collapse, bringing the fluidity that allowed the competitive experimentation which fostered capitalism. Perhaps analogously, it is only after the famous Mayan collapse that archaeologists find evidence in Mayan culture of a mercantile pragmatism. Featuring the mass production of pottery, rising living standards for commoners, and the apparent demise of a theocratic elite in favor of a merchant class. The story of the Middle Ages is the story of new technologies of non-zero sumness restructuring society in their image. Their upshot ran counter to, and ultimately prevailed over, the generic ambitions of ancient imperial regimes. Once the synergistic power of these technologies crystallized in the form of capitalism, they would allow the entire populace, including descendants of slaves and serfs, to play complex, non-zero-sum games with people they would never meet. The bounty would not fall evenly across the populace, but it would fall more evenly than bounty in that part of the world was accustomed to falling. Political power would be more widely diffused than any ancient imperial government had been prepared to contemplate. This basic drama, the aggrandizing instincts of powerful people versus the decentralizing tendencies of technology, especially information technology, would play out again and again. By that I don't just mean that free markets would clash recurrently with old regimes and would win and finally permeate the world, though that seems to be one storyline of the past half millennium. I mean that new information technologies in general, not just money and writing, very often decentralize power, 
and this fact is not graciously conceded by the powers that be. Hence a certain amount of history's turbulence, including some in the current era. Chapter 12 The Inscrutable Orient A Chinese novel, I said. That must be rather curious. Not as curious as one might be tempted to think, replied Goethe. These people think and feel much as we do, and one soon realizes that one is like them. Goethe's Conversations with Eckermann, January 31, 1827 Western scholars have spent a lot of time puzzling over the East. Why, they ask, was it Europe, not Asia, that launched the Industrial Revolution? How could China and India and the Near East, all homelands of great ancient empires, be so outclassed, technologically and economically, during the past half-millennium? Sometimes the answers have focused on spiritual matters— Max Weber touted Europe's Protestant work ethic and said India and China had been stymied by magical traditionalism. Sometimes the answers have focused on politics. According to the theory of Oriental despotism, Asian civilizations, from Mesopotamia to China, were often built around large irrigation systems— which invited centralized bureaucratic control, leading to top-heavy governance that continued to stifle initiative for millennia. But whatever the various explanations for the pace of Asian development, their upshot tends to be that Asian cultures are strange things. The eminent economic historian David Landis, pondering China's erratic, seemingly feudal pattern of technological ups and downs, almost as though the society were held down by a silk ceiling, declared it simply weird. Of course, weirdness is a relative thing. From the standpoint of 19th century Asia, the Industrial Revolution, as heralded by menacing European ships, may have seemed weird. And since there were more Asians than Europeans, maybe this is the perspective that should prevail— Maybe what needs explaining is not the apparent stagnation of Asia, but rather the oddly explosive advance of Europe. This, at least, is a frequently drawn conclusion. Etienne Ballas, after pondering China's sluggishness, suggested that the series of events which led to capitalism in Europe, and thus set in motion the industrialization of the entire world, may have been a freak of fortune— one of history's privileged occasions, in this case granted solely to that tiny promontory of Asia, Europe. In much the same spirit, E. L. Jones titled his influential study of economic history The European Miracle. As little Europe steamed along the highway of industrial progress, wrote Jones, the bulk of the Eurasian landmass was heading into a demographic cul-de-sac, had modernity not been imposed on China, India, and the Ottoman Empire, they would have faced stagnation at the best or Malthusian crisis at the worst. As miraculous as Europe's economic revolution was, comparable development in Asia would have been super-miraculous. Is that true? Does a look at Asian culture and history reveal indefinite inertia, suggesting that the Industrial Revolution was a fluke? Or does it show us, rather, that the supposedly inscrutable Orient is actually quite like the Occident, prone to harness new technologies and follow them to deeper and vaster social complexity? Those Zealous Muslims Landis spent part of his magnum opus, The Wealth and Poverty of Nations, trying to figure out why the westernmost of oriental cultures, the Islamic civilization of the Middle Ages, had not been destined for industrial greatness. His answer, in part, short time horizons. Whereas Europe's pragmatic medieval Christians coolly pursued continuing sustainable profit, the rampaging Muslims were propelled by fighting zeal and paused only for an occasional digestion of conquest and booty. It's true that many Western Europeans pursued profit smartly. 
In the previous chapter, we saw how some basic elements of capitalism coalesced in Europe during the late Middle Ages, notably the justly celebrated Contrato di Comenda, used to pool capital for trade. But the idea of the Comenda may well have come from the Islamic world. Before the Comenda appeared in Italy in the 10th century, the very same tool, under another name, was used by Muslims as they turned Baghdad and Basra into centers of world commerce, trading goods ranging from paper and ink to panther skins and ostriches. As early as the late 8th century, texts of the Hanafite school, one of four Islamic legal traditions, discuss the Comenda and the business partnership, another capital-pooling tool. At about the same time, checks drafted in Baghdad could be cashed in Morocco, a convenience not offered by European banks until centuries later. Over the years, Hanafite scholars would again and again defend the legal infrastructure of finance on grounds of the need of trade or the attainment of profit. In this light, Landis's simple dichotomy that European Christians were moved by sustainable profit, whereas those zealous Muslims were just doing God's work, begins to blur. Indeed, one of Muhammad's great accomplishments, and one key to Islam's potency, was making the larger world safe for commerce. In the early 7th century, before he started preaching in Mecca, the town's main commercial lubricant was its sacred shrine, the Kaaba. Violence was forbidden in its vicinity, so otherwise contentious Arab tribes could meet and trade. Muhammad and his successors, metaphorically speaking, expanded that sacred realm across much of the known world. For him, as for other great leaders before and since, waging war turned out to be a way of waging peace. Of course, during the early Islamic expansion, the war part predominated. In that sense, Landis's cartoonish sketch of the Muslim mind has a kind of time-bound truth. But as the Middle Ages progressed and the Islamic empire grew and crystallized, stretching from Spain across North Africa to Pakistan, its formative mindset faded with the trust barrier between distant lands now eroded by a common religion and communication barriers penetrated by the spread of the Arabic language, this huge swath became a low-friction zone for commerce. Taxation replaced booty as the empire's financial base. The Muslims, as people are wont to do, retained and refined information technologies that further reduced the friction including some early algorithms of capitalism, ranging from the comenda to basic accounting. Speaking of algorithms, the word algorithm comes from the name of the 9th century Islamic astronomer and mathematician Al-Khwarizmi, who also popularized the term algebra or algebra. Though tracing the path of medieval memes is tricky, some of these algorithms seem to have reached Europe in time to help usher in the High Middle Ages. It is probably no coincidence that the hotbed of medieval Europe's inchoate capitalism was Italy, with its Mediterranean exposure to Islamic culture. China's Capitalist Tools Meanwhile, at the other end of Asia, the Chinese were also adept at greasing the wheels of commerce— by the ninth century, if not earlier, tea merchants were using flying money, the rough equivalent of traveler's checks that spared them the risk and burden of lugging copper coins. Eventually, the merchants who issued the checks realized that they could invest some of the deposited money. Thus did the idea of banking dawn on China before it dawned on Europe. There were other ways to raise capital in China during the European Middle Ages— as many as sixty merchants might together finance the construction of a fleet of ships, then own them collectively. People of more modest means invested in trade expeditions via merchants they knew. Shipping was vital not just to overseas trade, but to commerce within China. 
thanks to a thick network of rivers and canals that featured fancy locks for handling inclines. Marco Polo, hailing from 13th century Venice, was no stranger to boats, but even he was floored by the traffic on the Yangtze River around the city of Yijing. I give you my word that I have seen in this city fully five thousand ships at once, all afloat on this river. Actually, Marco Polo's word and a dollar fifty will get you a ride on the subway. He is notorious for exaggeration. But even a more sober source, the historian Jacques Gernet, says that China's internal network of waterways, fifty thousand kilometers long, was traversed by the biggest and most various collection of boats that the world had ever seen. Farmers shipped fruits and vegetables to urban markets, harvested lumber for shipbuilding, made saleable tools, pressed oils for medicines and hair creams. By the late Middle Ages, Chinese peasants, writes the historian Mark Elvin, were adaptable, rational, profit-oriented, petty entrepreneurs. They don't seem to have found their alleged magical traditionalism stultifying. With or without a Protestant work ethic, they worked. In China, as in Europe, merchants sensed their common interest and formed associations. They never lobbied for commercial freedom as effectively as their Western counterparts. Chinese cities didn't become self-governing, but the Sung government, which assumed power in the 10th century, did grasp the value of freer markets and changed its modus operandi. Rather than control prices and get its share of the pie via requisitioned labor, it let goods flow freely and got its share via sales taxes. Like European leaders and Islamic leaders, Chinese leaders saw the downside of a too heavy hand. In China during the Middle Ages, as usual with market economies, the virtues of size showed themselves. There were silk factories with five hundred looms and iron factories employing thousands. Near the close of the eleventh century, China was producing one hundred fifty thousand tons of iron a year. An output that Europe, as a whole, wouldn't match until 1700. One driver of economic, technological, and scientific advance was printing. China invented paper and had both woodblock printing and movable type before they showed up in the West. They were used largely to spread practical knowledge. Hence, such books as Pictures and Poems on Husbandry and Weaving, and Mathematics for Daily Use. Some books came from private publishers, but many had an official air, such as the five-volume Remedies from the Board of Harmonious Pharmaceutics. Book titles of the age suggest the dawning of a scientific mindset and science's natural drift toward specialty. Treatise on citrus fruit, say. Or manual of crabs. Whether China of the Middle Ages showed much real impetus toward modern science is still debated. Some say no, insisting that its expertise reached no further than technology. In truth, though, science and technology are inseparable in two senses. First, because an understanding of the laws of the universe is always at least implicit in technology. Francis Bacon said, "Nature to be commanded must be obeyed." Second, because beyond a certain level of technology, the understanding tends to become explicit. Arguably, the most profound scientific truth is the second law of thermodynamics, which notes the inexorability of universal chaos, and thus, as we'll see in Part Two. Defines the current against which organic evolution and cultural evolution both swim. The earliest statement of the second law came in the 19th century from the Frenchman Sadi Carnot, who described himself as a constructor of steam engines, the vocation that indeed had led him to see the gist of the second law. By the same token, China's invention of the magnetic compass brought the articulation of laws of polarity and magnetic induction long before these things were discussed in Europe. China of the 14th century, Elvin believes, 
was on the threshold of systematic experimental investigation of nature. With or without formal science, China was the technological center of the world. The Chinese invented gunpowder, and by 1232, an iron bomb known as heaven-shaking thunder was deciding the outcome of battles. By the early 1300s, a water-powered 32-spindle spinning machine could produce 130 pounds of thread a day, making it several times cheaper than the women workers it replaces, as one observer noted. It was as advanced as any such machine that Europe would see for more than 300 years. All told, China's technological base during the Middle Ages was a harbinger of modernity, printing, the magnetic compass, bombs, hair cream. The Brink of Greatness There was a time early this century when medieval Asia's technological feats were scarcely acknowledged by Western historians, and so posed no threat to the standard view of the Orient as constitutionally sedate. But since mid-century, thanks partly to Joseph Needham's landmark Science and Civilization in China, such extreme Eurocentricism has waned. Today, the only reason to argue with Jacques Gernet's verdict that the two great civilizations of the 11th to 13th centuries were incontestably those of China and Islam would be to quibble over whether Islam, which fell into disarray in the 10th century, really deserves equal billing. Mark Elvin, marveling at the Chinese water-powered spinning machine, has written, If the line of advance which it represented had been followed a little further, then medieval China would have had a true industrial revolution in the production of textiles over 400 years before the West. Faced with the spectacle of a world-dominant China in the late Middle Ages, Europe's more persistent cheerleaders have turned it to their advantage. Now that we know how close China came to having its own industrial revolution, its failure to actually have one is all the more inexcusable. So China, once deemed an earnest but dim-witted student, is reclassified as a bright underachiever, but still gets a failing grade. The mystery lies in China's failure to realize its potential— Landis declares. Actually, if you look at China after its brink of greatness period, the failure to industrialize doesn't look all that mysterious. It is just another example of the caprice of history, the way political decisions and other flukes can alter the course of events for decades or even centuries without reversing the basic direction of cultural evolution as played out globally over the millennia. Before examining the particular role of the dice that seems to have spelled future stagnation for China, let's briefly examine its precursor, the barbarian onslaught that shook China in the late Middle Ages. This incursion illustrates some of our favorite barbarian themes. New Improved Barbarians In this case, the barbarians were the world-famous Mongols, as in Genghis Khan, as is often the case, the barbarian assault was a tribute to the victim. It was on the strength of Chinese memes that the barbarians encroached on China, conquering the whole nation in the late 13th century. The Mongols combined their expert horsemanship with Chinese iron technology and Chinese principles of administration and siege warfare. The conquest, though disruptive, wasn't fatal, the Mongols, like so many barbarians, preferred inheriting an empire to destroying one. Indeed, once the initial chaos subsided, Mongol rule was in some ways a shot in the arm. The conquest brought political unity to China. In the now-expanded body of low-friction exchange, with a single currency and a newly extended main artery, the Grand Canal, commerce flourished. It even flourished beyond China's borders. The Mongols had pushed their western frontier all the way to the Caspian Sea by the time of Genghis Khan's death in 1227, and they later extended it into Turkey and eastern Europe. 
In the process, they knocked off the Abbasid Caliphate, the second of the great Islamic dynasties. The expansion was epically bloody. But, like the Muslims before them, the Mongols realized that once the pillaging is over and you've got an empire to run, peace is a wonderful thing. They kept trade routes safe, and in return for thus lowering the communication and trust barriers, they exacted what has been compared to the modern value-added tax at around 5%. This was a bargain. Compared to the series of power brokers through which Jewish and Muslim caravans previously passed, the Mongol thoroughfare offered less risk and lower protective rent, according to the social scientist Janet Abu Lukad. By the end of the 13th century, with the Mongols having brought China into direct contact with Europe, there existed a world system that had made prosperity pandemic. The Mongol Empire's transcontinental highway, paired with seagoing trade routes to the south, thus carried Eurasia's invisible brain and its invisible hand to new evolutionary heights. They were still primitive organs by modern standards. Goods and ideas traveled between East and West without East and West having a clear idea of each other. A global village it wasn't. Still, mutual awareness was now higher than in ancient times, when the Chinese thought cotton coming from the West was fleece from water sheep, and Romans thought their imported silk grew on silk trees. In the mid-14th century, a papal envoy to China even managed to convince some Europeans that Asia did not, in fact, contain whole nations of monsters, although he conceded there may be an individual monster here and there. Alas, at around this time, economic decline beset both China and Europe. By Abu Lughad's reckoning, this is no coincidence— but rather a sign of interdependence. Mutual loss, after all, is the seamy underside of that bright promise of non-zero sumness, mutual gain. Stagnation, like prosperity, can become pandemic. The 14th century downturn was accentuated by what may have been a more literal Eurasian pandemic. William McNeil has suggested that the bubonic plague began in the interior of China and moved over Mongol trade routes to the Black Sea, and then finally, via Mediterranean shipping, spread across Europe. Whether or not the Black Death did move transcontinentally, it certainly could have, and there lies its value as a metaphor that captures a basic trend of history— as economic and social integration grow in depth and scope, the welfare, the health, of ever more distant peoples becomes correlated. The web of non-zero sumness expands. To be sure, many scholars would question Abu Lughad's claim that the economic fates of Europeans and Chinese had by the 14th century grown tightly interwoven, Still, with the web of non-zero sumness growing larger and thicker, linkage this firm was bound to arrive sooner or later. Even if the eastern and western downturns of the 1300s weren't related, the eastern and western downturns during the great 20th century depression were. This is one irony of globalization— the impetus behind it is strong largely because individual states see that their long-term interest lies in plugging into the system. But when the system hits a downturn, they would be better off if somehow they could magically become less plugged in, temporarily at least. Modern China survived the early ravages of the 1997 Asian financial crisis in good shape partly because its currency was not easily converted into other currencies. Even so, China stuck to its plans for convertibility because in the long run, you're better off plugged in. China of all nations should know. Its epic mistake, the mistake that got it labeled an underachiever, was unplugging from the system beginning in the late 14th century. The consequences of this, a single political decision, have ever since been taken as final proof of some deep anti-modern streak in the Asian character. 
China chickens out. The unplugging came during the Ming Dynasty, which reigned from 1368 to 1644. When the Ming vanquished the Mongols, it was in theory a glorious moment for China, renewed native control after a century of barbarian rule. But since these particular barbarians had been a gateway to global commerce, the truth was more complicated. The Mongols still controlled trade routes in Central Asia, but were now less enthusiastic about using them to channel commerce toward China. Besides, the Ming rulers weren't big on free trade. Ever fearful of incursion, they constricted overland commerce in iron, arms, even textiles, lest these things empower barbarian neighbors yet again. As if to provide future historians with a nice symbol for a siege mentality, Ming emperors built the Great Wall of China. The lack of overland trade needn't by itself have been devastating. There was always the sea. But Ming rulers proved touchy about contact not just with barbarians, but with aliens of a manifestly refined variety. Foreign perfume, among other things, was banned at the end of the 14th century, and in various other ways, at various times, the Ming made seagoing trade tough. The irony of this isolationism is that during the early Ming period, the Chinese were king of the sea. In 1405, the emperor dispatched a fleet of 317 vessels, nearly twice the size the Spanish Armada would reach, to explore trade routes along southern Eurasia. The voyage, manned, one historian notes, by a can-do group of eunuchs, was the first of seven expeditions, which over the next three decades would reach India, Africa, and the Persian Gulf. The Odysseys were chronicled in books whose titles suggest that the Chinese were feeling their oats. Marvels discovered by the boat bound for the galaxy, for example, and treatise on the barbarian kingdoms of the western oceans. Yet, in 1433, the Ming retreated from big-time sailing, eventually banning the construction of large ships. The reasons for China's withdrawal are much debated. An anti-eunuch faction of bureaucrats played a role, but most observers agree that something larger was at work, too. The historian John King Fairbank concluded simply that anti-commercialism and xenophobia won, and China retired from the world scene. Others discern a more rational motive. The historian Peter Perdue sees China consciously shifting resources from one vast project, ocean voyages that had shown little profit, to another vast project, building the Great Wall to keep barbarians at bay. In this view, the move was neither mindlessly xenophobic, centuries of barbarian rampages were no figment of China's imagination, nor anti-modern. The Great Wall was high-tech back then. Whatever the cause for China's withdrawal, the timing was bad. For centuries, China had been a big exporter of good ideas, and Western Europe a big importer. Now, just as Europe's social brain was really humming, China opted out of the exchange. The timing was bad in a second sense, too. Over the next half-century, European nations would embrace sailing big time and find the New World. Some scholars believe this stroke of fortune explains why the Industrial Revolution happened where it did. Europe stumbled onto a trove of precious metals and vast farmlands and hacienda-ready farmers, all just waiting for exploitation. The ensuing enrichment helped finance a burst of technological progress that pushed Europe into the lead during a crucial phase of technological evolution. To believe otherwise, in particular to think the Industrial Revolution reflected some intrinsic European brilliance that has only since penetrated the dimmer parts of the world, is to exhibit a serious malady of the mind. Also known as Eurocentricism, writes the geographer J. M. Blout, a leading proponent of this theory. If Blout is right, then the rise of the West to world dominance during the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries is essentially the result of a lucky break 
geographic proximity to an untapped hemisphere. To back up this claim, Blount argues that as of 1491, Europe was not ahead of the rest of the world in any obvious across-the-board way. Indeed, the world was already awash in incipient capitalism, or proto-capitalism, Cities strongly oriented to manufacturing and trade stretched around all of the coasts of Western Europe, the Mediterranean, East Africa, and South, Southeast, and East Asia. This is indeed evidence that, had Europe not led the world into industrialization, someone else would have. Even supposedly solipsistic pre-modern China, given enough time. Still, that's a long way from saying that Europe's only leg up in the world was a few big ships and a straight shot to the West Indies. There is one other asset Europe had that neither China nor any other empire had, the absence of empire. Large, unified polities are two-edged swords. On the one hand, they offer big, low-friction zones for trade— an especially valuable thing in ancient times when marauders often lurked beyond state bounds. But this day-to-day -day benefit coexists with a long-run liability. Imperial governments have often resisted changes that are key to continuing viability amid technological flux. We've already seen this logic at work in medieval Europe, where feudal fragmentation, for all its day-to-day -day downsides, had the upside of encouraging experimentation with economic and political algorithms. At the end of the Middle Ages, as monolithic China turned inward, Europe was crystallizing into a land of nation-states, and so its contentious dynamism persisted. By their nature, Europeans were just as capable of formulating self-defeating policies as Ming emperors were, it's just that, in a more immediately competitive environment, someone else was bound to try a better policy, so bad policies came back to haunt you sooner. And once somebody did try a good idea, it could spread to competing polities fast by emulation. Columbus himself illustrates the point. He sought Portuguese financing, but the king of Portugal turned him down, rather as the Chinese government had decided half a century earlier that long westward voyages weren't worthwhile. But there was one difference. Portugal, unlike China, had lots of neighbors that were a stone's throw away. Columbus went to Spain, got support, and came back from the New World triumphant. Within a few years, Portugal was playing the Discover America game, too, the sail westward meme, having proved its value, proliferated. As consequential as this meme was, the more important thing for this book's purposes is how memes in general exploited the political landscape of Europe. In this hothouse of interstate competition, technologies of energy, of materials, of information, including algorithms of capitalism and of political governance, were bound to keep sprouting and spreading. For example, patent rights, which helped make initiative worthwhile, were granted in Venice in 1474 and diffused to much of Europe by the middle of the next century. In this light, Europe's eventual triumph is not just consistent with a directional theory of cultural evolution. The theory virtually predicts such a triumph. After all, the speed of any evolutionary process depends heavily on two factors, how fast potentially fruitful novelties arise and how fast manifestly fruitful novelties spread. Europe in the 15th century, teeming with competitive but mutually communicative polities, scored higher in both categories than any other part of Eurasia. In such a setting, the sail westward meme and profitable memes in general, were a. likely to take root in one polity or another, and b. having proved their worth, likely to spread. Can this simple, almost superficial contrast, China's centralized control versus Europe's fragmentation, really explain a difference in economic development that has often been attributed to a deep streak of mystical traditionalism in Asian culture? One way to find out 
is to look at a part of pre-modern Asia that shared much of China's cultural heritage but lacked its monolithic structure, Japan. Like China, and via China, Japan was deeply influenced by Buddhism. But unlike Ming China, Japan saw a collapse of centralized rule in the late 15th century. The shogun's power seeped out to feudal lords, creating an amorphously competitive environment reminiscent of late medieval Europe. Sure enough, there ensued a familiar pattern. Markets flourished, towns expanded, some started commodities exchanges, and the political power of merchants grew. Jesuits who came to Japan in the 16th century compared the city of Sakai to Europe's medieval free cities. Edwin O. Reischauer has described this period as one of extraordinary cultural innovation, institutional development, and even economic growth, in spite of an atmosphere of great political confusion and almost constant warfare. Or perhaps because of the confusion and warfare? By the late 16th century, the Japanese, who only a few centuries earlier had been a backward people on the edge of the civilized world, had grown to the point where they were able to compete on terms of equality with the Chinese and also with the Europeans. All told, if the key to the European miracle lies in geography, it is not so much Europe's and China's relative proximity to America as it is Europe's and China's political geographies. Europe comprised lots of independent laboratories for testing memes, while China possessed political unity, an asset, to be sure, in matters of everyday commerce, but a handicap in any long-run race for technological preeminence. Welcome to the Neighborhood A number of scholars have acknowledged that Europe's broken political landscape played a role in its rapid advance. For some of them, such as David Landis, this is among the reasons to doubt that China, left to its own devices, would ever have reached the Industrial Age. They are missing a key point. This European advantage, being a neighborhood of competitive laboratories, was an advantage of degree only. All nations have some relatively robust neighbors within some proximity. China had Japan, among others. That's why no government can countenance stagnation forever without facing the consequences. Even the much-maligned Ming dynasty periodically felt the need to flirt anew with international trade, which it had never quite stifled anyway, thanks to the enterprise of Chinese and Japanese smugglers. And though technological advance slowed to a crawl during much of the Ming and Manchu periods, it didn't stop, and the economy continued to grow. Not only do all states have some competitors within their neighborhoods, the number of those competitors grows inexorably. The reason is that, as the means of transport and communication advance, the size of a neighborhood grows. That is what China and Japan had begun to learn by the 16th century, but were taught with special force during the 19th century when Westerners in gunships showed up and demanded access to Asian markets. Europe and Asia were now in the same neighborhood. Such jarring encounters can incite a nativist reaction. At the turn of the 20th century, China's Boxer Rebellion provided a fine metaphor for the illusions that nourish such reactions. It was inspired by a cult whose rituals were thought to render members impervious to Western bullets. This thesis was abandoned in the face of painful evidence, as was the larger thesis of imperviousness to Western influence. Witness China and the rest of Asia today. Of course, in the view of Landis and other champions of Europe's greatness, to do what China is doing today, cloning Western technologies and economic principles, is cheating. The question